Hey, hello, how's it going? Welcome to our summit. Um, I'm Desmond Lomax. I'm a co-director for Arbinger for public safety practice. I'm also a retired 20 year public safety officer who's worked in the field of law enforcement, corrections, and adult probation and parole. Um, I'm excited for you to be a part of this. We are going to tackle um, some of the most challenging problems uh, in law enforcement and really discuss innovative uh, ways of addressing those challenges. When you look at this list and you look at our schedule, um, we're bringing some of the best in the business. Um, we're bringing people to discuss things like officer wellness, officer safety, officer decision-making, how to increase officer accountability, how to engage the community in a more effective way. And so join us, stay the whole time, and be a part of this process with us. Imagine if everyone in your entire organization had a shared experience, an experience that gave you a new level of clarity around your challenges, a level of clarity to finally change the things you always wanted to change. What would this mean to you? Over the years, we've collected a library of human experiences, stories of people who have wrestled with and have learned to apply the outward mindset, both at work and at home. These are real stories told by real people. Through their stories, participants can see their own experience differently and embark on a journey toward greater accountability, collaboration, efficiency, and effectiveness. The Outward Mindset Online platform encourages collaboration and discussion with significant flexibility. With Outward Mindset Online, the Arbinger principles are available to every member of your organization, no matter their role or their schedule. Each team member can learn at their own pace and come together in person or as remote teams with a discussion leader to process what they are learning and to apply the tools together. Outward Mindset Online is a journey through 10 immersive video modules. Each module contains documentary style training that introduces each concept and provides compelling lessons and real world examples. Every module also contains interactive activities and downloadable tools to make the instruction immediately applicable. The intuitive interface of Outward Mindset Online makes it easy to engage wherever you are. Start watching on a computer at the office and finish the module on your tablet at home. The course will pick up right where you left off. Arbinger also provides two assessments to measure the impact and transformative power of Outward Mindset Online. Track your results as well as your progress through the course on the course dashboard. At the conclusion of the course, you will receive a digital course completion certificate ready to share with your network. Administrators have access to the client administrator dashboard where they can track which team members have been granted access to Outward Mindset Online and track their progress through the course. Outward Mindset Online is designed to be flexible. If you have already gone through the two-day Outward Mindset Workshop, this course is the perfect sustainment tool and will deepen your knowledge and understanding. Engage with the stories and practice applying the tools to each new challenge that you encounter. The two-day and online courses together are the most powerful combination to ensure lasting change. Not everyone can attend a live workshop, but everyone needs a common vocabulary and practical understanding of the Outward Mindset principles and tools. With Outward Mindset Online, every tier of an organization can experience the power of turning outward. The clarity around challenges and common language to address them will have a profound impact on your organization and on the way you interact with the world around you. Are you ready to harness the power of the outward mindset? Visit arbinger.com to learn more.
you're going to get a lot from this summit, but this is just the beginning. Um, we have a two-day course called Developing and Implementing an Outward Mindset. And in that course, we'll take a deeper dive in some more of these principles. And, and you'll be able to utilize those principles um, at your work, um, at home, and be able to utilize those principles in a way to be effective in areas where you haven't been effective before. So we invite you to, to sign up for that. Arbinger's two-day Outward Mindset Workshop enables a profound shift in mindset, a way of thinking and a way of working that is deeply transformative and immediately practical. Utilizing experiential learning, self-reflection, video-enhanced instruction, and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, this workshop challenges participants to evaluate their impact on others and equips them with tools that dramatically improve accountability and collaboration. There were a number of times when I had just real aha moments. Several times throughout the two days, I recognized how I was getting in my own way. It's eye-opening. You can really kind of pinpoint problems and finally have some tools to resolve that where you can take ownership. I came without expectations. I had no idea what I was going to find here. This has been a life-changing experience. I think it's not only useful in the, in the business world, but also in the family, you know, in, in the day-to-day -day life. A number of ways, this is not just about the work I do on a daily basis, but it's about the way I live my life. This is really a great opportunity for anyone. For those who are looking to experience the course before introducing it in their organization, Arbinger offers this course as a public workshop. This course is available as an in-person or as a virtual workshop, allowing participants to choose their preferred format, to explore and engage with the material and their fellow participants. The virtual environment for me is better than going in person. It was easy, it was seamless, the breakout rooms were amazing, and people were so active on the chats that we could actually feel as though we were in person. It's just as real as if you were in the classroom. Participants can then go on to become certified to facilitate this workshop within their own organization. You know what? When I when I look at that list, I think of the um, the Bronx the Bronx Bombers back in the day. You know, like I'm thinking we have heavy hitters. Um, our our lineup is people who are the best in their field, and they're discussing things they do on a day to day basis to make law enforcement more innovative, um, more safe, uh, more tactical, uh, more social. So I'm really excited about about the lineup we have, and I really feel we're gonna knock some home runs out, basically. Well, I, I think the benefit of staying for this whole event is that all of these things in public safety work together. And, and our ability to have a better understanding of all these different elements um, really give us a better understanding of, I think, what it means to be an effective police officer or a public safety officer. As a younger officer, I had one particular lady who was concerned about her neighborhood. She told me about a kid who was selling crack cocaine, and it was one of those, hey, you, you need to do something about this. This kid's going to hurt somebody or get hurt himself. This is going to be a bad situation. So I'm on it. You know, I'm all right, I got this. Chasing down, tackling, you know, a little brief struggle, get the handcuffs on him. Me and partners on the unit, you know, and we're, we're thrilled to death. We stood up and we're laughing. We're high five. You know, we thought, great job. We got the bad guy. And I noticed her standing there and didn't, 
didn't look at me the same way that she usually does. You know, I could tell she was upset about something. She looked me dead in the eye and said, you caught him, but you didn't have to do what you did. You didn't have to have fun at it. I care about that boy. I've known him since he was this big, and I know his mama, and I know she cares about him. That was one of those wake-up moments where I did the right thing, but for completely the wrong reason, and they did it the wrong way. And so I think a lot of times we get caught up in reducing that crime, and we as police officers are focused on getting the job done, focused on the enforcement part. If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So as policing and law enforcement, law enforcement was the tool we had. I kind of lost myself because we were very effective at our tasks, but it didn't become about the people and helping the people. It became about the numbers. Part of the culture historically was an us versus them mentality. You start to get that warped perspective of, I'm policing a community of just crime and social disorder down every avenue that I turn. But what we're trying to do is uh, get officers, including myself, to think about the issue or the problem surrounding that crime. Understanding that person and, and their environment, I think, allows us to impact actually the problem rather than being a part of it. For every time we, we treat them poorly, we take 10 steps back, and it's just incremental gains for every time that we, we, we treat them well. I read up on the outward mindset and, you know, looking at training officers and the outward mindset and seeing if they can change things. So then we went to the facilitator training and brought that back. So we started having real genuine conversations about law enforcement and policing, how we make our society safer and how we make the public safer and how we actually care. One of the first things he came out with was treat people well, see people as people, and I want you to work hard. I think that you're not going to be successful in anything, no matter what it is, if you don't see people as people, but especially in policing, when you're getting called to a 911 reason, it's, it's not the, the highlight of their life right there. I think if the police officers can just stop for a moment and try to understand maybe what they're going through before you are too quick to judge or too quick to act. When we look at the community members as having headaches and issues and problems, allows you to put yourself in their shoes and their situation and really makes you buy in and have ownership to problems. Oh, Father, on tonight, we pray for the family. Here in Indianapolis, after each homicide, we have our chaplain's office contact the victim's family. And then we ask them if they'd be interested in a prayer vigil and want to make sure that they uh, they see us as not just police officers or detectives that are trying to solve that case, but actually people that they can lean on. Now you see a different, uh, them from a different perspective, if you will. All of us want peace. All of us want to go home safe, that we want our homes to be safe. That requires us uh, to work together and not be against each other. And I believe that's how we're going to have a safer, better Indianapolis. The police community partnership, I think, absolutely is active here in the city of Indianapolis. You are seeing people who are legitimately thankful for what you represent and what you do for the citizens of the city. I see a staff that's not focused on themselves anymore, consistently reaching out a hand to help somebody else. Being a student of leadership and, and having the fortune of, of working in this environment has impacted my own personal life quite a bit. Anytime I get to go to the yearly conference and my eight-year-old daughter tells me that, she tells me, I miss you when you're gone, Dad, but when you come back, you're a better person. It really makes it all worth it.
I would encourage anyone who has spent time uh, being a part of this summit to really consider our two-day DIOM, which is developing and in, implementing an outward mindset. In that two-day course, we'll go on a much deeper dive about the principles we've discussed um, in this past four hours. In that, I learned some tools um, on how to manage uh, the people I work with more effectively. I learned tools on how to uh, connect with people that I was struggling with. Um, and I learned better ways of seeing people as people in a way that made me a more effective uh, uh, person, just overall person. The first few hours out of prison, you actually want to turn around and go back in. You're thinking, where am I going to sleep tonight? What am I going to eat? It's very frightening. It's like free falling. I know people skydive all the time and you free fall for a while, but you do have a parachute that catches you and lands you safely on the ground. Ex-felons coming out of prison, some of them don't have that parachute. Some of them don't have family. They don't have support. When I was released from prison on parole, after having a life sentence, I found it very hard, if not absolutely impossible, to find a job. You feel lost, you feel left out. It don't matter how much time you do. Once you in the system, it's hard for them to let you go because to them, you just, you ain't gonna do right. rate or recidivism rate for formerly incarcerated persons is generally very high across the nation. One third go back to prison within the first six months and that the three year mark it's two out of three or 67 percent. Law enforcement is far more than just enforcing law. Our mission is not to see how many people we can arrest. Our mission is to make the community safe. We understand that we have to do something different today if we want a different result tomorrow. We found generally that returning citizens have to have a job, drugs treatment, and a place to stay. But jobs are a huge indicator of whether or not someone will succeed. So I really focused on building a collaborative program, helping people find jobs and support for people trying to get on the right path. We made the proposition that if you can keep these guys off the street, um, stop selling drugs, stop using drugs, get a job, be a father to your children, and we will help you. I was approached by the chief and he asked me, what did I think about this program of giving these nonviolent drug dealers a second chance? And I was willing to try it. it. Sounded like a great idea. The participants were told, you have to get off drugs. You have to stop selling drugs. They have to get their GED if they don't have one, and they have to maintain a job, as well as monthly meetings with the community panel. The community panel is some community members, some ministers, some businessmen. We look at street-level drug dealers in our community, providing them with drug treatment if needed, job placement assistance with employment partners, and offer any kind of input our systems that we can. The first meeting that we had, I was quite struck by their response. Each of them said, I learned how to live in the streets. And the fact that I have so many people of character in this community willing to take the time to invest in me, to show me the right way, I'm in. I used to be out in the streets. I knew that wasn't my life, but I just didn't know how to get on track. Once you learn to accept the decisions that you make, it's a lot easier, because then you stop blaming others for something that you decide to do. Some people say they can do it on their own, but to have help and see that someone cares and, and shows you that, well, we love you. We want you to do better. We want to see you do better. You've got a team of people here that believe in you and care about you. 
And if you have an issue, you're gonna call on us and we're gonna figure the issue out. You know, so I wanted to correct everything that I had going wrong in my life. Not for them, but for me. We don't just give up, you know, because they make another mistake. We try to counsel with them and find out why did they make the mistake and what's the purpose of it. And, and seeing if we can do something different from what we're doing or something better than what we're doing. It really was a collaborative action to, to have the community panel and the police work together to try to solve problems in our community. Did we ever stop and take the time to learn to see each other from the other person's perspective? I believe that what we'll see is that we are far more alike than we are different. And I think that we will see that myths will give way to facts, suspicion will give way to trust, and anger and hate will give way to love and respect. The oldest guy in our first class was 40. In his mind, he felt like he was gonna be, he was gonna sell drugs forever, cause that's all he knew. Now this guy's working two jobs. And he came to me and said, you know what? I got a W-2 today. I'm 40 years and I got my first W-2 form. I filled out. I feel like I'm worth more to my community the way I am now than the way I was then. I wasn't a full-time father. So I had to make the options of, of saying, well, hey, do I, continue to do what I was doing, or do I get my family back? And I chose to get my family back. Juanita and I formed the Cut Above the Rest Training Facility to try to give back to the inmates that were coming out after us. What we do is train these people in construction because I wanted to give them something that would help them stand out, it helps them get jobs. It meant a lot to me to be able to give back and to help others. It just made me feel alive. <clears throat> like I'm a part of society again, you know? It makes it worthwhile. I had one tell me just today, Miss Pitts, I got a job. I said, you did? He said, Miss Pitts, I hadn't worked in 17 years. It's a feeling of of bliss almost. When you know that you've helped someone to achieve something that they felt impossible. It helped people like me to get a, a second chance at life. And, and life is just so new to me right now. That's what it's about. It's, it's, it's one person at a time making a difference in the lives of other people. Because at the end, it's all about people, taking chances on people. You know what, we wanna thank you for your time. We did this for public safety. Um, many of us are retired public safety officers. Many of us continue to work in the field to train law enforcement officers. And we're thankful that you've taken this time um, to learn a little bit more about how these principles can apply to effective law enforcement work. Imagine if everyone in your entire organization had a shared experience, an experience that gave you a new level of clarity around your challenges, a level of clarity to finally change the things you always wanted to change. What would this mean to you? Over the years, we've collected a library of human experiences, stories of people who have wrestled with and have learned to apply the outward mindset, both at work and at home. 
These are real stories told by real people. Through their stories, participants can see their own experience differently and embark on a journey toward greater accountability, collaboration, efficiency, and effectiveness. The Outward Mindset online platform encourages collaboration and discussion with significant flexibility. With Outward Mindset Online, the Arbinger principles are available to every member of your organization, no matter their role or their schedule. Each team member can learn at their own pace and come together in person or as remote teams with a discussion leader to process what they are learning and to apply the tools together. Outward Mindset Online is a journey through 10 immersive video modules. Each module contains documentary style training that introduces each concept and provides compelling lessons and real world examples. Every module also contains interactive activities and downloadable tools to make the instruction immediately applicable. The intuitive interface of Outward Mindset Online makes it easy to engage wherever you are. Start watching on a computer at the office and finish the module on your tablet at home. The course will pick up right where you left off. Arbinger also provides two assessments to measure the impact and transformative power of Outward Mindset Online. Track your results as well as your progress through the course on the course dashboard. At the conclusion of the course, you will receive a digital course completion certificate ready to share with your network. Administrators have access to the client administrator dashboard where they can track which team members have been granted access to Outward Mindset Online and track their progress through the course. Outward Mindset Online is designed to be flexible. If you have already gone through the two-day Outward Mindset workshop, this course is the perfect sustainment tool and will deepen your knowledge and understanding. Engage with the stories and practice applying the tools to each new challenge that you encounter. The two-day and online courses together are the most powerful combination to ensure lasting change. Not everyone can attend a live workshop, but everyone needs a common vocabulary and practical understanding of the Outward Mindset principles and tools. With Outward Mindset Online, every tier of an organization can experience the power of turning outward. The clarity around challenges and common language to address them will have a profound impact on your organization and on the way you interact with the world around you. Are you ready to harness the power of the outward mindset? Visit arbinger.com to learn more.
You know, for police leaders, it's having the courage to be able to be radically self-aware. It's really in everyone's collective interest. I want to fix this problem. I would consider myself a racial justice warrior. People in communities are what do things, but the relationships are everything. It takes tremendous courage to step into this profession right now. So I look them right in the eye and I say, thank you. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Answering the Call 2020, a virtual public safety summit from the Arbinger Institute. I'm Sarah McMullen. And I'm Desmond Lomax. For the past several weeks, we've recorded conversations from nearly 20 experts from around the country. What you're gonna to hear today is really the short condensed version of these panel discussions, but the full conversations will be available on our YouTube channel following the event. Stick around for after the broadcast. We have a really exciting announcement for Arbinger's public safety open enrollment workshops. You'll need to wait till the end of this first conversation to hear about that. In our first session, we are covering officer safety, awareness, and decision-making. Our experts today are Von Kleem, John Bostain, and Chip Huth. With nearly 30 years of experience in criminal justice, Von Kleem is a senior policy attorney for Lexapol, executive editor of the Force Science News, and is co-owner of Von Kleem Consulting. Also joining us is John Bostain. John is the president of Command Presence Training. He has committed the last 23 years to law enforcement, 20 of which have been as a law enforcement trainer. And finally, we have Chip Huth. Chip is a major with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. He has 28 years of law enforcement experience, commands KCPD's traffic division, and is the state of Missouri's defensive tactics subject matter expert. We have experts here who have trained others. Um, I think it's one thing to have a basic education in, in use of force. It's another thing to evaluate um, use of force, evaluate self-awareness, and uh, evaluate in a way where we can be, be effective. There's this concern about seeing people as people and how that can jeopardize situational awareness and safety. How would each of you respond to that? When people posit that to you, like they're concerned about um, you know, the fact about the fact that seeing people as people honoring their humanity will in some way compromise their ability to be safe. You have to treat that with a lot of care because, you know, it, it, it's very, what, what we're sharing with them is, is almost counterintuitive. It sure was for me before I really thought about it deeply. But, but if you think about it, maybe one helpful way to think about it is I want to see the world as it is, not as I might wish it to be. I want to see it as objectively as possible, given my limitations as a human. And so the world, and this is a core truth, it may be an uncomfortable or an inconvenient truth, but it's a core truth. The world is populated by people just like me. Uh, every person that I interact with has hopes, needs, fears, dreams, things they want to accomplish, things that matter to them, things that motivate them to act. That's true for everyone. At some fundamental level of analysis, then we are all the same. That's very important. I'm not superior to anyone. They're not superior to me. I'm seeing them as a person. I'm recognizing the, the, the core truth about them, that they are a person. So that's the first thing I got to do. So what we're talking about by seeing people as people is just honoring that truth. It do, doesn't make us, it doesn't mean we're soft. It doesn't mean that, that we don't use force. It doesn't mean that we don't make proper tactical decisions. What it means is that those tactical decisions are based on that fundamental reality about other people, that they're people just like I am. It is such a crucial, critical thing, but much of the pushback comes from the idea that it just sounds soft. It just sounds like a soft thing to see people as people, but it's not hard and it's not soft. Uh, it's just seeing people as they truly are, striving to do that. And then whatever behaviors were to arise out of that observation in context, uh, they might manifest as hard or soft. There might be a situation in which someone needs a kind word based on what I'm observing. And there might be a situation in which I might need to prepare to use deadly force 
based on what I'm observing. Part of this is, I think it's an agency culture. It's certainly an academy culture. When we talk about the term officer safety, oftentimes it's, on, it's presented in a way that it's us versus them. I think that's part of the problem, quite honestly. My fundamental belief is that we can have both. They're not mutually exclusive one of another. I can have really good contacts and be really safe. I think fundamentally, we start a little bit of the conversation about how to address this and get it through, both in the academy, but agency culture as well, and really get that buy-in that it's not either or, it's not you know either good quality contacts or officer safety. Uh, I think the focus really has to be on, it absolutely can and should be both. No, I completely agree with you, John. I think there's a, um, a definitely a place for um, seeing people as people and in a process enhancing safety. Let me ask you a question. Um, there are statistics out there about officer safety and, and officer involved shootings. Um, there's statistics about how officers do what they do. And then there's also the reality of, of people suffering um, as a result of the interactions between the community and law enforcement. What do we need to do um, to genuinely understand others' needs and fears, um, to understand that that despite you know law enforcement officers doing the best they can and succeeding on a day to day basis, when things don't go the way we want, what do we need to understand about the individuals that are struggling um, from some of these uh, interactions that are not going the way that we would like them to go? I was able to cheat a little bit in law enforcement because my family wasn't perfect. I had family members go to prison. I had a mom who had to sit through trials. I, I literally was in roll call one day uh, when my family member's picture showed up on America's Most Wanted and we were being briefed on that and the entire roll call room looked at me. Having a mom who has a son who's both police and a son who's gone to prison made it very easy for me to see people as people. And there was a lady, I, I know her name. I'll never forget her name. She was very important to me and, and my partner. She was the mother of, of robbery, robbery suspects. She was the mother of, of crack dealers. She was also a grandmother. And we spent time with her getting her furniture, getting mowing her grass. We, we held her grandchild. We got them food. We had a, developed a really great relationship with this lady. And she just became a metaphor because we had a lot like her. And what I realized meeting her one one afternoon or one evening in her front yard there was a dead body in her front yard she knew who it was she wouldn't talk to anybody until I showed up and then she was willing to talk with me and I gave her a hug and and that reality and I say that's a metaphor because she wasn't unique in that regard we had built those kind of relationships with these families and we just had to come to grips with the idea that they knew their kids were criminals they knew their kids were were choosing a lifestyle, sometimes a lifestyle chose them uh, that was dangerous and that was constantly putting them at tension with us. But they also felt like they didn't often have a choice. And I remember a very, a great conversation I had with her where she just said, I love my boys. And I know they're trifling, but I love my boys. I'll always love my boys. Um, but she also knew they were doing wrong and she cried for them. And and we, we spent a lot of time with it on that. And I took that and I noticed a couple of things. As we do communications training and persuasion training, we're talking about heart and head moments. You can't have a, a head moment, start spewing statistics or elements of an offense or try to demonstrate to people listening that, that their son, daughter, cousin, brother, father met the elements of an offense and therefore was legitimately shot or was legitimately arrested they're still going to hurt. They're not the ones who committed the offense. They're not, they love their family. And if we don't recognize that, if we start treating family members like they're all the criminals, and again, that wouldn't have worked well for me or my mother. <laughs> because, um, but if we're doing that, we're absolutely missing the, the humanity. And, and, and frankly, there's, for those officers who are the hardcore street cops, I'm gonna tell you, we got after as hard as anybody. We were, we were not shy about enforcing the law, but we were making friends and creating relationships along the way that from a tactical standpoint benefited us. But what I found is when you sit with the family members of someone you just arrested or someone there was a violent use of force against, when you sit with them and you listen and understand that it's a loss for them. It's a very real loss. They are sad. Um, 
ultimately at the end of those conversations, they understand that we have to do what we have to do. They just don't want us to deny uh, the humanity of their family member or of them in the process. I think there are some unintended consequences of some things that the agencies do. The first one is that oftentimes uh, you'll hear police departments and things like that. They'll say, well, we need to just, if we could just educate the community, we just need to educate them. And they we got to tell them why we're doing what we're doing and, and that'll solve everything. I think that's fundamentally where part of the problem that comes from is that education and the form that most of us are talking about is one way uh, communication. We're going to tell you why we do what we do, and you're supposed to just understand that. I think we absolutely can have better results by eliminating that word and saying, we need to engage the people in our community. We don't have to educate them. Our engagement and the way we interact with them will be education enough, but it's not one way. Which brings me to a second point. I believe a lot of times we have the wrong people engaging the wrong people. When I say the wrong people are engaging the wrong people, the reality is these patrol officers, and just as Vaughn's example talked about, they are the front line. They have to engage the people that live in those communities. I can remember back as a police officer, I always found the most uh, influential people in the neighborhoods that I worked were grandma, uh, school teachers, coaches, things like that. And those are the people that we need to have real true engagement with. Let's get down to the nuts and bolts of, again, seeing people as people, that human to human contact and really get to know, um, you know, what is it that, that, that drives them? What are their concerns? Um, I don't care what your background is. We can see each other as people collectively uh, and that builds relationship. And then from that point, I, I truly believe anything's possible. We're just seeing people as people. Wouldn't we like the same uh, in response for our family members. So I just think it has to be about uh, engagement, not education. And then it truly has to be the right people engaging with the right people. And again, whether that's the coach, the teacher, grandma, uh, some other person in the neighborhood, we've got to change that dynamic a little bit, or I think we're going to be stuck. You know, there's a dichotomy here, obviously, that exists. Uh, empirical data certainly has a place in this conversation and a certain amount of dispassion is necessary if we're gonna improve systems. However, to, you know, to Vaughn and John's point, uh, throwing data and facts at people at, without respect for their emotion, uh, their, 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 their true passion around the issue is just disingenuous. It's not gonna be helpful. You know, we have to recognize again, we're dealing with people and people, we like to believe we're driven by rationality, but mostly we're driven by emotion. And, you know, it's not ideal, but it is reality. And we have to understand that, uh, to John's point, educating people, lecturing at them, you know, teaching them, if you will, it's a lot different than sitting down and having a conversation with them. In that conversation, they are a participant. They're a valued participant. We can gain insight. I'm learning as much as I'm sharing. And that's really the goal with conversation. You know, the goal isn't, it isn't to be right. The goal is perhaps to assume that I'm wrong and strive to be less wrong by inviting that person in, by being vulnerable and open to understanding their perspective. And I think that's exactly what Vaughn and John are talking about. I think it's exactly what's needed. We need to meet people where they're at. We need to be able to, as best we can, imagine what it would be like to be those people in those situations and then ask the hard question, in what ways, large or small, might I have been contributing to their difficulties? And so, you know, it, again, it's a, it's a dichotomy. We need the facts, we need the evidence, we need the true data, but you can't abandon the fact that there are true people that are impacted by these things. We all know that as long as policing is populated by human beings, police are gonna make mistakes, police are gonna make errors. Because of the nature of the job, some of those errors are gonna be grave. Some of them are gonna be tragic. The true question is, what's our tolerance for it? You know, back again to John's point, we need to have a reservoir of trust that we can leverage whenever we have these bad incidents. I think that's what's lacking now. We have neglected the importance and the value of the everyday, ordinary contacts that police have with citizens. Every contact with every person in the community is an opportunity to build or destroy a relationship. 
And the outcome is predicated on how we show up with those people. How do we show up in those conversations? And one of the jobs of, of a leader, in my opinion, is to help each officer, each police professional, each professional staff member, sworn or non-sworn, to understand that every contact they have with a person is much like a blank canvas. And they have the power to paint a masterpiece on that canvas. And it's all based on how they show up with people, regardless of the context. I think all of us and, and quite a few people listening will recognize that we deal with this reality almost every time we show up on a domestic, right? The, we all, we, we've been trained and then we've experienced many times where the person who calls us then attacks us because they perceive that we're mistreating or disrespecting the person that they actually called us to, to interact with. And domestics also provide us another really unique insight in that when you show up to a lot of these domestics, the suspect knows he's going to jail if he just hit, this, hit his wife, for example. And over and over and over again, when you show up, you know he's going to jail, he knows he's going to jail. And we start, and yet we still sometimes find ourselves wanting to lecture him about how it's not okay to hit women. And what I found fairly early was when you walk into a domestic and you look at the male half, and I'm just gonna assume he's a suspect for my purposes, so, and you say, are you doing okay? Do you need an ambulance? Are you hurt? And it throws him off. He's expecting you to fight with him. He's expecting you to disrespect him. Um, he might know he's going to jail. So he's gonna, he's, gonna dem he's gonna maintain as much respect as he can in the process. So when you immediately start demonstrating empathy for him, giving him a chance to talk and, and even empathizing with what you know are, is morally bankrupt approach to life. If he says, I come home, I just expect the dishes to be done. And when they're not, I just get so mad and he beats her for that. Now we're not, we can't agree with that, but you can say, you know, I, I can tell you got frustrated. You work all day when you come home, you just expected things to be done. And it sounds like they weren't. I can see how that might be frustrating. And he's like, yeah. And all of a sudden he's, he's buying in that you're listening and you understand him. And you have this conversation to the degree, again, you have discretionary time, which we have, are very talented at creating um, when the suspect cooperates with us. Um, when you have those conversations, time and time and time again, two things happen. The end, I would say things like, okay, so now you know you did put your hands on your wife and I think you know you can't do that. And unfortunately I will have to take you to jail, but I think you knew that. That I have uttered those words more times than I can count and a suspect bows his head and says, yeah, I know. And that's it, puts himself in handcuffs basically. And his wife or girlfriend isn't attacking us because we didn't disrespect uh, her husband. He's not attacking us because he felt like he was hurt. And again, I say this, and I always want to remain ultra sensitive. When it works, it works really well, but it does not always work. We train in martial arts to reduce the population of people who can kill us. And we train in de-escalation and communication to decrease the population of people who try. And as I started thinking about that, I was like, yeah, that's, that's it. There's always gonna be a population of people who, who wanna hurt us. Um, and there's always gonna be a, popular, a population of people who can. And, but those two, those two aspects of policing are so incredibly important. We've gotta train cops to be phenomenal fighters and we've gotta train cops to be phenomenal talkers because they're gonna need both. So thanks for letting me add to that, Chip. I think we, we know the average officer will communicate uh, and talk um, in every circumstance. We know in every circumstance, it always starts with communication, both verbal and nonverbal. And, and I think our capacity to show up in a certain way where we see others, um, when we all know the outcomes in a lot of these circumstances and DVs, we all know what the outcomes are gonna be, but show up and seeing people as people, you can still arrest people. You can still defend yourself. You can still um, be able to, to do your job. And, and I appreciate all of you validating that piece because that's that ongoing message I hope we hear time and time again is that we can see people as people. And in fact, we can perform our job at a much higher level as a result of it. The next question is, is there's, a, there's a lot of noise for law enforcement, like the noise of what's expected, you know, as we see it in like the media or social media and, and what I'm expected to do in my job. Uh, so the question is, how do we um, help in realms of, how do we help our trainers? How do we help our police executives? 
how do we help our systems navigate this challenge between um, understanding what I need to do on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe what's expected of me um, from society or from social media? As part of our Think Clear approach, as you see, emotional intelligence is a huge part of that. Uh, emotional intelligence is two parts, basically. It's self-awareness and then self-management strategies. Uh, people think, well, well don't, you shouldn't, just don't let it get to you. Uh, just don't feel that way. Well, that's the, the most absurd thing you could possibly say to somebody um, because it denies that an emotion exists. That's not true. What happens with emotional intelligence is knowing that, hey, the things I'm reading, the things I'm seeing, they're very frustrating to me. They make me angry. It's about owning that and then taking on a self-management approach. And right now, the noise, as you described it, whether it's um, the protests, whether it's uh, uh, a, a feeling that officers are starting to feel overwhelmed and unappreciated and things like that, whether it be anecdotal or not, I travel all over the United States and I know police officers are feeling this way. I think it's really important that instructors realize the things that are, uh, are bothering them about the things that are going on right now because if they don't, the nexus, the nearest outlet for them will probably be the trainees. The closest outlet is to tell those kids, those young officers, how terrible the world is. Nobody likes you anymore. Um, I don't even know why you're doing this. I got, I got six months before I can retire. What toxic, toxic communication for young officers who had to have enough courage to even start this job. Um, I think trainers need to make sure that we're seeing uh, the trainees as people because um, they're supposed to be the role models because uh, I think that changes the future of all these people come out of the academy. Uh, just hearkening back to what John said about courage, you know, for police leaders, it's having the courage to be able to be radically self-aware and to be vulnerable. You know, so many leaders think they have to be the person position to have all the right answers. And so many leaders get so head down in what they're doing and making decisions, they forget about the fact that there are people downstream who are impacted by every decision they make. So I think leaders have to have the courage to, to open themselves up to criticism, to open themselves up to alternative perspectives, to again, be alive to the fact that one potential red flag, that they're going off course, that they're straying from their trajectory, if you will, is that blind certainty when they're just so confident that they have the answer, the only answer that could possibly work. That's a red flag. And then, uh, you know, just one more uh, for the sake of time, I would say that we need to pay attention uh, for the unhelpful distinctions that are often drawn, especially in bureaucracies between leaders and those that are led. Um, everyone should know who's ultimately responsible for the mission. We have a rank structure, you know, people get that. For instance, in my position, they get that on the division commander. You know, it says so right on the name tag uh, outside my office. But, but that doesn't mean I have all the best ideas. And that doesn't mean that, again, at, uh, you know, when, when you look at each team member, that they're positioned to make meaningful contributions to the mission and one another, just like I am. But it's my responsibility to, to look around for the ways in which I have drawn these distinctions between me and them that, that make me seem kind of as, as, as an other. I can't relate to them. If I can't relate to them, I can't influence them. Police leaders, when you ask them, what, what are your most important priorities? Tell me what your most important priority is. And they almost always respond, uh, it's my people. My people are most important priority. It's almost like this, this pat answer. Okay, so that's the explicit message. My people are the most important priority. Then you go outside to the parking lot and you see all these reserved parking spots. The front row parking spots are all generally reserved for the executive command. So the implicit message is that the people who are, do the most work toward the basic mission, the men and women on the front line, have to walk the farthest to get out of the rain. So you can see the tension between right what I'm saying is important and what actually appears to be important based on our system something as simple as parking spaces. I can think of a little reason, and there may be some reason, uh, but I can think of a little reason why me as a division commander needs to have the closest parking space. I'm not likely to be running out of the station to go to a hot call, and I'm not likely to be carrying in a bunch of property that needs to be recovered. 
Now, I'm not saying people say to me all the time, well, Chipper, you saying you're just, you know, the answer is just to get rid of front row parking spaces for command. I don't know if that's the answer for you. It's been the answer for me. But what I'm suggesting is that that leaders think things like literally sit down and diagnose and analyze the reasons why these things exist. And perhaps they might find that uh, for whatever reason, a certain system or a part of a system was created at one time. Um, the complexity of the current operating environment has rendered that that particular adaptation, you know, irrelevant or unhelpful, and that that invites them then to make a change. But you've got to pay attention, in my mind, to again those those distinctions and what ways in what ways can we mitigate them? That's the question every leader should be asking. Man, we could talk leadership forever, right? These are, there's so much to talk about, but I want to go a little bit deeper. Um, when I when I left full time policing and and uh, I stayed on as a reserve. So, and I did that very deliberately. If I was going to train cops, I need to still be on the street. And so sometimes because of my other obligations, it might be a month before I could get back to the street. Now I tried not to go more than a couple of weeks here and there. Um, but when I came back, I remember working a domestic and I had intellectually understood how to work a domestic. I'd done them forever. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, the suspect's gone, but sometimes they hide in the bushes. Sometimes they hide under the deck. So intellectually, I knew to check there. Um, so my partner's talking to the female half, and I think I'll go in the back and see, just walk around with my flashlight. And then I found him in the back, in the alley, hiding in the bushes. And then he attacked me, and I wasn't ready for it. I, I, was, I was slower. I was half a beat off. I, I, I did not respond as quickly as someone with my level of training experience should have because it had become an academic exercise for me. I spent all day prosecuting cases. I spent all day training military police and, and civilian police. And then when I went out to the street, I had adopted an academic understanding. Now, here's why that's relevant to the leadership. Our leaders are only, their, their experience is only valuable if it's relevant. And that's not just the, the relevance of the new MDT terminal. I don't know how many times I've talked to senior leaders who don't even know how to log on an MDT, right? They, that tells me they have not been in their car. They've not been working alongside their troops. And what really worries me is because this job requires all of us to recognize the psychological and physiological limitations of a human being responding to, these, to other human beings. When you divorce yourself from street work and you, and you are no longer remaining relevant in that sense, we then overlay the patrolman with really unrealistic expectations. Essentially, the short answer is we forgot what it's like to be out there. And these leaders who are trying to stand in judgment of these people making split second decisions, they're banking on the fact that they've got 20 years or 25 years. And, and I quickly look at them and say, when is the last time you just went out and shagged calls? When is the last time you took a back? When is the last time you rolled on the mat? Because if you haven't, that's okay. But I would prefer in many cases that they distinguish themselves. They put on a white shirt. They don't need to wear a gun belt. They can be the administrator that they may be very good at. But if they're going to continue to wear the t-shirt and they're going to continue to wear the uniform, my recommendation and my plea is that they continue to do the job to some extent so that the expectations they have of their officers are realistic. I, I think that, I think there's amazing comments just right across the board. Um, but to add to what you're um, saying, Vaughn, I think it's, it's critical um, for you to see your officers clearly, you have to understand what their challenges are. I mean, and, and the focus often is, is how we, how the community, how we see the community, how we see the person in which we're engaging with. And we talk about that level of safety, but from a leadership perspective and a police system perspective, if I don't see my enforcement officers clearly, if I don't see the officers I'm representing clearly, and then there is a um, officer involved shooting, and I might not be aware of all the different elements that are involved on their day-to-day -day interactions in their environment, it can be complicated on both on both sides. And so, so thank you for that. I, I think those are great comments. Can I add one more thing to your comment, Paul, on your comment? Please. Back to the social justice versus law and order priorities. This is what we're seeing now that is, I mean, it is causing serious cognitive dissonance. It's the best word. It's confusing cops who, when they arrest someone for DUI, the, and there's resistance, 
the community might say, why didn't you just let him go? Why didn't you get a cab? And we used to have a chief of police who would stand and be able to have those discussions with the community, but he would look back at his, his patrolman and say, I understand that wasn't an option. I get you, I have your back. You arrest him because that, that's what we do. That's the priority. But the community might not understand it. What we're having now is we're having police officers do things that are customarily aimed towards traditional law enforcement to, to crime reduction, to uh, DUI enforcement, to felony arrest. And we have very loud voices saying, why didn't the cops just let him go? And they're saying that because ultimately many of these will turn into violent encounters where the consequence uh, for the arrest seems to really outweigh the benefit to society. We would rather you let the guy go than shoot him, right? Someone needs to tell the police that, and it needs to be the chief. If they look to the chief and say, is that what you would like us to do? When we arrest someone for DUI, would you prefer we let them go in lieu of fighting them? If we try to arrest someone for a felony offense, um, and they want to be resistive and they want to fight us, do you prefer that we just let them go? Has the priority shifted? And we are not giving cops, we're not having that discussion with the police. So now they're out there enforcing traditional law and order interests and being held to standards by society for social justice issues. And that's understandable. But we're also having our chiefs of police and our leaders stand up and criticize and our government leaders criticize police officers for doing exactly what we as a society have told them to do, and we've never changed that message. So if we want to change the message, and there's probably a lot of good discussion on that, we need to have the discussion, and then we need to convey that to the cops. Hey, uh, Chip, you're an active major in a patrol division right now. Can you respond to that or add to that comment? I would love your feedback. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a great comment, first of all. Very progressive thinking. Um, I think that a lot of the police officers, they're just lacking guidance around these complex issues. This profession, um, I think people have a long time thought about it as just kind of a blue collar job, kind of like anybody can do it. You got a gun, you know, some basic laws, you know, you go around making sure people stay in line, but, but it's so much more complex than that. And to Vaughn's point, the context of each interaction will determine how that officer leverages his or her discretion. You know, so not every DUI stop will end in an arrest. No more than every traffic stop or speeding will end in a ticket. You know, you have to understand the context and, and take the particularized elements of each event to determine what the most appropriate course of action is for everyone involved and all the people who have interest in the outcome is based on what we know at the time. And that's a nuanced conversation. And again, to Vaughn's point, we, we as leaders need to be able to help shepherd our officers through those situations and set the appropriate expectations while still leaving some margin for them uh, to, to make errors, to make mistakes, to, to, to have uh, less than desirable outcomes and be able to provide correctives for them in, in, in a safe space where we can have after action discussions. It's okay to ask a question. It's okay to not know the answer and to come back and and, and, and open yourself up for some constructive criticism. Um, so no, I, I think these, are, these things are incredibly important. They're incredibly nuanced. So that's kind of my, my response to, to what, what Vaughn is saying. When I, and I'd like to give an example of where the confusion and another level of complexity. When, when you pull somebody over and you'd have to decide whether you're gonna write them a ticket and someone came up to you and said, this person doesn't have a lot of money. They already can't afford insurance. They can't afford to get their vehicle fixed. They've got outstanding warrants for failure to appear because they didn't have a car to get to court. And they're just layer on top of layer of unearned or certainly uh, disparate impact of these consequences. And that person walks up and says, so don't write them a ticket to the police officer. And the police officer says, okay, there was a day where that would be viewed as corruption, right? That somebody was getting favorable treatment at the, at the recommendation of somebody of higher power. Maybe it's a politician, uh, whatever the case may be. But we, we would call it corruption, not an exercise of discretion. Although it was simply, it was perfectly lawful and could have been an exercise of discretion. The fact that an external influence comes in to influence the police 
from a position of authority to impact that discretion, we, it wasn't something we looked favorably upon. Now, I will segue into when I'm prosecuting a case and I see that same suspect, he's been written the ticket, now he's in front of the judge. Now as a prosecutor, I got to look at the judge and say, look, I've talked to the defense counsel, I've talked to the, to, with his client, he can't afford registration insurance to fix his vehicle. I don't wanna add additional fines to this man. What I want to do is to give him a reasonable opportunity to go back to his job, to earn enough money, to get his license, to get his registration, to get his insurance. We want this to be nothing more than a wake up call. And the judge is like, I mean, th this was a, I mean, I remember having this discussion with the judge. She's like, thank you for being so reasonable. And I got along so incredibly well with defensors because we were all rowing in the same direction, right? And I saw there's a distinction where if I'm the cop writing the ticket and those external influences are telling me to, to utilize their judgment rather than my own, um, it isn't always corruption. Sometimes it's just a good discussion. It's good information to help you evaluate and exercise your discretion. But there's such a fine line when we start breaking our communities up into subsets and saying this subset <clears throat> will not get tickets, will not get arrested, will not get stopped. This subset, keep doing what you're doing. That's where it gets dangerous to me. And I've seen that. I've seen it on the street. And then I see how that works out in court. And people that have the best interest for society and the best interest for their communities need to sit down and make these decisions openly with transparency so we can take corruption off the table. And we can say, we as a society have decided, here's how we want to address these problems. So the cops are not stuck with the entire weight of this on their backs and nobody telling them they, um, what, that the priorities have shifted again. No, I, and I agree with you. I, I think, and I think that is not an officer awareness and officers safety issue. I think that is a relationship issue. I think how we have wedged our law enforcement officers um, in the middle of these social issues where we are tasked our law enforcement officers to do all of these different things and we expect them to do it perfectly. And, and then we create situations where we can't, you know, as organizations, we can't say, this is why the officer did what they did. And this is how it, how it applies. I mean, we don't, we don't have that type of support because of the, I, because of the marginalization of what we've, I think we've really marginalized our law enforcement officers and we've made it difficult for them um, to navigate in a way um, where they can be successful on a day-to-day -day basis and when their mistakes can be evaluated as mistakes and addressed appropriately. Um, it's a difficult time. It really is a difficult time. And, and it's something that um, as we discuss these topics, um, you know, discuss maybe different options uh, in how to empower our, our administrative law enforcement agencies to, to help support um, their law enforcement officers. Final question. What other system changes would you recommend at the officer level, the trainer level, the leadership level, and in communities as a whole? John, uh, how could you, add, in, re in regards to police training, you being an expert in that, um, what kind of suggestions would you give? I think part of this, uh, really, if we want to fundamentally change the way trained police officers are being trained, then I think we fundamentally go back to how do we screen people to become law enforcement instructors in the first place. For generations in this profession, we've made the mistake of, for example, somebody is a good shooter, therefore they must um, they must be a, a good firearms instructor. Uh, somebody hasn't wrecked a car in three years, so we're going to send them to driver instructor school to teach driving. Uh, oh, you you study the weekends. You're a, you know you're into Brazilian jiu jitsu, where you're going to be a defensive tactics instructor. What I think we've done is oftentimes in this profession, we've looked only at the skill that they're going to teach and not who the instructors are. I think for selecting uh, instructors, it has to be far more about uh, the type of person we want modeling behavior for our new recruits. We've just based, uh, based it too often on their experience and not the way that they teach. The undeniable number one rule of being a good, effective law enforcement trainer is that you must remember that it is never about you. It is always about the person in front of you, whether it's an in-service veteran officer, whether it's a recruit, 
whether it's a rookie sitting in your car. It is always about them. It's never about you. So I think that's part of where we start having this conversation. And I think instructors have to absolutely believe in this idea of seeing people as people, the idea of unconditional respect. If they cannot fundamentally make that part of their belief system, if there's something in them that basically just cannot comport to that, then don't put them in a trainer position. Thank you. Chip, how does this relate um, in regards to police leadership? I, I sometimes, uh, like many of us, I fall into that habit of thinking about leadership only in terms of positional leadership. And I don't think that's helpful at all. Leadership ultimately is about, you know, influencing others, right? Helping to create a situation in which they can make that meaningful contribution toward the mission and one another and toward the customer. So that has to happen at every level. Uh, leadership, I am a big proponent of opening up leadership training, if you will, to every member of the organization. Every member of the organization should be schooled in the foundational aspects of leadership. They should be developed and nurtured and grown to become the best leader they can be in their role. You've got to remember these officers, these uh, non-sworn professional staff members, uh, most of the time they're making autonomous decisions. They're trying to figure out the best thing to do in the moment to serve the mission and the customer uh, within a context, right? So they're, they're out there literally with that type of autonomy and discretion. We need to prepare them for that. And at every level, you can't predict when even a low ranking member of the organization might need to step up and offer a corrective or step up or, and stop some type of potential misconduct or misbehavior. And I, I think we need to really focus on that idea that leadership at every level, leadership development at every level is, is just critical. Talk a little bit, Vaughn, about um, how we can apply, you know, looking at community and police systems, um, some of the things we can learn from that and what we can do differently as it relates to that. We've got two things I will say that might come close to this. We always talk about implicit bias training, and there's a lot of controversy surrounding implicit bias as, as a testing uh, capabilities and implicit bias training effectiveness, and whether or not that, that even is related to or going to affect behavior. But we all know we have implicit bias. We just don't know what to do with it. And what we do know is implicit bias is, in, is enduring because of much more than what we take in a class, it's our experiences every day. And so officers who are going into communities and having repeated experiences are going to develop biases. But the, the antidote was always identifying and developing relationships that, that allowed the best in people, allowed you to experience the best in people and the best in subgroups so that you we're constantly pushing back against not just your biases, but your experiences you are having with a lot of these subgroups. When you develop relationship with your community, you don't need implicit bias training because every single day you are meeting amazing people from within that community that's constantly offsetting any idea that everyone from that subgroup or everyone from that community is going to try to kill me or is going to is, is hates me. You know better because every single day you're meeting exponentially more people who support you and that are glad you're there than are trying to kill you. And so the best antidote in my, this is my working theory, my best antidote to implicit bias is building relationships with people who don't reflect the worst of the community, but reflect the best of the community. Now, from a system standpoint, if I can make a recommendation, one of the experiences I had before law enforcement was I worked as a crisis counselor. And it was just answering telephones. It was a hotline, crisis counseling hotline. And the training for that was phenomenal. We had to spend hours upon hours just practicing with each other. And we would learn to now be able to process hard to hear information and do amazing feeling reflections um, and active listening. And then we got to do it on the phone with real people while being monitored. And again, this is over months, just practicing the crisis counseling, active listening, being empathetic, being present. And then I became a police officer and I was amazed at how little of that type of training we actually got. And that is 
that is what police do for a living. They go into chaotic circumstances and need to remain self-aware. They need to keep their arousal state at an optimal level. They need to be present. They need to be actively listening. They need to be conveying empathy, not just feeling empathy. And they need to manage their own emotional state so they're not becoming so involved that they become uh, combat ineffective because now they become part of the problem instead of being uh, maintaining some level of objectivity so that they can be responsive to the problem. These were all the skills I learned as a crisis counselor well in advance of coming into policing. So my recommendation is this. Cops should be trained to be crisis counselors. They should be managing hotlines in their own department. People need to be able to call and talk to a cop where there's no fear of being arrested, no fear of being judged. There isn't going to be, uh, there's just a conversation. There's just humanizing both sides of that, of that phone call. Um, and then we take those people and we put them out on the street. You, I, I will go back to that idea that the better we are at talking, the, the fewer people who are even going to want to hurt us. There are and, and, and people are still gonna line up to wanna hurt us, that's okay. But the better we are at that aspect of our job, the, the smaller that population is gonna be. I, I agree, and, and Vaughn, thank you for that. And this was fantastic, it was humbling. As a 20 year law enforcement officer who had to learn a lot of these things the hard way, I just wanna thank you three for being in the forefront of our law enforcement community and showing the effort and the energy to, uh, to make real effective change. We need more um, organizations and leaders like you. And so thank you for taking the time at a sacrifice. Thank you for sacrificing your time um, to, to bring so much knowledge and wealth to what we're trying to accomplish in our, in our call of 2020. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful conversation, Desmond, on officer safety, awareness, and decision-making. And also thank you to our panelists, Chip Huth, John Bostain, and Vaughn Kleem. Be sure to connect with all three of them on LinkedIn. You can keep up to date on what they're working on and contact them about the work they do in their organizations. Desmond, tell the viewers a little bit about this event we have coming up on October 14th and 15th. Hey, super excited. Um, October 14th and 15th, I will be hosting and facilitating a virtual outward mindset in public safety. We are just so excited for this opportunity. If you really enjoyed what you listened to today, we're going to go take a much deeper dive into these uh, principles um, and as they apply directly to your job and to your work. For registrants of this summit, those of you who are watching right now, we are offering an exclusive buy one, get one registration for our virtual outward mindset in public safety workshop that Desmond will be facilitating from here in the studio. So Desmond, from all I know about you and the experiences we've had together, I know that facilitating workshops is one of your favorite things to do. And with your background, public safety, uh, these public safety workshops are especially exciting for you. Yeah, I get super excited. Um, as a retired 20-year uh, uh, public safety law enforcement officer, the principles in which I share work. And, and I want all of you to know that, that not only will they help you at work, but they'll help you in your personal life. And so I love the opportunity to share this with my uh, fellow law enforcement officers and public safety officers and firefighters and probation and parole agents. Like I love just sharing this because it gives me an opportunity to share something meaningful, something that they can operationalize in their work day to day. Our virtual outward mindset in public safety workshop is on October 14th and 15th. Coming up next is developing a people-centric bias with Dr. Sara Saeed and Dr. Richard Glover. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. You're watching Answering the Call 2020, a virtual public safety summit from the Arbinger Institute. Today, we're gonna to be discussing developing a people-centric bias. Dr. Glover and Dr. Saeed discuss how communities and individuals can shape their own narratives in a highly polarized environment. Joining us today is Dr. Sara Saeed. Dr. Saeed is the chair and executive director of the New York City Civic Engagement Commission and has been dedicated to building an inclusive public square for almost two decades. 
Also joining us is Dr. Richard Glover. Dr. Glover serves as an executive staff member of the NYPD in the Community Affairs Bureau. He's also worked in the Office of Equity and Inclusion and also in the Training Academy, leading initiatives in training, DEI, and community engagement. Dr. Glover, I want to ask you a question about civil engagement. You work in, in one of the largest cities in the world. Um, in creating and developing civil engagement, um, what are some of the challenges that you see currently? The main dilemma that I see is, I believe, the myth that government, law enforcement, uh, and a lot of service agencies have is that things are going to get better without a genuine, authentic engagement of the community. You know, I'm a social worker uh, by profession, and I really uh, subscribe to a strengths based approach, which is to say, show people what their strengths are, not what their weaknesses are. Show people the strengths of the community and not the weaknesses of the community so they can begin to focus on expanding their strengths instead of kind of feeling victimized by their weaknesses. If, if there is a question of poverty, we start talking about, well, do you know a lot of people in the community that are you know, hardworking folks who get up and go to work every day that you see going to work and coming home who are doing their best to make ends meet? And in the communities I've been in, that's usually most of the people in those communities, not part of the narrative. The narrative just is so contradictory to the reality of what's there. It's really, uh, from lack of a better uh, analogy, just holding up a mirror to show their strengths. And having been working directly with the community for a few years now, all they really want is for somebody to come in and support the work that they're doing. Uh, they're quite capable and I think if we approach things from a strengths-based perspective and go in expecting that the community has the capabilities that are needed in order to make their community safe and whole and resilient, that we will do better service to them by being their partners instead of being their servers, if you will. I, can I add here? I think that's a really, really important point that Richard's making. Um, I think a lot of engagement has been very um, sort of one way, if you will, and sometimes um, communities come into spaces and they're asked for input on government initiatives, and that input isn't necessarily even integrated into the programming that government creates. I mean, I think what Richard's talking about is a really different way of doing civic engagement and community engagement. It's assuming that people not only know their problems, they also know how to solve those problems. And that it's our job as public servants who are paid through tax dollars um, to listen to what those problems and solutions are. So I think starting with communities is, is, the, is the new way, you know, that we really need to do community engagement. It took me a while to realize that until the community believed that I was actually listening and, and in addition to that, valuing what they were sharing with me, that any other conversation was just a waste of time. So listening and learning is really the only way to be successful in this effort. Once I did listen, I found out that they were able to share a lot more and give me insight that I never ever would have gotten to myself that was really the start of being able to service them properly, uh, not come in and save them, not come in and give them this great wisdom that I got from the various academic institutions I've been through, but really to hear what they needed and do the best that I can to make sure that uh, they got it if I could. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about my experience you know, as a New Yorker and as a, um, an American Muslim in, in New York City in the United States, you know, right after 9-11, I think what was really tough um, was that everyone was you know, traumatized and I think communities experienced the trauma in, in different ways. And so what was hard for, for us was that we were considered villains, right? So when people looked at someone like me, they might think that I am a potential terrorist, right? And so I had to sort of accept 
that people might see me in that way. And um, interestingly, you know, when I came to government, it was around the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And I was hired in a role that was a bridge building role to build trust between a community that felt very, you know, separated and alienated from government. Um, there was a lot of fear in the city, right? And so the community was an object of fear. So that, that fractured trust had to somehow be repaired. And I found myself, you know, in a role where that was one of the main tasks that I took on and listening was really, really critical in that role. And it's a very specific um, example of how I think having someone in my role helped at that particular time is that, um, you know, when we brought people in to talk about their experiences with city government, including law enforcement and NYPD, one of the things they said to us is like, well, you are always bringing us in for conversations when you want to talk about terrorism. You know, we have a lot of other concerns as a community that you're not asking us about. And one of the things that we are really cared about is that there's a backlash on the Muslim community. We are victims of, you know, hate crimes. And you, as law enforcement, as city, as a mayor, um, you need to pay more attention to our sense of safety, right? And so um, I think that that's that's that was a that was an example of how I learned um, how to play that sort of like a very fine line between being a representative of government and being a representative of my own community in the government space, and the importance of listening to um, my colleagues, right, in the administration and also the community and trying to bring those parties together to some, some level of um, listening to one another and um, trying to accommodate. So one of the things that happened um, as a result of these ongoing conversations is that we did start to pay better attention to, um, you know, not just the counterterrorism. Um, angle, but also like what did the community need in terms of hate crimes and feeling protected and safe, because their sense of safety would mean that they would also be, you know, more engaged, more connected to government, thriving, vibrant, right, like and become a part of the city. So I think those kinds of efforts of really um, listening and paying attention and responding when communities feel a sense of fear um, was was crucial in terms of like, creating a small change. I don't think it changed everything, but I think it was a meaningful input into um, community engagement. If I could add, th th those are great points. And I wanted to say, uh, to borrow from uh, an average principle of seeing people as people, uh, really on a very basic level, in terms of what our expectations when we go in to listen, because there's active listening kind of requires that you kind of let those expectations drop and really hear what's coming to you as it's fresh and brand new. That helped me a lot. I was working, I have been working in uh, areas and neighborhoods that have been designated as high crime. So I went in expecting to hear about the fears of uh, gun violence and the fears of, of, of personal physical crimes and things like that. And what came out was what you would expect from any normal parent or, or your neighbor, which is, we, we want we want uh, nice parks and recreations. We want a, a place where our kids can be free. We want good education, but we also need jobs and we also need food. And you know, coming at it from the perspective of law enforcement, I had a whole different set of expectations. However, when I was able to sit back and take a breath and really listen to what their concerns were, they presented issues and challenges that really were much more manageable these are folks, whether we're talking about, I can't tell you how many times when I've talked about communities and the issue of say homelessness comes up and we talk about, you know, all the normal tropes about homelessness comes up and I am able now to join in and say, can we talk about these people as people? These are people who are down on their luck, who could be us there before the grace of God. Can we kind of start there and think about the approach and, and how we want to work with them and help them from that perspective instead of let's deal with the homelessness problem. And then that naturally extends to conversations about people who are involved in drugs, people who are traumatized and that trauma is expressing itself in, in community violence of any 
and of any types and, and poverty and all the other isms that come up, we are really able to dismiss a lot of the, say, stuff that gets in the, that's a, a technical term, all the stuff that gets in the way of really getting to the point where we can really be effective in our domains by looking past all of the stuff and getting to how do we actually address these people at people as people in a way that's most beneficial to them, but simultaneously also beneficial to the community. So I, I would just caution that listening really does require dropping those, uh, you use the word, the biases, uh, that kind of expectation bias in terms of inspecting what you expect to get when you have that conversation. Um, as public servants, you know, we're just talking about the importance of listening to the public and listening to communities. And we're also talking today about law enforcement, right? And those things, law enforcement's job is to create a sense of safety. And I don't think we can, I think we need to sort of really, really weave these themes together very, very tightly because you can't have safety unless you feel heard and seen, right? And so listening is a really important um, process that we have to create elemental safety for communities. Um, and that basic safety builds, is it like a foundation to build other types of safety on, right? So um, once, and it's about, as we talk also about sort of seeing people as people, um, when you listen, that's when you can see people as people. <laughs> So uh, Dr. Saeed, we often see, see problems. We'll see problems with um, the current violence we see in society. There's problems with, with drugs. In the 80s, we had a crack epidemic. Then as a result of that problem, up to 20,000 people in New York City were being incarcerated at a time. Um, what are the challenges of focusing on problems? And why is it helpful to see people instead of problems? Really, I think it starts with with me. Um, I have to continue to see myself as a person in order to see anyone else that way. I think also in the roles we have, whether it's law enforcement or other government roles, um, we have to really remember that we are in a role of power. And we, 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 I don't think we talk enough about power, right? and how we all carry, you know, different kinds of power um, in the roles we play. And to try to see myself as just a, another human being, you know, is, um, is sort of suspending a little bit of that awareness of myself as having power um, over someone, um, which I think can get in the way and like, have, you know, created ways where we objectify people, right, because they are there to serve us if we think we have power over them. Um, so trying to remember that it's not that, that I'm really here to serve communities. Um, and everyone has a story they're telling um, in their head about who they are. And who other people are, and I have my own story. And so when I interact with you, I want to do my best to try to center my own humanity and yours. And I wanna tell a different kind of story that's been told than before. Um, I wanna tell a story of, of two human beings. And I think Arbinger talks about this too, like just who are people who are in, interdependent and like we look out for each other, we take care of each other. And that if I'm coming into my work and trying to really highlight the importance of what the community thinks, it's really in everyone's collective interest to listen to that because ultimately, again, we're here to serve people, right? And when we are not serving people, there's we're gonna there's blowback, you know, we're gonna deal with the consequences of that. So um, because people won't be happy with government services, um, and Richard and I've talked about this is um, systems are made up of people. Right, communities are made up of people. We're all we're all human beings, and we're all very diverse. In a city like New York, we're very diverse, um, and the only thing that that we have in common is our humanity. In in Arbinger, we talk about being outwardly nice, 
um, is when we're trying our best, but we're, we're not getting there. Like one of the examples I give um, is football. Like um, I have a friend who's a major New York Giants um, fan. He loves football. And I wanted to get him a gift because I know he loves football. And he, and he opens the gift and, and it's a New York Jets uniform. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, dude, you love football. He goes, I love football. I love the Giants. I don't love the Jets. And, and I think it's with this dichotomy of like, when you work in government, I worked in government for 20 years, we often try to, we want to do this. We feel that this is a good idea. We, we want to fix all of these different problems that we feel need to be fixed, but we haven't really um, focused on individuals and asked them what their needs are. One of the things we, we want to discuss is this ability to reduce bias. Now, we all have different elements of bias, um, but it can be particularly really charged when we're talking about uh, racial bias. And, and um, what I'd like to talk about is that ability to um, see people, really see people, um, see people in a way and be curious enough in a way in which we're, we're willing to not just have a reduction in bias, but unlearn some of the biases um, that we've had in the past. Uh, Dr. Glover, what is, what is your feedback or feelings about, about unlearning? I have a slightly uh, different perspective, which is uh, I, I think it's hard for somebody to unlearn something because the, the mechanism of learning it is uh, so tough. I, I prefer the analogy of uh, creating a counter tape, right? We have a tape running in our mind that kind of tells us who people are, what our expectations about those people are, uh, what they do. And this tape was ingrained in us from the time uh, that we can't even remember back to. What I think it's useful to do is try to create a counter tape. So I know the biases I had growing up uh, in, in where I grew up in New England, uh, parts of Connecticut, and then maturing as an adult in New York, I heard all kinds of stuff. I finally got to the point where I, had, I needed something to truth test the information I had been given because I found out that a lot of my friends and even family members have been, have been telling me things that just weren't validated by my experiences. And I found them quite limiting in my life by kind of um, having held on to those experiences about what this, kind, what this person from this religion is like, what this person from this ethnic group is like, what this person from this part of the South is like or from another country. So I started creating a counter tape, which is, okay, let me look at this individual and see what I know about this individual. And long before I got to Arbinger, I started finding out that individuals can distinguish themselves from anything I had learned before. And by my embracing that distinction, I was able to enrich my life by saying, hey, that's not true about this person. Maybe it's not true maybe it contradicts everything else I have learned. So getting to that point where we empower organizations and individuals to kind of create an alternate uh, take. And I, and I say this in the context of what you mentioned about social unrest when I talk to people about police. Once again, holding up that mirror and saying, does what you know about a specific group, uh, uh, do, does some of the resentment that you hold really reflect your knowledge and your working knowledge and your lived experience uh, with X group, whether it's a police officer talking about somebody in a given community or whether it's somebody in the community talking about their relationships with the police. Uh, without being naive, you know, there are problems, but those problems can be seen in a much different light if we kind of acknowledge that we have these biases, we come in with them, but we also have the capacity to contradict those biases by examining and embracing our own lived experience. So, so Dr. Saeed, how does seeing people as people help reduce some of those maladaptive biases that we have um, every day in what we do? When people are objects in our stories, right, as opposed to subjects and like co-creating a story together and I think public safety um, for a really long time, as I talked about with the Muslim community and it applies across so many communities. I'm only speaking about the Muslim community because that's that's who I am and I wanna speak from my own um, place of comfort. Don't wanna talk for other communities, but I think 
the sense that you're an object in someone else's story, I think is very public safety story, if you will, um, is very common. It impacts so many communities and we need to make communities and marginalized communities, give them more authorship, let them co-author the public safety story. The next public safety chapter in America has to be with our collective voices. And I think one other thing I really, I guess I've been thinking about more recently is just how, um, you know, with the history of policing and law enforcement and, um, there is, there is this uh, very sad history of how it came uh, about, you know, as really a measure to control, you know, the black population, right? And so just like that, I relate to that as a Muslim post 9-11, because I think policing partly became about that. It was about controlling. And we had this sense of safety that to keep everyone safe, some people had to give up their freedom. And I think we're in a new moment now where we really have to reconceptualize public safety as nobody sacrificing their freedom, nobody sacrificing their liberty, but that we all have to take care of one another, right? And so that if someone isn't free, if someone doesn't have the ability to speak, to voice their concerns, to be heard, um, and they are policed as an object, that's not creating safety for them, you know? And so we've all lost. So really asking communities, what does safety mean to you? And I think that's what more and more law enforcement is, is trying to do. Like, what does community, what does safety mean to you? Safety is about everyone's safety. It's collective safety. It's not about one group's safety at the expense of another group. Okay. So, so uh, Dr. Saeed, uh, thank you for your comment. Um, I believe no one should feel that they have to give something up to be a part of society, that they have to be considered a problem or an object, right? As a part of being in society. So, so understanding that thought, like how does seeing people as people reduce that objectification over time? Um, I think that we're talking about relationships, right? And the importance of how seeing another human being as a human being is central to relationship building. And I think also what it does is help build a safety and a trust between people when you are really in a approaching these encounters as a as a person who's listening as opposed to like impo imposing your own storyline on the person. And right now, I don't think that we have relationships of honesty, um, you know, between communities and government. I think a lot of it is just very, you know, objective oriented, like I'm trying to get to X, Y, Z goal, and this is how you're going to help me get there. Um, and I think just trying to really create spaces where communities are, are listened to over time, I believe is what will help the fractures and will help um, create more trust and also create greater hope about government and its ability to serve people um, and create a greater sense of collective safety for everyone. Seeing people as people also forces me to acknowledge trauma and that there are people on both sides of the divide, but certainly among uh, African Americans in this country, where there is a historic uh, centuries long trauma that has been inflicted upon the people. And to expect that just to go away by kind of wishing it away or reconceptualizing the black experience is not gonna to serve to get us out of there. We've talked already today, you've been in South Africa, the work that uh, Dr. Saeed has done around truth and reconciliation. I think it's important work in addressing in addressing the individual and their capacity to heal and their capacity to move forward. I think if we kind of look at a person as a person and don't see that aspect of it, don't see the trauma, don't engage in trauma-informed practices, then I think we're being naive about, uh, like you said, are we really helping 
that person? Are, are we amping ourselves up enough to really provide that person what it is they need? Uh, at the same time, some of those people who are opposing the movements of the day are also traumatized people. And they're holding on to something they may not even know they're holding on to or opposing something that in a different light they might sign on to. It will advance when we begin to see that there is a history that we have to reckon with. And in reckoning with it, begin not only to see people as people, but to help people um, become fulfilled and become uh, who, their, who their potential, what their potential uh, allows them to become. And, you know, I, I, the emotion I, I, I sense is coming out of me here, but I also don't want anyone listening to this to think that, you know, I have my eyes closed to Black Lives Matter movement to Blue Lives Matters movement, to All Lives Matters movements, to um, reform the police, all those other things that are going on. To me, those are more symptomatic of the fact that we're really um, not quite at the point where we're ready to face the, the harsh realities of seeing people as people and some of the difficulties and the challenges that come with accepting somebody as a whole person instead of the person that you need them to be. It's, a, it's amazing how when we truly see people, um, how things can change so quickly. Um, a lot of times when we see people, all we see is the parts of the people that justify how we feel about them, right? If we feel a certain way about someone, then we're just watching and waiting for them to behave that way. But to truly see someone, to see their challenges, their hopes, their fears, their trauma, to see the whole person, not just the parts that, that feed our justification, is when we truly start to see them in a way that something changes in us. And, and when that changes in us and then our ability to, um, to see them and how we treat them changes as well. Dr. Saeed, Dr. Glover, thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you for your expertise and your knowledge. Um, I'm looking forward to this webinar just so we can share um, the information and the knowledge that you bring with as many people as we can. Um, we feel very confident about um, Arbinger's principles of seeing people as people and how it can overcome so many different dilemmas. And, and thank you for being examples of, of utilizing those things and, and more importantly, just being the people you are and being willing to uh, serve our community. So thank you. Desmond, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. It was an amazing conversation and I learned a lot and we hope you as the audience learned as well. And there is more to this conversation and to all the conversations we're having today. What we're sharing on this broadcast is a really short, uh, kind of the heart of these conversations and discussions, but we had to cut out so much to make them fit for time. So please go to the Arbinger Institute YouTube channel. For those of you who've registered for this broadcast, you'll get a link to the extended conversations in your email. And if not, you can go to our YouTube channel and find them there along with all sorts of other amazing conversations around these topics. Coming up next, we have a conversation with Chief Greg Dagnan on owning your impact, a conversation about transparency and policing with their community. Welcome to this third session of Answering the Call 2020, a virtual public safety summit with the Arbinger Institute. Uh, this session coming up is a conversation with Chief Greg Dagnan. Desmond, tell me about that conversation. Well, I spoke with the chief uh, of Carthage PD. Um, we had a great conversation about enhancing accountability and doing it in like a systematic way that's quite innovative that I think we'll all enjoy. We were privileged to be joined by Chief Greg Dagnan, who has worked in law enforcement since 1990. He worked as a patrol officer, a traffic officer, a DARE officer, an SRO, and a criminal investigator. He has served as the chief of Carthage PD since 2008. So chief, it's good to speak to you today. Um, 
one of the challenges we're seeing in, in our communities today um, is this ability to, to, to have this transparency or this ownership for law enforcement. It seems like as society, the media is more concerned when there are problems than when there are solutions. And so, so one of the things you've tackled as a chief um, of your organization is how do we overcome that, right? How do we overcome a situation where I'm only a focus when there's a problem? How can I address this on a day-to-day -day basis? How can, as an organization, um, we have a level of transparency so that we're showing what we're doing well and we're making things go right um, before they become issues? Sure. Uh, and I think uh, that's the question a lot of people are asking across the country right now. And I think that, you know, a good point for everybody to remember is we are the police. We are going to get in conflicts with people. We are going to uh, we are going to get in situations uh, that maybe the public can scrutinize. Uh, every, there's video everywhere. All of our uh, officers carry body cameras. And so uh, knowing that those situations are going to happen, you've got to start that transparency way before those situations happen for when something does happen uh you know that trust is already there that transparency is already there they believe that what you're telling them is going to be truthful they know that you're going to work to resolve the situation and they also know that uh you know if an officer did something they shouldn't do that it will be handled it will be taken care of and and i know that's uh, probably where this conversation is going to head toward talking about things like that yeah excellent chief i i completely agree and as you know, Chief, I have a, a 20 year background in public safety as well. Um, and so this is a, an, a, a very, um, I'm passionate about this topic. I believe that one of the challenges we face has less to do with um, what officers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and more to do with our relationship with the community. That, that if, if we're having a, a more meaningful relationship um, then they can see what we're doing um, when there isn't a problem. And so, yeah, so let's drive right into it. You've taken a unique approach to, to answering that call. You've taken a, a unique approach to address that issue. So let's, let's start getting into to this process called voice of the people. So sure, I'll give you the, the introduction. It's pretty easy. You know, when I became chief here, one of my first questions was, okay, how do we serve all of our citizens equally? How do we make sure that we're transparent to all of our citizens, that they're receiving the same level of service? How do we know if they really feel like they're receiving that service? You know, I mean, my intent might be to be transparent and provide good services, but if it's not translating to the folks on the street that we're dealing with every day, then, then it's not working. We know we want uh, the community to see us as a positive, helpful resource. We know we want them to feel that we're being transparent, as transparent as we can possibly be with them. But how do we do it? You know, how do, how do we implement it? How do we know? We, you know, in our conversations, we just kept coming up with one question. And so we had the idea for a one question survey. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so when we're looking at this need, we, we often, I think in agencies sometimes, we have this belief that we're doing well. We have this belief that we're moving forward in a positive way. We use our institutional knowledge. We use all the experience we've had with the community. And we're like, this is the direction we're gonna take. In, in completing this one question survey, how does that enhance your ability to be accountable to your community? Well, yes, and you know, very, very insightful question because uh, this is what was happening at Carthage. When I kept telling our command staff and even other area police chiefs and, you know, my peers, they literally thought that I had lost my mind because they kept saying, well, your department has a great reputation. So why are you worried about this? And my question was, okay, I think we do. How do I know? Uh, you know, th there are a lot of people that are living in our community that I don't see, I don't talk to. Uh, and they're probably not going to show up for some community forum. Uh, they're probably not going to go to a website and fill out a survey. So I th you're right. I think we're doing well, but how do we really know? And what I did not want to happen is we have, you know, some high profile incident here. And then I find out that we really weren't doing that well. Uh, so the question, uh, you know, which we worded it a little more scientifically, but basically the question is, so you got service from Carthage Police Department. 
was that service good enough that you'd feel comfortable with us serving your family? And we thought that that was the most important question to ask. And if we could know the answer to that, we would know how we were doing. Absolutely. And so your ability to enhance um, your accountability and, and visibility in the community was just direct questioning based upon calls for service. For every call of service, a, a person would be given an opportunity to, to score that, that service call. And, uh, as, and, and, in, and as a result, you were able to get kind of a better grasp of how you were affecting the community. Yes. Yeah, so exactly what we did. And, you know, I want to stress this. I did not want the officers to feel like it was punitive. I did not want them to feel like, because again, we thought we were doing okay. We thought we had a pretty good relationship with the community. So I didn't want them to feel like, okay, now you have to hand this survey out because we think you're not doing a good job. And so we did a couple of things. First of all, I had in-person meetings with all of the shifts and all the officers, talked about it a lot and basically told them, everybody you contact, if you have a car stop, if someone's a victim, if you talk to someone on the street, if you arrest someone, we want you to give them this, this card, this three by five index card. And so, you know, I let them know that, hey, this is gonna be, uh, you know, if you're doing a fabulous job, you're gonna hear from me because we're gonna get these surveys back and I'm gonna let you know what we're doing right. Likewise, if we're doing something wrong, we're going to try to fix it, not in a punitive way, but in a way where it's like, okay, we're a department, we need to serve our community better, we're going to fix this stuff, we're going to change this stuff. And so that was kind of how the survey went. And so you would get the card, it had the question on one side in Spanish on one side in English. And then uh, there was a URL where you could, you could literally write on the card and turn it in if you wanted. But what most people chose to do is you could go to any electronic device, take it in any language, and you click that one answer. And then we decided to put in a, an area for comments, which we really didn't think anybody would fill out. But amazingly, almost everybody put some sort of comment on their survey. Okay, so we're going to have to break this down. Chief. <laughs> sure. Luckily, luckily, we have a little time here. Um, let's let's go back to the um, your discussions with the police officers, because I think that's critical. Um, at times, um, and me, this is me speaking from my background in, in law enforcement, it seems like a chief comes in and an organization leader comes in and they want to create all of these changes, right? And it ends up being very punitive in nature. Do this, do that, do this, or you're going to have this problem. What I like about what you did is, is I think you took a very supportive approach where if they did well, they'd be acknowledged. If they didn't do well, they'd be supported. Either circumstance, the officer is empowered. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. New chiefs come in and they try to figure out what's wrong and they basically just rearrange the furniture of the department. They, they make it look like so that the problems aren't happening, but they really don't solve any problems. They, they just make the perception better. And a lot of that, as you pointed out, Desmond, is, is punitive or at least unpleasant. And what we wanted to do was know that the officers were supported and we, this was a team effort and we were going to go into this together and find, find some things that we were doing wrong, which by the way, we, we clearly did. We, we modified many things that we do because of these surveys. Uh, but I did not want, because the first, you know, if, it's, if an officer believes that he's gonna get in trouble for handing out a survey, then what happens is they become selective about who they give the surveys to. And I didn't want that. I just wanted the, the truth, whatever it was, whatever the survey results were, I was gonna publish them. And so again, uh, I did have a lot of my peers tell me that I'd lost my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so your ability to engage in a way to enhance accountability, um, get this information, create support uh, for your officers and for the community as a whole, why would people see that as a negative thing? Why would they see, you know, wait a minute, you're, you're asking for community uh, input, you're supporting your law enforcement officers, and then you're publishing it. Why would they see that as you losing your mind? There's a pretty consistent belief that law enforcement is seen negatively. They're, they're saying, hey, look, people are just waiting for you to do something wrong. And if you give them a survey, all they're going to do is point out what you did wrong. You know, and again, we could go back and look at the case and we could watch body cam and we could see what happened. And what I kept saying was, if it's real feedback and we're doing something wrong, 
let's fix it. I, right. I mean, I, I can deal with that. Uh, but a lot of folks were just afraid that it was going to end up being put us in a negative light and not really accomplish anything. I wasn't surprised, but I think a lot of people were surprised that with this survey, people didn't take it as a chance just to point out everything we did wrong, that that most of the surveys, over 80 percent, were overwhelmingly supportive of the service that they that they received. But I think the survey is just one part, one small part of, yes, there are people waiting for us to do things wrong. And I think one of the one of the issues with our current media and the media cycles and the fact that anybody with a cell phone can be media is, you know, you get a high profile incident that there's a small portion of it, uh, of, a, of a body cam video or a bystander video, and it gets, you know, it ends up on social media and everyone judges all of law enforcement by that, whatever it is, 10 seconds of video, right? Uh, and uh, that, you know, that's going to happen to us someday, right? We're going to have that high profile incident where there's a viral video. And what I want is I want that relationship to be so good with my community that I can bring those community leaders in and say, Hey guys, here's what, here's what really happened. Here's what's really going on and know that I'm going to be believed and trusted and supported. And so the surveys are a component of that, but that's kind of the mindset I think that we have to have to build that relationship ahead of time so that if trouble does come that you already have the trust. Um, and so chief, your ability to say, I'm willing to fix it. How does that undercut maybe that negative uh, um, perception that law enforcement, you know, isn't doing what they need to do to support their community? Well, and I think uh, you're a 20 year veteran, you've been around a long time. So have I, I think, you know, there's an old school thought that we're the police, we'll handle it. The community doesn't need to know what we're doing. You know, it, everything's a secret till we're done. When we're done, we'll, res we'll release our findings. You know, that could be weeks, months, a year, whatever. I think there's, there's kind of a belief that there's a culture of secrecy in law enforcement, which really I don't think there is. I just think that's old school thinking where, you know, we've got time, you know, we, we'll investigate it. We'll release it in time. In time, you'll know. Well, no, no one wants to wait for in time right now because they get their, uh, you know, they get their news immediately. People want to know right now what happened. The, you know, they don't really give law enforcement agencies the, the time that they need to really have the right answer before they release it. But, you know, being able to say, hey, I'm going to get this information and whatever happens, we're going to fix it and we're going to fix it quickly. I think uh, it kind of puts a different spin on that belief or perception. Give us some examples of what surprised you about this process and when, when the information started coming in. So first of all, um, there were some, some neg very negative things that we found out. Uh, and, you know, as a chief, you read those surveys and go, yeah, there is no way my people did that, right? And you look into it and you're like, wow, my people really did that, right? So, uh, so there were a few surprises of things that I thought were going well. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of the things that we found were systems or the way we do things really wasn't serving the public right. And so we changed some things. I also was surprised uh, that I think there's a, there is a group of people out there that would grab that. It's, it's a small group, but they would grab that survey. They would take it. They would 100% one, lie about it, right? I mean, there's, no, there's nothing that they said that was true. Uh, and then you would read the survey and uh, you know, watch the body cam and be like, that. that's not even close. So I think we also found that there's a group of folks out there that, that we need to win over, that really just dislike the police, and we need to win that group over. And then I think the other side of it was, um, we like, there's some officers in our department that are just quietly and diligently doing their job, and they hardly ever get any recognition. And through this survey process, we found out that they're actually doing a fabulous job. And so to me, those were the three kind of surprises that came from this. No, no. And I, and I think they're, they're each um, fantastic in multiple ways. So the surveys were, were kind of an indication, but you did your, your work too. Um, you use webcams um, and you were able to kind of verify what was going on with the surveys. And so that way you were able to kind of put support. And so, and so the, the, the thing I like about that is and instead of trying to, watch every webcam of every interaction of everything. 
uh, these surveys actually maybe gave you a little little things to focus on. You know, as as we say in law enforcement, we take a more pinpoint approach than this broad stroke that we typically take um, when we're trying to correct behaviors, for sure. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so we wanted those surveys to be as anonymous as possible, but we had an alert set up. So if we got the lowest score possible, we would watch that body cam as soon as humanly possible. Um, And, you know, obviously then if we all got a really good score or the comments were really good, we would, we would watch that body cam again, just to give that officer some recognition for what they did. Uh, and, so, and so the vast majority of the surveys, we didn't watch any body cam. We didn't look at anything. Uh, but again, if, there, if the survey was exceptionally bad or good, yeah, we did our research to see, again, what can we improve on? What are we doing right? Excellent. You talked a little bit about some processes you had to change. Um, are there any specific examples you have of that? Maybe some minor examples of, oh, I didn't even recognize that this was creating a problem that you were able to fix? Uh, our evidence officer here at Carthage PD, she's fabulous. She's one of our best employees. We've got a good detective division, but somebody filled out a very angry survey because uh, some of their items had been taken as evidence and they were, they, it was decided they didn't, we didn't need them as evidence and they were to be given back. And this person had to jump through all sorts of hoops to get their stuff back. And the detail they put in the comments I was like, there is no way we treated someone like that, right? There's no way we gave someone the runaround like that to get their stuff back. And so uh, didn't really want to believe it. Well, went back and started asking questions. And it turns out that we had an antiquated system of returning things. It wasn't really any one employee trying to keep this person from getting their stuff back. But the whole process was antiquated. It, it took a long time. The person was doing things they shouldn't have to do. And so... Uh, pretty much everything that was on that survey was exactly right. And so uh, I remember that being the really kind of the first survey that I was like, okay, here we go, right? I made the promise we're going to fix stuff. So here we go. We're going to have to fix the stuff. And so that's why I remember that one vividly. I think of the visualization of that, of someone being able to articulate, hey, this isn't going well. And, and you, instead of taking offense, right, saw that person as a person with a problem and not just a problem. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's easy when you get that survey data. You know, what do they always tell you? Well, take out the best ones and take out the worst ones. Well, we did the opposite. We embraced the worst one and we embraced the best one. Uh, You know, again, just to see because we truly wanted to identify if what we were doing is right or wrong and if we could improve. And so within a week, we had that system of evidence return it was, it was uh, improved. It was a lot better. And honestly, if it hadn't been for that survey, we never would have known because it's one of those things, Desmond, you know, we've always done it that way, right? So if you've always done it that way, you don't see the problem. And so we never would have known without the surveys. Excellent. And so how has that helped you and your organization and your abilities and your, your abilities to, to improve your performance for your community? Well, so for example, you'd have somebody in the jail that just got arrested you know, here, congratulations, here's your three felony arrest, and here's your survey. And the person would go, really? You really want me to fill out this survey, right? And they also be like, I really want you to fill out this survey. And so I got a lot of, I can't believe you guys are doing this. It's so great. It's so great that you care enough to do it. So we got really a lot of community support and points for transparency just by doing it, right? Just by doing it and releasing the results. But I also think internally, our employees finally realized, hey, you know, our command team here, they really do want us just to get better. They're really not, uh, you, you know, the old joke that patrolmen always talk about, anytime a door closes at a police department, you know, we're plotting on how to get the patrolman, how to get them in trouble, right? And I think we really sent the message that that's not what we were about at all. Wow, that, it's fascinating to look at that because there's a perspective here where, um, you were able to improve your culture in your, in your organization simply by showing, look, we're here to support you. And, and, and not only saying it, that as the negative surveys came in, you were actually doing that. You were, you were doing the things uh, in support of your, your officers. Um, so that sounds like that's a, that's a really impactful cultural shift compared to the, the doors are closed, they pull out the, you know, the org chart 
and they start throwing darts on who they're going to mess with this week, which was which was what we'd always say in law enforcement for sure. So we're really big on um, improvement in, in Arbinger or our capacity to come from one level of results to a higher level of results. What were some of the higher level of results you got as a result of, of being a part of this Voice of the People program? We were really trying to change our culture of our police department to a more positive um, and it's not that we stopped enforcing the law, right? It's not that we stopped arresting people. It's not that we stopped doing our jobs, but we wanted that culture of, even if you're getting arrested, we're gonna treat you like one of our citizens that we care about. You know, we're gonna treat you like a human. And um, we were, because the outward mindset and, and other trainings that were required, we were along that pathway. Uh, but I really think when, when you're a boss and you say, uh, hey, I want to know what people think. And if you messed up, it's okay. We're just going to fix it. You know, we're going to support you to fix it. We're not going to punish you. Um, I think for us, that was a cultural tipping point, right? I think after the surveys were done. And, and again, I think, um, you know, one of the most surprising things to officers is they would give out the survey to the person they arrested and the person would give a positive survey back. And I think the officer would be like, wow, I, you know, this stuff is, you know, I really am making an impact treating people like people. So, you know, if you want to talk about um, elevated success or something that was almost unexpected, but that was like a really big win out of this, I would say that was the biggest. I still think there were officers that were like, really chief though. I mean, you've gone a little bit too far now. You really want me to take this person that I just had a felony car stop with that stole the car and I pointed a gun at the guy and you know had to have him lay on the ground and you wanna give him a survey and ask him how we did. And so, so first of all, there was a lot of growth through that process. Uh, again, because a lot of the officers were surprised that the survey comments were, um, you know, I deserve to go to jail, but you treated me like a human, thank you. And so it was reaffirming to the officers that treating our community, that treating everyone like people, you know, uh, be caring and being curious about people, treating our community like this was a positive and the community was seeing it that way. It's fascinating um, that when we create a process to heal relationships between law enforcement and the community, initially it might often be seen as some type of, um, you know, we're just, you know, being overly nice or whatever the principle is. But the reality is, is that we're empowering our law enforcement officers. They're seeing their impact. And, and when, I, when I signed up to be a, a law enforcement officer, I signed up to have impact in, a, to be in, in our community. Like I wanted to have positive impact on my community. Um, I remember working in the jail when I, was, uh, when I first uh, started in law enforcement and seeing people be arrested, but shaking the hand of the law enforcement officer and thanking them for their time. And I remember thinking when I'm a patrol officer, I wanna be that type of patrol officer, that I can arrest someone and at the end of the arrest process, I'm booking them in the jail. They say, thank you officer for treating me the way you have. And, um, and that always resonated to me. And I can, I can say that I was that type of officer, um, but I think, what you took it the step further where you were able to statistically see that in your organization. And so there was a story we, we talked when we were offline a, a week ago, Chief, you talked about, there was an organizational person that came and said, hey, you have this problem in the community, please fix it. And as a result of um, the voice of the people in these surveys, how were you able to uh, address that person? Uh, someone came in and basically said, hey, you really don't have a good relationship with your Hispanic community. They're scared of you. They, they dislike you. They are all afraid they're going to get deported. And um, they feel like they're being harassed. And so, of course, I want to fix this problem, right? So I said, uh, okay, let's talk about it, right? What, like, give me some examples. Give me some four instances. Give me uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep you out of it. Get, you know, give me something that I can grasp a hold of, some group I can talk to or, or something we can change or do differently. Well, he says, well, 
I really don't want to do that because they're, they're afraid to even have their names mentioned. And so I said, okay, well, don't give me their names. You know, tell me what's going on that I can fix. Tell me specifically what officers are doing. He didn't have that. So he says, you guys just need to start going to racial profiling training. Training. And I said, well, we do that. It's a state law. Let me tell you what else we do is we do this outward mindset training. Uh, and I went through some other stuff that we do to try to teach our, you know, try to teach our officers that people are people, right? And they should, all, they should be treated as such no matter their situation. And he was kind of impressed with that, right? Oh, I didn't know you did all that. And I said, in fact, I've got some, I'm very confused about what you're saying. I've got some feedback here from these surveys that were filled out in Spanish. Let's look at that. And I, and I said, now, if you know something different, I don't put up with this stuff, right? So if you know that we're mistreating our community, I want to know, but let's look at this data. You know, not, I'm not arguing with you, but let's look at this data. Well, he looks at the data, stands up, says, thank you very much, chief. I'll talk to you later. And, and I said, hey, you know, if you want to talk about this more, or do you want to be on one of our citizen groups or whatever? No, chief, thank you very much. Thank you. See you later. Never heard from the guy again. And so, uh, you know, again, just I, I wasn't trying to talk the guy out of his beliefs, but when he saw that data, he had nothing to say, right? So, yeah, and, and so the benefit of transparency is that as an organization, as we create our data, um, we we get these surveys done, we compile them, we now have evidence that we're doing well. We have evidence in how we are affecting our community. We have evidence in in the things we're doing on a day to day basis. And uh, we have evidence that we're building relationships before there becomes a problem, which I think is impactful. Yes, exactly right. And when I, you know, it was finally, you know, not just as a chief saying, well, I think we're doing pretty good with the Hispanic community. You know, I think we have a great relationship with the leaders in that community. Actually being able to prove it and establish it um, does make a big difference. During this COVID-19 stuff, um, our health department um, you know, quickly became overwhelmed, right? You have health department that has certain specific things they do and they have enough staff for that. Well, now you're doing all this contact tracing, uh, you're, you're testing. And for, for a long time, we were one of the hottest uh, COVID positives place in the state of Missouri. Um, and we still are to some extent. And our health department basically just, they could, they did not know how to get the word out to the Hispanic community. Uh, we, we have a lot of people in our community that aren't English speakers or uh, their English is very limited. They're learning. They don't go to the same news websites we go to that are in English. They don't go to the same social media pages that we go to that are in English. And so our so the, the question was, how do we let the Hispanic community know this is happening? And you know what? I was like, we got this. What, what do you what do you want to tell them? We got this. Right. And um, it and it was amazing how quickly we were able to get the word out. And we literally made three phone calls. Uh, and then suddenly it's like, well, whatever message you've got, whatever the message the health department has, let me know and we'll get it out to everybody in this community. And so, uh, you know, something that was a huge obstacle for a lot of folks in this community, they couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, you know, we did it in literally days and it's due to the relationship we had that, I mean, that's it. That's, it's a hundred percent due to a pre-existing positive relationship and, um, and a relationship of trust. I think that's fantastic. Just think of the cost of that whole story. If you didn't have the relationships, the, the length of time to get the communication across the length of time to be able to get everything out to the community what that could cost the community when we're talking about um, uh, a health issue uh, like COVID-19. So uh, Chief Dagan, we wanna thank you. Um, thank you for participating. Thank you for being part of this Arbinger uh, webinar. And frankly, thank you for answering the call. Um, it is so difficult as an organization to, to be really accountable um, in a way where you're transparent. and. And listening to your processes and all the things that you've gone through, your ability to be transparent and to make the necessary changes has really improved your, your agency and your community. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you for everything you're doing in your community. And um, thank you for being a part of this webinar.
we'd like to thank Chief Dagnan for taking the time. Um, it was an amazing conversation. Clearly, he's an amazing individual. And we're thankful for the sacrifice that he makes, not only for our community, um, but for, for law enforcement agencies and, and really taking that next step um, in accountability. We were really fortunate to have him with us today. Coming up next, Desmond interviews Dominique Johnson from the Center for Policing Equity. Welcome to this session of Answering the Call 2020, a virtual public safety summit for the Arbinger Institute. Our next topic is Evidence Talks, the right resources for the right problems. Desmond, why don't you tell us a little bit about that conversation? So I had the opportunity to have a wonderful conversation with Dominique, and I can't thank her enough for setting some time apart from her very, very busy schedule. And we discussed the importance of research and equity in policing and the ability to use research to, to create policies with communities that are meaningful. I'm super excited for this conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Joining us today is Dominique Johnson. Dominique is the Senior Director of Community Engagement at the Center for Policing Equity. Dominique believes in the power of community, the lived experiences, expertise, and collective influence, anchoring a quest to uplift community-centered, equitable policing practices. I'm Dominique Johnson. I would consider myself a racial justice warrior. I'm currently the Senior Director of Community Engagement at the Center for Policing Equity. Uh, we have five audiences that we serve, donors, community, law enforcement, policymakers, and our science community. And I'm at the crossroads of balancing all of those with uh, the current moment of policing. And so thinking about reimagination, re reinvestment in black communities, reallocation of resources, while still providing harm reduction policies and data services for local law enforcement agencies. I am not one to back down from advocating for the little guy. Um, I believe that community is closest to the problem, so they're closest to the solutions, and that they should move forward and be able to have the tools and the resources uh, rooted in evidence-based practice to be able to demand accountability, transparency, and better relationships with their law enforcement agencies. And if that is not the case that uh, the, they're meeting the needs of the community, then we need to work together to make sure that uh, policymakers are listening and creating the mechanisms capable for communities to have the public safety that they desire. What you bring to the table is, and I love how you spoke about representing the little guy. Like we want, we definitely want the angle of the little guy and how your research helps bring notice to the little guy. In terms of community engagement, you are the arm of the research, right? So once your organization comes in and says, hey, like we're gonna look at this research, we're gonna look at your policies, then you as the community engagement director, you're, you're a part of that, let's make it happen. Um, this is what it's gonna look like for your organization. And so we're gonna make it happen. Is that is that a good follow-up in terms of what you do? I would say, yeah, I think it's a, it's a two-fold process, right? So every mm -hmm. step of the way we're there, we are working okay. with law enforcement. Um, we come in and sort of set the tone of, we are working with you to help make public safety more equitable and less burdensome for communities of color, particularly black communities now. And so the, the chiefs of the departments are very open and they're willing to say, hey, we have some disparities. We know we want to get ahead of it. We want to be able to work in our communities. We want to serve our communities better. And then on the flip side, you have the community saying, okay, we want to be at the table when these decisions are happening. We want to work with the department to make things better. And so I'm sort of the bridge that's bringing both parties to the table and having these well, now we're in a virtual world, right? So it's having yes. all of these virtual conversations and thinking about the ways in which we can uplift community members and law enforcement members to talk with policymakers about making everything equitable and less burdensome for public safety overall, using the data to show these services work under law enforcement's purview. And these are the services that community thinks would be beneficial 
to pull out of the law enforcement purview. And even law enforcement are saying to us, we don't want to, you know, we're not really in the business of being social welfare experts. We don't want to chase dogs. We don't want to do mental health calls. We don't want to, you know, police things that are not crime, so to speak. And so defining what crime means, you know, thinking about how do you engage with the job description that sort of officers have signed up for and community, how do you understand the system at large? What does that mean for you? How do you feel about it? How are these job descriptions as they are right now in this system meeting your needs or not meeting your needs? And then getting everybody to sort of talk about it and have actionable steps to move forward. You know, I've heard a lot of comments from chiefs of police across the country. They're like, you know, some of the things we're tasked to do as, as law enforcement officers were things that we were never meant, you know, to be engaging in, in some levels. You talked a little bit about how, how some of the things that law enforcement are doing are burdensome to them. Um, can you give me some examples? I know mental health engagement is one. Are, are there any other examples of, of something like that that might be burdensome? Huh? <laughs> there, there are a lot of things. So one of the, the I, gosh, I could run you a list, right? So when we talk to chiefs and, and line officers, they're saying, we're chasing dogs. We are in mental health. We're policing the homeless. We're stopping mm -hmm. DUIs. We're doing all these things. And they're, they are, we're ticketing people for having taillights out. And they're like, I don't even, I know that that's a rule. I understand it. But this ties into deeper uh, inequitable structures overall. And we're sort of the first line of defense when there are societal problems or social welfare issues, we're the people. So one of the things that we talk to the community about uh, a lot are school resource officers. And so I had a conversation the other day with a line officer and he's pretty much like, you know, um, school resource officers were, were, we didn't want them there. You know, we were tasked with having them there. So community members were saying there are needs in the school that teachers cannot meet when it comes to the safety of the young people. And mm. so policies are made, police are put in schools. And now everyone's saying, oh my goodness, we don't want police in schools. And so the officer was sort of like, we didn't want to be there either. <laughs> so now that you've seen that this doesn't work, why don't you sort of work with us to pull this, this piece of policing away from us? because it's burdensome for us too. Because if anything goes wrong with young people, we're the first people that are blamed for not being able to handle the, the situation. And it's not that we can't handle it, it's that it is not in the purview of what they signed up to do originally. And so all yes. of these policies are being made and community members are saying now they don't want these policies. But at one point, the policies were put in place because they were asked for. And so it's sort of that delicate dance, right? So you're working with yeah. community to help them understand how this policy was put in place because your community asked for it. And maybe you're not the community member that asked for it, but how do we work our way back to getting what you need and getting the plate off of officers to have to do things that they also were like, wait a minute, not sure if I want to be here either. <laughs> all right, all right, Dominique, I'm going to throw you a little curveball, okay? I loved my community policing job. And and I think I think mainly because I was a therapist at heart, and I am I am a therapist now. But like I engaged it from a therapeutic process in terms of what I needed to help the child, instead of necessarily arresting the child to help the child. Does that make sense? And so so my feel and thought is that if law enforcement officers had resources where they could turn it over to appropriate resources instead of being the resource, that that's more appropriate um, than maybe some of the things that we've seen in the past. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Would you agree with that comment that law enforcement officers need resources to turn to instead of arresting people as a resource? Yeah, they do. The problem then becomes what people are not thinking about is when you say what's the resource, who's that person? Because yes. like I said before, we talk to so we talk about throwing mental health to social workers, like, oh, uh, we're gonna pull it out of law enforcement's purview and social workers are now gonna handle the burden. How many social workers do you know? How long does it take you to get an appointment for a mental health resource in your in your community? Mm -hmm. How many of them are black? How many of them are brown? How many of them have specific traumas that if you have PTSD, does your therapist treat for PTSD or do they only treat for depression? So again, 
what does that look like? Who then, what's, the, what's their caseload? What's the retirement age for these individuals? And then if you think about that, uh, you're inviting young people to get their master's to go into this field, but you're not paying back their student loans. So like, yes. then they're going to go and choose a lucrative career that isn't therapeutic. And so when you're saying, oh, where's the resource for officers? There are no resources because there are other entities and, and structures that have compressed our, our need to connect and communicate with folks to be able to be a village. We can't be a community if we can't point to resources and we can't do that if there are other inequitable systems in that way. Uh, and so when I talk with community about that, they're like, oh, oh. Mm. And then when I talk to officers about it, they're like, it makes a lot of sense. And when you talk to them in the room together, everybody's raising their hand like, maybe we should talk to social workers now <laughs> <laughs> and see where, see how we can all connect. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Um, being an African-American therapist that deals with PTSD, you make me want to start my own business now. And I feel almost- I mean, <laughs> it's a pipeline for it. It is a pipeline for it because there are specific needs that communities are going to have when it comes to trauma and reconciliation mm -hmm. work that I am not saying that there aren't wonderful people out there that can do that work, but mm -hmm. what is their self-care practice look like? And then how can they sort of be in a place where we can uplift them as resources? And can we pay them? What's our city budget like to be able to pay these folks? Uh, that, that's, you bring up some amazing comments. I'm just gonna to follow up with that. Um, so I, I worked in a position as, as a director in, at a state level, and I worked with a lot of organizations. Um, and we were in the process of creating three homeless shelters. And I noticed that a lot of funding was spent in creating law enforcement officer positions to be in in the front line of the homeless agent, you know, uh, you know the homeless building. So they come in, and the first thing they see is a law enforcement officer trying to check them in. Um, so it sounds like, from your experience, um, if we're going to be investing in things that aren't law enforcement, let's not use law enforcement officers um, in those particular things. Well, here's the thing: there, there's a that's a delicate dance that you have to do with that, right? Yes. You can't pull officers out tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to be working on the harm reduction of that. What does it look like if you if you pull a certain percentage of them out of the place? What measure that? See if that's effective. Does it meet community's needs? Does it meet law enforcement's needs? But then you also have to think about it from a perspective of what other salaries could be paid if you did pull those folks away, right? Mm -hmm. So you could then have people who greet you at the door that are healers and not officers. Mm -hmm. But in the society that we live in currently, I think there's a stigma around being homeless, right? So people are really, the law enforcement is a, is a symbol of us versus them. So if you're meeting someone, mm -hmm. if they're coming into a, a shelter or an agency as a homeless person, they're already seeing that this place isn't for me. And so when you guys talk about seeing people as people here at Arbinger, I think that's the number one step right there, right? Seeing people as people. And maybe if the officers, if we're doing like harm reduction, we're slowly pulling them out. Maybe they don't wear their, their badges and they wear plain clothes, you know, and they support in that way. It's presentation. It's how you're engaging with the community at large. So I don't know what solutions are there. I just encourage people to really dig deep into the system as it is now. So if the system is set up where law enforcement greets you at the door of a homeless shelter, why is that the case? Get to the bottom of it before you come up with, this is where I wanted to go. These are the cuts. Because if you pull it away too soon and you haven't done your due diligence, you run the risk of harming communities more or having it revert back to a more stringent way than it was before. Uh -huh. But on the community side, though, I will say time is, time is now, right? Yes. Time is now. And so you yes. cannot invalidate the stories of community members who are saying, I don't have time to wait. You know, I've okay. been here. I've done this. And so evidence talks. Your heart can speak. It is very, it's very, it's a way I lead with my heart. But the problem is, is that in order to get collective movements going, you need to have the evidence, you need to know the systems, you need to understand how they work and how they've uh, been helpful or harmful to particular communities. And then you need to say, this is what I recommend, let's test it. 
And as you're doing that, then you're able to prove the point that, see, I told you, told you didn't work. This alternative, it's working, it's working. And then people will continue to listen and then you'll be able to get more funding and you'll be able to be more holistic in your approaches. No, no, I, I love that. And you're on point. Let's talk a little bit, which this, so, so what your discussion is leading me to a, a really key point, something I'm passionate about as well. When, when I see what's going on in today's society and people go, Desmond, Desmond, what do you think? You were in law school for 20 years, you're a therapist and you're African-American. What do you think? And I'm like, I think there's a relationship problem. And, and, and law enforcement officers can be really good at law enforcement, but are they really good at the relationships that are needed in law enforcement. So when there's a problem, we address it together and we're not addressing it as two separate entities. Um, and so what do you, I know, I know uh, your organization does research on relationships um, and the relationship between law enforcement and the community. Um, what are some of the things that, that you and your organization is discovering as it relates to relationships? Many people think that so from a community perspective, many people are thinking that law enforcement officers should be trained in things like implicit bias, and they should be doing a lot more um, what my boss would call soft, soft skills. You spend a lot of time on the hard skills and not enough time on the soft skills. Mm -hmm. And so what you're finding is that when people ask for implicit bias and it's not working, communities are frustrated. Well, that's because who's designing the curriculum? Yes. with measuring the, the curriculum, who is saying that this is working and that people are really benefiting from it. Because when I think of implicit bias or diversity and inclusion training from a nonprofit standpoint, it's like, check a box, go in for the day, meet with some consultants, talk about all the grievances at the job. They're going to put it in a the report. They're going to check it off and say you did it. And then it's, it's done. Uh, and that's diversity and inclusion. The problem is that you're not measuring anything. You are really just having people sort of re-traumatize themselves about yeah. the culture or the workplace or the ways in which they've been burdened by being an employee. Yeah. I'm not going to speak for law enforcement agencies, but I'm sure that this could probably be a practice that happens in the departments is that this is seen as a soft skill and we just check soft skills off because we really have to be working on the hard skills. And that is probably what's been drilled down in training. You have to be good at your job because you could lose your life. And so if you're constantly seeing yourself as us versus them, us versus them, the relationships become difficult to have or cultivate because you're constantly, it's a competition. It's more of, I got to protect my life. I got to protect my line officers. I got I to gotta do what I got to do. And if you step in the way of that, it might be you because it can't be me. And so if you are retraining and training and training people that way, it makes it very difficult to have relationships, whether it be internal or even seeing your community members. And on the community side, it's really difficult for people to let go of the grievances that they have because they're being re-traumatized every day. So it's not, it may be, I was stopped for a ticket, had a decent experience, and then my neighbor was stopped and she's black and she had the worst experience. So it's just like, I told you girl, it, all these bad experiences and it may not have been directly my experience but it's the collective grieving. It's the collective experience that people, black people, brown people, marginalized people carry every day. So how do you have time to make relationships with law enforcement agents when you are, you know, you're having a collective grieving process. So every time you see a police officer, you're already in your head like, Nope, not today. That guy is against me. And then the law enforcement officer right now in this current climate is sort of trying to just stop the bleeding of the national narrative of how their particular profession is just the worst thing that could ever happen to humanity. So if you're having all of these things happen, how do you have time to have a relationship in any way? Trauma is never one way, right? And so there's mutual trauma and, and, and what I'm recognizing is we have law enforcement officers um, where everything is a problem, right? Like I, I, I work to solve problems every day. So then a lot of the things I do every day becomes problems and we lose sight of people. Um, 
And then we have people who are now seeing law enforcement officers as problems. How do you address it when you're engaging with communities and law enforcement with this dichotomy of seeing each other as, as problems, but then trying to implement the right policies and community involvement to, to, to navigate that? So I had a, I was talking to my boss recently and she was talking to me about the civilians who work in departments mm -hmm. and how if you cut the salaries for them, most of the staff will go first. Most of the staff are people of color. Most mm -hmm. of the staff are black women who are single parents. Mm -hmm. And so when you explain that, and so I gave it in the context of the NYPD. So when you explain that, to communities and they hear that black single mothers who are the breadwinners of their families are going to lose their jobs if you don't do this the right way they're like oh wait I'm not trying to have a sister lose a job you know <laughs> that wasn't what i set out for that's not what i i didn't set out to do that what i wanted to do was get to the problem and yes. so you're constantly walking people back to say yeah you want to get to the problem but there are people behind those problems, right? Mm -hmm. So every time you are trying to pull something, you need to say, if I'm going to pull implicit bias training because it doesn't work for this department, are you pulling the only people in that department who are going to be innovative and challenge the notions of what the department means? Mm -hmm. Are you going to pull the people that are going to volunteer to be the community policing officers on the street for longer periods of time than folks mm -hmm. who are trying to go to SWAT or detectives or other agencies within the department. And then when I talk to officers, it's like, you know, they don't, they don't understand that I don't want to ticket them for homelessness. I'm only protecting this neighborhood because someone called me. Yeah. Well, have you thought when someone calls you, you should go to their door and say, hey ma'am, what's really the problem here? You know, is it that you're just uncomfortable with the fact that people are homeless and they and then define what homelessness means in the context of the community and what resources and agencies they have to go to the right people to get this problem solved? Mm -hmm. Or are you going right in and sort of arresting these homeless people because you haven't taken time to step back to see them as people? Because it's humiliating to be homeless, it's humiliating. It's a stigma, people feel that you are, or a second class and, People just want to get rid of you and hide you away. So officers could go and engage and talk to the people who are making these calls to say, hey, why are you making these calls? You know, step back. This is a person. So why don't you take a step back? And maybe this isn't the place or the time to contact us about this issue right now. So giving people a chance to walk themselves through their processes of why they do what they do is really important. And that's what I do every day all the time I'm sort of helping people or playing devil's advocate in a way that makes people say, well, hmm, didn't want that. It's like, a, it's like dominoes, you know, you pull one and all of them fall down. So make sure you're pulling the right one or a Jenga, the game of Jenga when you're pulling out. I just think people really got to take a step back first. Um, and once you sort of explain to them these different pieces, they're like, oh, I'll take a second. And so in seeing people as people, like you said, and, and in challenging, I love how you, you every day you're challenging, like this is a person. Um, how helpful is that? Um, how is that received from the other side? And how helpful is that as you're helping people engage that? I think you always lead with statistics. I, and I, I say that as someone coming from CPE, I am not a data person, but I value data. Like I leave it to the data virtuosos on our team, but I value the importance of being able to speak truth to power with that. When we're talking with communities, it's really about having them understand that you cannot make these sweeping approaches without a plan. So people come and they say, oh, I want justice. And it's like, don't we all? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> justice for me, you know, I'm a racial justice warrior, but for you, it could mean social justice. It could mean gender justice. It could be economic justice, like environmental justice. I remember yesterday I was talking to a community member. Um, they have a task force that they put together. They're reimagining their public safety, starting with policing. And the first thing that she says is, I want to know about quotas in the department. I'm like, what kind of quotas? <laughs> it's like, what do you mean quotas? Like, quotas. And I'm like, are you talking about hiring quotas? 
Are you talking about recruitment quotas? Are you talking about traffic stop quotas? Like exactly. what kind of quotas are you speaking about? And so she's like, all of them. And I said, no, you're, if your question is this, then what you're trying to get at is this. And she's mm. like, oh. And so it changes the whole conversation because if you say all quotas, and the chief brings you back, you know, he's working in this process and he brings you back a quota about hiring. And you're like, I didn't ask for hiring. You're hiding something. And it's like, no, you said quotas. You didn't say what kind of quotas. So what the chief is hearing is I'll be transparent. I'll give you our, our hiring quotas. And you didn't ask for that, but it's not that you didn't ask for it. You didn't ask specifically what you were looking for. And so it's kind of, again, as I always say, this delicate dance of making people understand that if you're not asking for specific things, if you're coming with an approach, if you're coming with a general statement, you're not going to get the results that you're hoping for. And the results are really crucial in this moment, whether that is getting someone to be empathetic to, this, to what's happening, whether that's having them put their pen to paper and sign policies, whether that's just advancing the conversation and keeping this this pressure on the country to really reckon with its history. All of those pieces and all of those people play a part in making this ecosystem work. The problem becomes folks are not willing to sort of manage their expectations, sit back and really continue to challenge with plans. Until you understand the system, until you understand the impacts of the community, the impacts of that system on the community, you cannot have evidence-based, practical solutions that will be sustainable. And so if you work together with law enforcement to understand those nuances, you have a better idea of where you can reimagine public safety. Otherwise, you're at square one and we're probably back in a, in a more harmful public safety sector than where we, where we are right now. Desmond, tell, tell everybody more about the workshop we have coming up on October 14th and 15th and the offer we have for people who signed up today. Absolutely. We're going to provide a virtual training, um, Outward Mindset in Public Safety. Um, it's a two-day program from October 14th to 15th. And because you register to this event, we have a buy one, get one free offer. You can sign up for that training. You can have one of your fellow officers or Fellow, fellow partners in, in public safety sign up as well. It's a great opportunity to take a deeper dive in some of the things that you've learned uh, in the past few hours. And Desmond, you are uniquely positioned to facilitate these workshops because of your background. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 20 year public safety officer. I've worked in corrections. I've worked in law enforcement um, and I've worked in adult probation and parole over the course of that 20 years. And so I've had a variety of experiences that we can bring to life and uh, be able to utilize some of the things, um, some of these principles um, directly uh, for public safety officers. You can look forward to more details about that in the follow-up email from this summit. Welcome to this session of Answering the Call 2020 a public safety virtual summit from the Arbinger Institute. In this session, we're going to be discussing officer wellness. Desmond, why is this such an important conversation for us to have? Well, it, it's amazing. Um, the last part of my um, public safety career was spent as a licensed clinical therapist, really focusing on officer wellness and officer health. Um, I designed several curriculums uh, for law enforcement officers on, on different practices to stay healthy. So this is really meaningful to me. And Jason, Brent, and Corinne each bring a unique perspective that will be uh, super helpful in bringing greater understanding to office wellness. Yes, as Desmond mentioned, we were joined by three panelists from all over the United States for this session today. It's such an important conversation and they all really wanted to be a part of it. So we were joined by Corinne Dopp, Corinne is a sworn reserve law enforcement officer in North Carolina. She's also an emerging health policy professional. We are also joined by retired chief Brent Newman, who recently concluded a 31 year career with the California Highway Patrol. 
Brent now serves with the Warriors Rest Foundation in support of concerns of police survivors. Finally, we're joined by Dr. Jason Wu. Dr. Wu has over 30 years of experience in multiple leadership roles as a commissioned corps officer of the U.S. Public Health Service. He is also the founder of Mindset for Results. In answering this call and bringing these people together, we want to not only discuss the things they're currently doing, um, the things, the knowledge that they can bring, but also how Arbinger principles can, can bring light um, and new resources um, to these difficult topics. So let's start with, uh, with Dr. Wu. Um, Jason, we, we want to talk a little bit about how does this all work from a, from a medical standpoint? When we look at the, the physi physiological uh, issues of, of things like depression or anxiety or trauma as it relates to law enforcement, when we look at the mental and psychological issues, um, how do they come together um, when we start looking at this body and mind system? Um, what do we know about that? Yeah, you know, does, there are two aspects, two things I, I think I would want to touch on related to, first is, is what we've learned in the medical profession as a whole, certainly in my 30 years in medicine, certainly when I got started, um, there's a tendency to think of the head as separate from, separate from the body. But what we've learned over the last 20, 30 years really is, is that you can't separate from the mind from the body, right? Wellness of the body requires wellness of the mind and having that established connection. Um, and so it's recognizing that we, we can't be physically well without really having a, a good sense of, of where our heads are at and being able to address compliance issues and more importantly, all the neuro, uh, neuro, neurobiological impacts of the, uh, on, on the, the rest of the body um, from the stresses and, and strains that the, that the nervous system can be under. The other aspect that I, I'd bring into uh, the, the issue, particularly for folks in service areas, uh, health, for example, uh, one of my interests in getting into to medicine 30 plus years ago was, was a lot of the stress. My, my mother was an anesthesiologist. And back at that time, there were, there were a lot of lawsuits, uh, a lot of medical uh, professionals who were having their careers jeopardized by just one or two bad cases. Um, and the stress that that type of system where there's a lot of focus on perfection uh, can have um, and, and, and the impact that it has on, on the, psych, the, the psyche of a person going through that. And I think you know this extends throughout um, folks who decide to go into a service calling, um, particularly in public safety and, and, become, and choosing to become a police officer. I don't think anybody goes into a service uh, role thinking they're there to hurt anybody, right? They go into it because they have this higher calling, this, this desire to be helpful. The challenge is when the external environment changes or the invitations within our everyday work environment or even our training sometime where there becomes more of a focus on particular actions. And unfortunately, I've, we've seen, certainly seen this in medicine as well, where the invitations around us um, to be focused on, quote, do it right the behavior uh, is really shifted us away from seeing the folks that we are engaged with. And rather being, rather being focused about doing the right thing for the person in front of us is doing the right thing that keeps us from getting out of trouble, so. Oh, no, absolutely, Jason. Um, thank you. Um, I love your introduction in, in the compatibility um, of the, or the collaborative efforts of the body and the mind together. Dr. Wu talked a lot about how, how trauma and, and these things play an effect in these service roles, uh, in these roles such as law enforcement and public safety. What have you learned in your role, not just as a 30 year police officer, but in your current role as a, tra as a, as a trainer in trauma? I think what happens is having been, uh, I was an academy commander at one point, I would see the, um, these new recruits come in and you see exactly as Jason just said, you see the idealism, you see the, um, how they had left careers where they were making two or three times what they were going to be making in law enforcement, but that they had a call, they had a sense from when they were a child that they wanted to, to engage and actually make society better as a peace officer. And then I get to see those cadets graduate and unfortunately lose a number through line of duty death. And then to start to see the impact of trauma as those um, trained and yet somewhat idealistic people 
began to interact with um, the world that, that they patrolled, the world that they interacted with. And of course, as they're receiving trauma, the, the difficulty about trauma is, is what you do with it. And so when you look at those same recruits 10 years later and 15 years later, there is a, there's a totally different sense about who they are. And you can see over time the impact of that law enforcement career and how it's affecting their, their mental health and their wellness. And they are um, the same person in a way, but they're, but they're much, much different. That's, a, that's an excellent comment. Um, and and I've, I've worked in training as well, uh, Brent and, 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 and uh, Dr. Wu, and, and I've recognized the same thing. We have people with this great capacity to wanna to do good uh, and being willing to sacrifice. But then over the years, they start to lose a little something about that. And so, so going to you, Corinne, um, You've been in that five-year part, right? That five-year point's really critical. I, I remember uh, where you, you have enough experience, you're a little more comfortable in your job, but can you relate to maybe what some of these um, uh, individuals are saying in terms of, you know, I, I do feel maybe a little jaded be, than when I first started and, and maybe I'm not, it's not as idealistic as it was before. I feel like I have a unique perspective on this because I sit on an intersection of public health and law enforcement. Public health is like they think about the population and vulnerable populations and people who are at higher risk of poor health outcomes. So the intersection for law enforcement and public health is looking at the law enforcement community and looking at, okay, they have a 21 year measurable life deficiency for life expectancy than the normal like American citizen. And they have that because of the physical and health costs of doing the job. You have hypervigilance, which is that hyper stress. And they can actually see now with brain scans that the stress long-term, like a steady level of stress, lack of sleep, that kind of stuff actually leads to the same PTS brain scans as someone who has that one um, traumatic brain injury. And it's the same on the brain scans. And so it's like, there's this cost that happens along the way and public health really focuses on studying the population and the needs of that underserved population or higher risk population. What's really interesting about the relationship between law enforcement and public health is that uh, public health don't have teeth. They make policies, but who enforces the policies? Law enforcement. And so law enforcement has to be the teeth of that policy. And so thinking, thinking about that experience, like you go into a situation and you have to enforce policy and rules and laws that you may not completely agree with, but that doesn't matter because your job is a law enforcement officer. You're there to enforce what's the law. And so there's a lot of stress that comes on with that um, and trying to, to do something like that while maintaining everything else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Brent, how would you define officer wellness? So officer wellness is really, um, I'd say it's like a goal. Um, it's when you're doing things in your life that um, are healthy practices and you are putting systems and structures around you that um, uh, regenerate and create ongoing health. Uh, the whole goal when you, when you get into law enforcement, we say it from an officer safety standpoint that, that your, your goal at the, on any particular shift is to get back to the office at the end of the shift. Um, but your goal when you enter that academy is 25 or 30 years later is to uh, graduate the career, not just the academy, but to do so in a way that your relationships are healthy, you're, you're physically as healthy as possible um, to the extent that it's within your control and influence. So when we talk about officer wellness, then what we're really talking about is the, the, the elements, the practices, the disciplines that go into um, those with the ultimate goal of making it to the end as a healthy and whole human being. Yeah, Brent, I really appreciate you commenting about that, that relationship component. 
you know, when I look at the healthcare field, I, I feel a lot of the, re, re, the, the challenges and the burnouts are happening around providers where we're losing connection to our patients. Um, the system, I, I mean, I remember when I started, I would have 20 minutes for a, a new patient and gradually that got cut down to 12 minutes and then to seven minutes. And there, and there was all these other checklists that became part of, you know, a pain list, a, an education list that we're starting to get more and more the way of my connection to my patients. And um, I think that's one of the drivers in, in medicine, particularly that is, is, is leading to a lot of burnout. Be interesting in sort of your perspective and, and Corinne's as well as when you're entering in, in that concept of connection and who that connection is to, obviously family members, but when, when folks are choosing to serve, who do they feel they're, they're coming in and trying to be connected to? As law enforcement, we are answering calls for service. And so the connection happens with those that are involved in that call for service that we interact with. I think that's one of the hardest parts of the job is trying to learn and gauge and do the best that you can with the time that you have and making those connections. Because although you may only have a short amount of time and you might have four calls pending, you want to give the quality that you can in the time that you have to be as helpful as you can. It's definitely a huge contributing factor to burnout and to feeling discouraged because you want to do so much and you do the best you can with what you have. And then you go to the next call to try to do the best that you can with what you have. Yeah. Um, there's this capacity and desire to want to have some connection. And, and then we learn that that often gets lost and it's, and we see that we start looking at things like burnout and we start looking at officers really not enjoying their jobs. And, and a lot of it comes from this, this inability to be able to connect. How does this inability to be able to connect and trauma go hand in hand? Part of it occurs um, because externally, so there's two areas, externally, because everybody that we're dealing with, um, in a shorthand way of saying it, they're either mad, bad, or sad. Um, there's something that's going wrong. So what ends up happening is we interact with, obviously, people engaged in crimes, but even the best people of our society, the most principled, wonderful people, we're interacting with them when they're speeding, or they're drunk driving, or they've crashed, and maybe it's their fault. And so over time, in a very uh, insidious way, if you don't, if you're not uh, very aware of this, that begins to build a, a, a view of kind of humanity because you're dealing overwhelmingly with all the negative situations. But the other side of it is the internal. With the internal aspect, what you have is officers will get disengaged because they're being led in such a way that they feel uh, dehumanized. They feel that um, it, although it's very challenging out in the work environment. They, they, when they came on, they kind of expected that. In fact, maybe that challenge is exactly why they came on. And yet now they're encountering things within the office, within their chain of command. Maybe it's a first line supervisor. Maybe it's a Lieutenant or the station commander, uh, or even the chief or the sheriff to where they're not being given understanding and support. Uh, their actions are, are, um, uh, critiqued in a, in an unhealthy way, or, you know, those types of interactions to where a lot of officers tell me, and my had my own experience where that internal stress is a, another really big factor in the overall sense of what we're talking about, about your wellness degrading. No, oh, that's an excellent comment. Thank you. So Corinne, as an officer, um, one of the reasons we have you here is that I know you've done some wonderful work in peer support. How does uh, the principles involved with Arbinger help you in, in participating in, in peer support? A lot of the literature that is out there about success inside law enforcement shows that you have to have that peer mentorship because when you're in law enforcement and you're answering those calls and you have that um, hypervigilance and those things are active in your life. You sometimes get stuck and those kind of connections can really help people come back from that 
tunnel vision that happens, it can make a huge difference in how you interact with each other on a team or how you interact with yourself. Communication is really important in general, but very important to law enforcement. You have to be able to communicate clearly. Um, Arbinger gives a common lexicon that you can have conversations about that is really difficult to do if you don't have common terminology. So being able to put words on it and name it, naming something is very powerful and having that, so it opens doors. It opens doors to being able to start conversations, hard conversations that under stress are even more difficult. And so I, the way that Arbinger brings people together by giving that a name and common terminology in ways that we can see others as people and we can work together and collaborate and a system in doing that that is usable is really important. And it's one of the, I think it's one of the biggest gifts that Arbinger gives. Corinne, I, I, I love the way you, you structure that about just giving ourselves the ability to have the vocabulary to talk about these things. Because, you know, what we were, we were just, or Brent, what you were just talking about earlier about how um, officers, you know, have, you know, have a hard time, you know, acknowledging uh, physicians. We have a hard time acknowledging when we have needs, right? When we're tired, when we're hungry. I mean, my six-year-old knows when I'm tired and hungry because I'm grumpy. Um, but we're, we don't have a lexicon because th those those natural instincts give me, you know, there's a self-preservation that has to go through, or I shouldn't say the self-preservation, but a self, um, self-care uh, need that, that comes up. And I, I'm just less effective with him when I, when I don't acknowledge that. Um, and being able to help folks see that um, we, we need to be able to have this language around where we can say, hey, look, I'm a little bit inward. I, I, I've got this recognizing those physical needs. I need rest, or I have or I need you know, some downtime from this trauma that happened or so this, the events that happened either at home or in, in, on the job yesterday. Those, sh those show up in so many different ways. And, and we talk about separating work and life. It's, to me, you know, it's the same thing that we did in, in medicine 30 years ago when we separate, well, it goes back longer, but when we separate the head from the body, you can't separate work from life, right? That, that is the nature where we're always in connection. And, and recognizing that we'll have those needs, you know, a sick child, a sick parent, you know, or a spouse that has an issue, those things are going to carry into our, 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 our job. Um, we may be effective at doing what we think we're supposed to be, right? Continue to do the, the procedures, but we may not actually be effective in, in, in the outcome that we're supposed to be having. And so, you know, our, the, the Arbinger material really has this ability to talk about this need to be seen as box, right? Whether it's a better than or worse than, or how we're seeing ourselves, right? Because if we're seeing ourselves as an object or as a need to feel, be somebody in particular, we're not leaving space for those needs that, we, that, that happen, that are going to come up. And if we're not alive to ourselves, then we're really not going to be very effective at being alive to other people. Well, thank you. And, and when we look at officer wellness, um, really being alive to ourselves is, our, is the best way to really gauge our wellness. Um, uh, Brent, what have you discovered in being an educator in, in trauma, uh, trauma education and, and supporting law enforcement officers across the country with the organization you work with? What are you seeing in terms of peer support? Um, well, there's uh, unquestionably, so Warriors Rest that I work with, we stand up peer support teams um, and do team building for agencies that don't have them or for that need refresher. And um, in those teams, as they, as they, uh, stand up those, those uh, peer support teams, it has a you know, dramatically positive impact on the organization. So it says something about the culture of the organization that sees the need for it and acts on the need. Uh, but that's kind of the organizational thing. You, you said something, um, Desmond, a little bit ago, you talked about being um, kind of being alive to ourselves. And, um, and I, I love that phrase. And I, I like to think of it, if I could connect it with wellness. Because what happens is um, if we're not taking care of ourselves, um, if we're not practicing good officer wellness, then what ends up happening is our ability to be fully alive to ourselves, let alone other, other people, 
is severely compromised. So it starts with basics like uh, nutrition and hydration. So going un, undergoing, uh, you're in a pursuit, you're in some, kind of a conflict, you're in, you're in things, uh, maybe a hot DV call that, that really um, elevates your, um, all the stress chemicals that go on your body. Just washing that through by, by having a lot of water afterward has an incredibly um, good effect on you. One of the other things that um, trauma uh, attacks is sleep. And sleep is the most profound uh, impact on your ability to cope with trauma, your ability to recover uh, from trauma, and trauma actually then affects sleep. So it's, it's, it's cyclical. So one of the questions that I like to ask people in helping them to become more aware of themselves and helping me as a peer to understand where they're at, I'll just ask, hey, how are you sleeping? Not how are you doing or anything. I'll just say, how's your sleep? Or I'll ask a spouse of an officer, how's he or she sleeping? And you'll get more honest um, feedback by that, not to mention the fact that we really need exercise. Um, and that tends to go, that actually helps um, thwart the hypervigilance syndrome. Uh, all of those things kind of biologically we need, but the other things we need, we need a support system. Um, we talk about isolation is the enemy. And when officers have experienced trauma, officers are under a lot of stress, uh, what they tend to do is isolate. And that first within their family unit, and then even within their family unit, they'll isolate from their spouse and, and kids. Um, those, are, those are steps toward bad outcomes. Uh, what we need is a support system. We need a, uh, someone safe that we can talk to. That's why the peer support program is so important. We need to work through whatever it's gonna to take to, to be able to communicate effectively with our spouse. Some officers aren't comfortable. They don't wanna re regurgitate the, um, the really horrible things that happen and they don't wanna have their spouse hear that and maybe have secondary trauma, but you need to have a safe place and robust peer support teams. That's exactly what that is. Someone who can understand, has a capacity to understand and you can share and be understood um, because this whole idea about isolation, fatigue, lack of sleep in an era where um, officers are working incredibly long shifts, mandatory overtime, the nature of the duty is often in, in uh, full riot gear on front lines, hours of boredom, moments of terror. Um, all of this is incredibly impacting to our officers. And I think their wellness needs to be acknowledged that and then employ a strategy around these things with each other and as a team so that you can do what you're saying. We need to really be alive to ourselves, um, but it becomes very difficult if we're not practicing good officer wellness. You know, you know, it, it's amazing, Brent. Um, I've done a lot of specialized training in, in trauma and trauma support, and you just gave all the cliff notes. I wish I'd met you several years ago. <laughs> you literally just gave all the cliff notes of what I would recommend. I, I agree hundred percent that the, you know, our rest, our ability to process and have that downtime, it's hard. Um, we all live very, very busy lives. We have more, I'm sure in, in public safety, um, much like in health, there are all these checklists, all these tasks that we have to do. Plus, you know, in that personal work life, and there's just so much. Um, we, we can rob ourselves of that when we, as long as we continue to have this idealized self-image of ourselves, where we are objecting of ourselves and, and holding ourselves to a, a standard that's just not physically possible. We have to be able to let, let go of these, these, these idealized selves, right? Because in, in often that's, that's what makes it difficult for us to speak to somebody else, to begin to even have that conversation, because we, we have that, that need to be seen as this this person that we think we should be and and it makes it hard to acknowledge that we're uh, we may not be that that's okay right and we have to help folks understand that and be able to have that conversation excellent point um my motto is it's okay to not be okay um it's okay to recognize there's things we can implement to greater support our capacity and like uh officer dop has said like brent has said i think we've all said it in multiple realms here once we realize that we can take care of ourselves, our capacity to help others just goes higher and higher. Um, one of the things I learned was that as I became, um, as the years ticked by in law enforcement, that almost unbeknownst to me, everyone was becoming some sort of an object. Whether it was the people I was spending time with, 
my fellow employees, uh, my family, either you were helping me and being a vehicle I could use, or you were an obstacle or you were in my way. And I've really had to learn to address those things to get better, more meaningful relationships, um, which was also helpful for our well being. What Arbinger principle or what Arbinger thing do you utilize on a day to day basis that helps enhance your overall well being and your wellness? For, for me, it's that, that one element about the, that's the core of this material and, and the core of just being a better person and a happy person. It's connection. Connection is the core of what we are as human beings, not, not the accolades, not all the doings. It's that connection. Um, and where I think this is particularly relevant for uh, officers uh, in, in today's uh, environment, where there's all this turmoil out there, it's um, get reconnected. Just find that way. Don't you know? Don't have this burden that you have of this idealized self, and find those folks who who you can connect with, because that's where your humanity comes back, and that's where humanity really exists. That right, that common connection. In so many interactions that we have throughout the day, we have it starts with a choice, and there's this sense that you have inside you that you're supposed to do something. I'm going to illustrate this in two ways in a moment, and you either. You, you either listen to that choice and act on it or you betray it and you rationalize. And based upon where you go by either honoring what your conscience, what your inner self is telling you to do or betraying that, you start to go down a little road, even in that interaction that makes the whole thing quite different. So I'll give you two quick examples. So um, if I'm a leader, and uh, when, I, when I was in leadership positions, there was always a temptation because you have staff um, to, um, for example, uh, to skip out on a duty. Well, here's what I mean. If I didn't like dealing with the press, I've got a public information officer that can do that. If I don't like to go to public meetings, I've got a, I've got a resource officer that can go to that. If I didn't like to talk to the troops, then I could always have a meeting at division or I could be otherwise legitimately busy during a, a training day when, when the captain would normally address the troops. And, but in every one of those cases, if I betray that sense, but my sense is you need to show up, you need to talk to the press, you need to do these things. And every time I betrayed that, what ends up happening is I would lose self-respect. And what ends up happening is if you make enough of those decisions as a leader over enough years, it, it gets harder and harder to look in the mirror. And it, it begins to have a cumulative effect on your leadership effectiveness because you have maybe not even at a fully conscious level, you, you've lost some respect. Works the same way for officers and sergeants that are working the road. You have, a, you have an inner sense that you're supposed to, you're, it's not just a traffic stop, but you need to go the extra mile in this one, or you need to ask a question, or you need to render a little bit more or different service because you're, you're your finely tuned inner being is telling you to do that. And you have a choice at that moment. You either do it and really reap the good consequences that go with that. Life becomes an adventure when you do that. You get out of your comfort zone. Or what you do is you rationalize. You say, I'm tired. I, I, this is my nth call of the day. I don't have time for this. It's probably nothing anyway. You go through all these rationalizations. If you do that as an officer for enough years over time, that loss of self-respect it degrades your wellness. And it's one of those things that um, it definitely degrades your ability to cope with all that we're doing. Much of the joy in life, whether it's a leader or a frontline officer is in listening to that inner self, taking what feels to you a little bit of risk and then reaping the benefit of the fully human interaction that follows. So that's the thing uh, Desmond that has been uh, most meaningful to me. And I actually, it's so ingrained. It's like a personal accountability tool. But every time I do it, I come away going, boy, I am so glad I listened to that inner voice. And instead of going to war with people in my heart, I, I'm at peace, both with myself and with others. The Arbinger principle that has been the most influential for me has always been the concept of we have a choice. We have a choice how we go into an interaction and we have a choice to see ourselves and others as people. And that is the most powerful concept to me. When I interact with a community, 
and I'm able to make that choice, it really helps rejuvenate my motivation to serve and allows me to participate in the now and what's going on now with more presence and awareness, which enables me to make conscious decisions that are helpful so that everyone involved in the circumstance, we can all work together for common goals. And that's what Arbinger really empowered me and gave me the confidence to be able to do. And really that concept in and of itself is what drove me to believe and put into action that I can serve not just the community that I work in, but the community of law enforcement itself. We're thankful as, as an Arbinger organization that we can bring experts like you together and discuss difficult topics to secure and sure up uh, law enforcement is, is something we're passionate about. And so thank you and each and every one of you for doing that. Thank you to Corinne Dopp, retired Chief Brent Newman, and Dr. Jason Wu, who joined us for this very important session. You know, we cannot say enough about the importance of officer wellness. Um, it's directly correlated to officer effectiveness. And so we just want everyone out there who's, who's listening to this to recognize and recognize and appreciate the fact that your wellness matters, um, your ability to do your job matters, and doing it in a way in which you can care for yourself at the same time as possible. Welcome to this session of Answering the Call 2020, a virtual public safety summit from the Arbinger Institute. I'm Sarah McMullen. I'm joined here by Desmond Lomax. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've recorded some amazing conversations with nearly 20 experts from all around the country. For those of you who are just joining us, you will have missed five amazing conversations that we've had so far, but those will all be available to you following this event. Uh, they'll show up in your email. They will also be available on the Arbinger Institute's YouTube channel. So this session we're starting right now was a great conversation between Desmond Lomax and Jake Bacina, Mike Grigsby, and Doa Al-Ashkar, where they discussed re-imaging police in 2020. Desmond, tell us a little bit about that conversation you had. You know, it was a really unique conversation. There's been such negativity surrounding law enforcement recently. And, and these three amazing individuals have come up with innovative ways to bring to light so much positivity that law enforcement does every day. So we hope you enjoy this conversation. I really enjoy this conversation. Um, let's get after it. For this session, we were joined by three panelists. I will quickly tell you a little bit about them, but highly encourage that you connect with them on LinkedIn and their other social media channels to learn more about them. So first, we were joined by Mike Grigsby. Mike is currently located in Sioux Falls. He's the Director of Innovation and Technology for the City of Sioux Falls. Also joining us is Sergeant Jake Bacina. Sergeant Bacina is a 17-year veteran of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. He is currently assigned to the Media Relations Unit. Finally, Officer Doa L. Ashkar. She joined the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department in 2012. She's currently assigned to the Media Relations Unit, responsible for responding to public information requests regarding department activities to local, regional, and national media partners. Let's talk a little bit about um, shaping the narrative. Um, now, 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 Michael, could you talk to me a little bit about that project you're doing to help reshape the the law enforcement narrative? This year, I launched a, a project, a lifestyle and apparel brand for, for first responders. Um, it grew out of a story, uh, my own personal story, uh, where I was wearing, um, I guess I should say just apparel, uh, a t-shirt that identified me as a police officer. And uh, the experience that I had wearing that in public uh, was less than what I had hoped for. And 
that was 15 years ago. And it just has gotten me thinking about it over time. And one of the things that I really wanted to do was to create an opportunity for people who are so proud uh, to be in this profession is to uh, represent the profession that they're, they're in, but to do it discreetly, um, to do it in a way that provides honor to, to the, the profession, but also talks about the best values that first responders bring to their profession. And I wanted to give them an opportunity to, to really find something to identify around. I mean, here we are in 2020, and there's still no single identifying um, emblem for first responders. And the ability to bring all of the first responder community together under one kind of unifying uh, mission, vision, if you will, um, to talk about positive impact. That's, that's the thing that I really want to do and, and create a platform to talk about the positive impact that our first responders are making in every community that they go to. I just created that project. Um, I'm, I'm excited to watch it get off the ground and to, to really provide um, a unifying mechanism, not only for the first responders, but to the people who espouse the same, same values. And so um, I think this will be a, a great project to work on. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, Jake and Doa, this is a question for both of you. How do we address such a narrative where there's this fear that's associated with what we see in social media? Um, and what do you do? How do you, how do you guys operationalize that? How do you two, how does your organization operationalize it in a way to bring to light some of the positive and productive things that, that, uh, Mike was just talking about? I think that's a very good question. And it's, um, it's, it's very valid feelings that people in our community have. Um, I'm myself, a mother of two teenagers and, you know, as a mother, you worry about your child's safety. You wonder what's going to happen. You hope that they're always uh, smart and respectful. And the way kind of to do that um, is open communication. So not just with our own children, but with the community as well. So us being available, us allowing people to share their feelings, their thoughts, their fears, their emotions, listening to them, validating those fears, and then educating or explaining, you know, um, a lot of it I think is education, but also being available to respond to people's questions. So I think in our unit, we try to be as open as possible, um, to communicate effectively via social media, via taking phone calls, making ourselves available whenever we have any community interactions, maybe even just going out for coffee. Um, having our cards to give them a point of contact for questions, having transparency on our website, um, directing people to that, and not just people in the community, but also educating our own people, our officers, letting them know, hey, you know, on our website, there is so much information. Here's where you go and where to go to get that information. But really for us, I think, being a point of contact and being available is very important. And I think that's kind of what I see that has worked so far as one of the many things. Yeah, on Memorial Day 2020, we woke up in, in law enforcement, especially here at KCP, I've never felt more appreciated in my 17 plus years uh, on that morning. Throughout the COVID and the, um, the shutdowns and the stay at home orders and, and all of that, you know, we were always out in it uh, among all of the other first responders and frontline workers. We were getting just so much people saying, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for being out there. How can we help you? Where can we donate? Can we buy you a meal? Can we buy you coffee? And then the events of Memorial Day uh, 2020 in Minneapolis happened. And then over the course of a couple of days, that national sentiment kind of spread um, across the country. And it landed here in Kansas City on Friday the 30th and when we had our first protest. And within that five day period, that pendulum swung from so far on one side to never feeling more hated. And, and it swung so far so quickly. And so I think, you know, internally uh, within those of us that, that do this job, I think that that was, that was very painful for a lot of people to experience. And so, Looking at it from the outside, one of the things that was important to me and that I would communicate with our staff 
here in the media unit is um, we, we have to, to talk about our profession and give our people the energy that they're not getting from the community. And, and we really, we have a responsibility to make sure that, that our people feel regarded from inside, uh, inside the organization. And so that internal communication was a big piece early on, um, hoping to, to at least communicate to people, you know, what we did, why we did it, and, and keep them um, embodying the spirit of service and the whole, the whole why behind what we got into uh, this job to do. That's fantastic. Why, why do we get into this field? Why, why do we do this service? What's the why behind it? I, I think to overly simplify it, it's to help. Um, I could even go a little bit deeper and call it to serve. Pull aside anybody out of the first responder profession, again, law enforcement, military, firefighters, and so many more, um, and ask them why they got into this profession. And I think within their first 15 words, you're, you're going to hear serve, <laughs> you're going to hear help, you're going to hear protect. Uh, those are the ones that, that do it. And, you know, there's also a, a desire to express courage and service and honor. I mean, so many of these professions go back and they have such a high, as J Jake mentioned, such a high regard and such a high reputation for this. Um, I think that that's also the, uh, the appeal to this, this type of profession. I agree with uh, with Mike with what Mike is saying as far as helping and protecting and serving. For me, I would even add one more thing of representing. So representing uh, from a different community. So like my background, I'm a first generation Egyptian, um, also a Muslim, and there's no one from our community that is a female who is an Arabic speaker who was born and raised here that's on our police department. So to, to be able to represent a community or several different communities and also be a point of contact for them as well for questions and to kind of understand the culture, um, that's an additional why to the helping, to the serving, to the protecting. So it kind of all comes together um, for the why. That's, that's fantastic. Um... As a 20 year retired public safety officer, I would also add um, public trust, right? Um, the capacity to have that public trust that, that when people call you, they, they have this belief that you have the abilities, the training and the capabilities to, to, to make a situation better was something that, that I took to heart. Um, and I honored that uh, greatly. So Michael, you have a background in um, helping to create smart cities. How can the creation of smart cities go hand in hand with like innovation in uh, law enforcement? I, I think it, it is primarily about being on the, the citizen, developing a citizen centric approach. Um, it is really easy. I've been in technology for the last 30 years and it is really easy to come up with a solution that thinks about the infrastructure first or thinks about the deliver, delivery uh, system first without thinking about the, the end user experience. And we think about this oftentimes when we're talking about designing software solutions or things like that, but we don't think about it in terms of what the citizen experience is. And that is, when we have these smart city discussions, that's an opportunity, it's really an invitation, if you will, to ask people what, this, what their citizen experience has been. That also helps to inform the, the bigger question of what is it that we're really trying to accomplish here? So when we think about developing and building cities, it can't just be about infrastructure and policy and governance, right? Those are components, but it can't be just about that. We have to think about the other amenities that go on. What does it mean to live in this particular neighborhood? What does it live to mean on this side of the tracks? What does it mean to, to have this dynamic? And, and you know, if you're a, a, a refugee or an immigrant coming into a city in the United States, it's really easy for us to think dismissively and say, well, you had better learn the language. But we don't turn around and put ourselves in that same shoe and say, you know, if I was dropped into a foreign country with $20 to my name and didn't have the and, and had that same language barrier, how would I fare? What would I want? How would I want to engage in the city and what would I want the city to engage me on? So 
we really have to think about the deeper questions about how does this affect Joe or Jill Q citizen and how do we create a better experience, not only for them, but the people who live here, work here, play here, visit here. And, and that's really the bigger dynamic or the bigger discussion that goes on. To follow up on that for, uh, for uh, Doa and for uh, Jake, you guys, um, you two are the gateway, right? You're, you're, you're that sometimes you can be that, that first face or that first lengthy conversation about a problem from a public information aspect. Um, how, how do you do that? How do you help improve that, that experience in the face of, of so much turmoil right now in our country? You know, I've, I've always been passionate about police community relations. And I, I believe personally that one of the big disconnects in, in any time, whether we are having uh, good community relations or whether we're having more strained and challenged community relations like now, I've always believed that one of the biggest challenges is uh, people not having a full understanding of what we do and why we do it. And so going back to basic communication, that is just so imperative to be able to adequately communicate to uh, another a, a group of people that, that don't have the, the cultural and functional understanding um, and the historical understanding of your profession to communicate to them in, in, your, in their language, not your language. And so that was always something in the back of my mind and really worked really hard on that. And I, I've told people, uh, you know, they ask me about my job and they, they ask me how I like it and what are the challenges. And I say, honestly, it's the most non-cop job I've had as a cop. I have to literally train myself to not think like a cop, to not talk like a cop, so that I can think and talk like a normal citizen and communicate so that they have the most understanding. Like I see that as my responsibility for the, for the safety and for the um, impact and positive image of the 1400 sworn law enforcement members and 600 more non-sworn of this police department. Absolutely. Doa, would you like to add anything to that? Going back to what Mike said, as far as trying to understand or see what the end user is looking for, I feel like this is the time for us to listen to the community, listen to our peers, listen to people who have gone through the experience or who have ideas. Because from listening, we can learn maybe something new, which in turn will help us to better communicate to the public our message or even just grow a little bit, move forward, because that is ultimately what we want to do. We want to get better and we have to be humble enough, I think, to listen to what people have to say and not have any judgment or anything in order to be able to effectively communicate. Recently, you know, in, in, in these in the last two months, um, during the, the most serious um, unrest protest, we uh, facilitated a, a march. At the end of that march, we set up stations um, and we just simply called them listening stations. And I believe that that was one of the, the most powerful, um, maybe disarming is a way to put it. Uh, people came to those listening stations and we had members of all ranks from officer to the chief uh, that were there and they were there to listen. We, they, we didn't send them under those tents with any agenda to communicate anything. We just said, go there and listen. And people came in there with a lot of anger and a lot of frustration and a lot of energy and I use the term disarming, um, the, that act of being heard, those people uh, that came there with all of those emotions and all of those frustrations, um, they left with less of that. And, and really that's kind of what, what our service is about, is about lessening others' burdens. And if one of their burdens is a concern that their police department won't listen to them, then that's something that we can fix and we can do it every day. And, and I saw it firsthand, you know, in during those listening sessions. And I also saw it, you know, we, we maximize that, you know, with our communication strategy uh, going forward after the first few days, our early communication strategy was look what these protesters are doing, look what they're throwing at us, look how they're behaving. Of course, this is what we must do in response. And that did, was not well received. Um, we quickly shifted to a, a focus that we, we call it, we hear you. It was an observable switch in, in the tone. And, and when we backed away and used our ears and, and listened and let the protesters express their message, then we didn't need that force that was required at the level of correcting. 
uh, as much or at all in most instances. That's incredible. Um, when, when we talk of in, innovation, um, and we talk about this capacity through Arbinger, through, through seeing people as people, right? If I'm listening and learning, you are simply a person that has a problem you'd like to address, not a problem. Um, a protester is simply a problem. A person who I'm willing to listen to who has a problem is a human being. And just, you were literally able to disarm people through listening and learning. Like the, the amount of, of uh, aggression and violence that's associated with things are very difficult to maintain when people see you as people and they're listening to you. And, and you just gave an amazing example of that. Doa, is there anything you would like to add to that? I think the unity march um, that we held within the first few days was instrumental to what happened after that. Um, I saw some, and I didn't even realize it was some of the same people who had been protesting night after night. And it was a group of younger kids, young adults, um, I would say probably early 20s, that, you know, they they came up to me. I went to get a bottle of water where they were, you know, and um, and said hi and kind of tried to make myself available to them if they wanted to say anything. And they were like, can we ask you a question? And, you know, they're they have this attitude and they're kind of angry. I'm like, absolutely. Ask me anything. And I had to tell myself, don't take anything they say personal. It's not personal. You're going to hear them out because they're human beings and pretend this is your kid. Your kid is coming to talk to you. And that internally helped me so much to be able to listen to their anger. One, uh, one young man, even, he said, well, we were playing duck, duck, goose in the middle of the street, which then I remembered exactly what group this was. He said, we were playing duck, duck, goose in the middle of the street. And we asked you guys to come play duck, duck, goose with us. And you did it. And I said, okay. Now I remember the duck duck is playing. It was past 1.30 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> that is not a time when officers are on a line to ask them to play duck duck goose. We're more than happy to play duck duck goose with you or interact with you guys or something at a different time. Not when we are doing a, a field force or we're protecting people and property. And he was like, oh, so that's why you guys didn't like answer us and didn't come play duck duck goose. I said, no, after 1.30 a.m., most people would rather be at home sleeping, you know, than playing duck duck goose. And not because we don't want to, but how does that correlate with the protest? How does that tie in with what it is you're protesting? And what is it that you're protesting? And so I could see the wheel spinning and it just opened even more dialogue. And he was like, okay, I get what you're saying now. And I remember us standing on that line the night they were and, and us thinking, what is happening? What, you know, we're, we're out here, we're on this line and this is what we're watching. Just various groups out here um, saying various things with different messages, protesting different things. Um, just a change of uh, people, you know, like some of the same ones that were there earlier on in the day were the same ones that were in the evening, whereas we were the same ones that were out there from, the, from early on in the day. So um, I think just having, just being open and available to have that dialogue, to be able to listen, to be able to communicate, to be able to share different perspectives definitely um, helped me kind of understand a little bit more where they were coming from and what I could do better or what we could do better um, as a police department and as a group in the messaging. I, I've got to circle back to something that, that Doe mentioned and it's the listening side. Um, we, we have to spend time listening. And, you know, if you only have a, a one hour conversation with somebody, you should probably spend 45 minutes of that listening to them. Um, especially if they're agitated, especially if they are 
um, you know, if, if they're voicing a concern or voicing a, a grievance, you've got to spend the time uh, listening to them. You know, the discussion could very easily go towards, we think we know what the solution is. We're going to give you the solution. We're going to drive down this road and this is what we're going to give to you. And then, I mean, you could almost play the play the, uh, the the recording forward and say, you know, two years from now, everybody is is very disgruntled about the solution because it happened upon them, right? It happened to them. It didn't happen with them and through them. And it's because we didn't listen. We don't really know until we stop and get that person's story. We don't really know what the real dynamics are. And to be dismissive of that is a lost opportunity. Um, you know, in city administration, and I'll even go back to the, my time with the police department, it, looking for those opportunities to not just address an issue, but to provide a real sustainable solution, uh, that, that's the better investment of time, energy, and resource. And whether you are a patrol officer out, out there answering 911 or uh, calls for service, or, or you're an administrator and, and thinking strategically about these, the amount of time that you can invest in truly unpacking and discerning what the real challenge is, um, is time well spent that will produce tremendous returns on the backside. So Michael, you've had your years uh, working in the same public information field and you know, as, as, a, as a director at one point. Um, what are some of the things you've recognized um, just in your current experiences as city management and your past experiences in, in the benefit of getting past the problem to seeing a person? I remember one of the instructors in the academy uh, just commenting and making a story saying that, uh, or sharing a story saying that he tried to, as a, as a traffic officer, he tried to give away every ticket and every experience. His, his attempt was to get the, um, the person he stopped to say thank you. Um, and and the, the notion of that wasn't that, hey, people are really thankful for, <laughs> for getting the speeding ticket, but it was that he rendered a service that was high enough that people were grateful for the way that they were treated or the experience that they had. I can't tell you how many times um, I would go in and, and have to do a hard thing. I would have to make the arrest. I would have to um, exert physical force. I would have to do very hard and difficult things, but because my, my entering uh, mindset was to, to render a higher police service, um, I can't tell you how many times people would actually say, thank you. Um, I, I, if you think about what you can do to create that really, really strong and high experience, it puts you into a completely different mindset. The mindset of how you go into something is what you're going to get out of it. Um, it's what you're going to see. You're, you're going to see what you believe. And, and so your mindset entering these things is, is probably the greatest challenge. And anything you can do to kind of um, short circuit your autopilot mode, the experience is almost always going to be, be enhanced on that. I completely agree with you, um, Michael. Um, I think you're on point. Um, I think all experiences improve when we, when we see people as people and we're engaging them as such. Yeah. People know they violated the law. Yeah. They know there's a problem that needs to be fixed, but conducting it and still seeing that person as a person and to be able to be that type of officer to, to get the thank yous through hard situations, I think says a lot. Um, I think that's the gold standard. I think, and, I, and I think it's very capable in many situations. I wanted to bring recognition to the fact that there are public safety officers that we can recognize on a day-to-day -day basis because there's not one public safety officer who can agree with police brutality, right? We all, we all stand for everything that's against police brutality like any other organization that is out there um, protesting for it. As law enforcement officers, we care as, as much, if not more, just in my own personal experience, I would say I care more about police brutality and how it affects my brothers and sisters in law enforcement um, than, than the average person. My concern about police brutality has been over the 20 years of my career and, and how to do things the right way um, and do things in a way so people are saying, thank you, I appreciate your help in this difficult circumstance um, and, and finding that balance and then being able to empower other officers to do the same. But you are, you are right, Jake. Um, it's a different 
world. Um, it, it is, we're in a unique situation where um, our perception of law enforcement um, and how people perceive law enforcement is gonna affect generations in the future unless we do the things we're talking about in this meeting. Um, we've all discussed really unique, innovative ways to do our part um, in helping to be a positive part in society. To me, that's why, that's why it's everything for me to do these type of webinars with such excellent people, because I think it's so important to acknowledge the fact that there are things we can do to continue to help things go right in how we build relationships and how we listen and learn. We spend more time helping things go right so that when there is an incident, we have um, an historical foundation of a healthy relationship in our communities. Now, now I don't know, Jake or Doa, do you guys, you guys know the story of, um, wasn't there a certain area in Kansas City where people came to march and the community was like, no, we love our law enforcement officers here. Like, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna create problems here. Maybe could you bring light to that story? Because to me, that was very heartening. It talked a lot about officers making things go right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this was uh, Friday. This was one week after uh, the large protests started, and we pretty much had large protest activity every day for about a week. The day of this uh, incident in particular, the largest protest we had was about 1,500 people downtown. Um, that's kind of the tenor of the day is, you know, we had some, some really tense moments during the day. And then uh, on our list of scheduled protests, we had another one that was uh, slated to be uh, that evening at our East Patrol Division. The highest percentage of violent crime uh, in our city occurs in the East Patrol Division. So um, we, we had a lot of concerns for what, you know, we had a lot of unknowns and a lot of concerns. We watched the national news every night. There was a police station somewhere in a, in a major US city that had been set on fire and had been overrun and had to be abandoned or shut down uh, or otherwise destroyed. And, um, you know, we obviously did not want that to happen. And I'll tell you a little bit of backstory about uh, this patrol division station in particular. This station was built with a, a community outreach mindset from day one and from the ground up. You walk in the door and there is the window that you can deal with people to make your police report or to um, uh, arrange for bond for somebody who has been um, uh, arrested or to, um, recover your property there that's been recovered. There is that window, but immediately to the left of that window is a computer lab. And that computer lab is accessible uh, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day to anyone in the community that wants to come use it. And immediately down the hall from that is a community room that is uh, designed around um, the history uh, within KCPD of African-Americans within our department from our community. And then down the hall from that is a full-size gymnasium basketball court. And once again, just like the computer lab, that's accessible to the community. A, a group of protesters gathered at a park down the street and the plan was for them to march uh, probably about a half a mile or so down um, 27th Street to the East Patrol Division Station and then have their protest. Those people that know that police station, that's their police station where they go to use the computer lab or their kids go and they have basketball practice or they've had community meetings free of charge uh, in, in our community room. Um, they showed up there and they had a powerful message for the protesters that they didn't know. They said, y'all are welcome here to protest. Uh, you can share your message. Uh, you will be here uh, as, as, as long as you want, as long as you want to remain peaceful. But when the sun goes down, you guys are done and your protest is done here and you will not be taking over this police station. You will not be causing damage here. Uh, we are not gonna stand for it. And yeah, I tell you, like every officer that was there stood a little bit taller uh, when, when those community members did that for them. Um, it was just a super powerful moment. And if, you know, they, they had really been beaten down over the last several days. And um, for the community to do that, that's the essence of, you know, why we go to work every day is to inspire that in our community, uh, that, that partnership. And, you know, we, we just keep trying to highlight those uh, those things for our officers to be able to see and to be able to, to fuel them. Because it's like, you know, some of them I know are just down to fumes in their gas tank yeah. each yeah. day. You know, it's, it's a it, it paycheck to paycheck, so to speak, in your emotional 
uh, bank account mm. to have that energy to get up and go serve the community every day. And, and no one anywhere would blame anyone in this climate for saying, you know what, um, I've had enough and I'm not going to do it anymore. But the fascinating thing is the vast majority of people still do it every day and they still keep showing up. And so that, like, I, I see that as our, one, one of our little responsibilities is to, um, to fuel those officers that are out there on the front lines. And it, it gives those officers a reason to get up the next day and to, to go to work and to protect that community and to do what they can to help that community protect itself. That, that encompasses this, you know, we, we've been talking about seeing people as people as a, in a micro level, but in this macro level or at this spot where we're looking at organizational change, like our ability to create a police station that's outward towards our society, right? I have a police station where people are a part of it. They're a part of the police station and their engagement at the police station has more to do with just law enforcement and how that, how that was making things go right. So when organize, organized pro protesters came in, there were people that said, this is our police station, you know? This isn't the police, this is our police station. And so thank you for that story. Um, man, it's powerful. Um, Doa, you wanna add anything to that? Being out there during the protests and being around all the officers from all the different division stations, everybody on this police department was out there at one point or another during these protests. And over all of those days to see the morale just go all the way down and how everyone was defeated and maybe not even having the support of their own family members mm -hmm. to come to work at East Patrol and already have that baseline of defeat and to see the community stand up for you was huge and made a huge difference um, in the morale of at least one of the division stations. And then just sharing the story like even you know, hearing the stories from those officers, similar um, response to what you felt too, uh, that you just shared with us, Desmond, that you know, you you were just impressed by it. Like, wow, when you hear it from their own mouth. So we definitely appreciated it and we needed it. You know, we needed those those little nuggets of morale boosters and support that were outside of us outside of the organization. We needed yeah, it from and, the community. And, and thank you. And, and to emphasize that that is a direct result of an outward mindset view on how to engage a community from a law enforcement perspective. Like those things were going on years before there was an issue today. Um, and so, so kudos to, to Kansas City PD and, and the look at the involvement in which in building a, a police station, uh, building it in such a way where it's constantly supporting the community um, in, in multiple ways, not just law enforcement, but in multiple ways, uh, can't be said enough. That outward response um, display of support and um, solidarity, if you will, between the, comp the, the community and the police department, th the seeds for that were started years earlier, years and years earlier. And, you know, the reality is when people see any of these incidents, um, whether it's in Minnesota, you know, Minneapolis, whether it's in Ferguson, whether it's in Baltimore, Florida, it, people see this and they don't think about that individual officer behaving as an individual. They see it as a uniform. They see it as all police and they very quickly map on top of all police, the entire industry, the entire profession, that collectively they are behaving this way. And I know statistics, and maybe they've changed a little bit, but statistics have shown in the past that physicians that spend 30 seconds, just 30 seconds more with their patients are less likely to be um, accused of malpractice, or even if they know they did something wrong, the, the patient doesn't want um, injury to come to that particular uh, physician because they, they, they know them, they saw them, their experience was right, their experience was human to human, as opposed to I'm, I'm a number or I'm just part of the system. And that truth can be equally applied to um, the policing profession, the first responder pro profession, to say that taking 
a, a genuine and authentic uh, moment to connect with people at their their level of humanity is I mean I mean it's a tremendous boost to um, to kind of bolster that community solidarity uh, and it, and it it creates a dilemma inside the other person's mind. So if, if I get pulled over by the police today, and I think all police behave like this, like a bad actor. And then this particular police officer gives me a different experience. I now have a dilemma in my mind. And that dilemma is I can not I can no longer say all police behave that way because here's an individual that, that kind of goes askew a, a of what the, the norm or what my belief is. The next time that I have an encounter, I have to reckon that dilemma in my mind to say, is this, this officer going to behave like this or is this gonna be the, a, a good, better experience? And almost always, whenever we're faced with that type of dilemma, our, our just human psychology will lean us towards the, um, towards the better of the two. We'll, we'll want the better experience rather than the negative. And I know that, you know, Jake, and, and I'm, I'm assuming Doa has probably heard this too, is that when we answer that call, it's not really us that's there. We're thinking about the next officer that's going to have to have an, that, that will have an encounter with this individual. And the more that we can create good experiences, not only for ourselves, but for every other officer, every other first responder that has contact with this individual, we create an opportunity for, for betterment. So it may be just a seed planting today, but that seed will grow over time. And um, we, we can watch certainly the way we saw it in, the, in this community. And, and I, I would venture to say that I know the individuals that, that stood up in that community I can tell you personally that I have seen those individuals also um, ostracize the police for their their behavior in in other ways, and it, that's the I think that's the mark of a good healthy relationship is that I can come to aid when it needs to be, and I can also call you on the carpet when I need to, and that's a that's a good healthy relationship. In fact, we would want most of our community communities to behave in that same way is that tell us when we're not when we're not behaving well but also come to our aid when we are um i, I think that's a that's a i think that's something that we could all ask for no that's fantastic is there anything um you would want to share as individuals that i haven't discussed yet we know as police you know we didn't get into this to, to make a lot of money and to be you know to be famous and um, to, ha to have all this notoriety and all of these things. We got into this to, to do good for, for other people. And um, it's still on us though every day to find that why uh, behind what we do and, and to go out there and to, to energize ourselves uh, to go out there to, to nobly uh, discharge our duties um, for, this, for the sake of this profession, for the sake of our community. People would ask, you know, media outlets would ask me, um, members of the community would ask me, friends, family, uh, people I ran into on my day's office said, you know, what, why do you, why do you still do it? You know, why do you, why do you still show up? And, and that question, you know, I, I heard it so many times that it, that it occurred to me that um, that's really at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. You know, they're looking at our profession from the outside. And that tells me they're thinking, man, I wouldn't keep doing this if I were you. In the, in the seven days after uh, the protest started here in Kansas City, we answered 30,000 911 calls for service. That's 30,000 people in our community that, that had a problem that they couldn't resolve on their own and they needed some professional help to do so. so that's a lot of people. Uh, it's a lot of people that had a lot of problems. And um, we went to every one of those calls. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people about that uh, early on. And I, I had, you know, just an officer that I kind of knew fairly well and just casually talking uh, near the protest. And he said, he goes, yeah, we're going to keep showing up. And that really resonated with me. And that, in addition to, you know, the, the sheer number of calls for service, um, you know, we, we kind of undertook a little, a little hashtag, a little message that, um, that we added to a lot of the connotation that we overtly and covertly kind of put into our messaging. And so we're still serving. We even put a hashtag still serving on some of our social media posts. And uh, I think that's powerful for the community to see. It's a reminder, you know, most people say, well, uh, if I was treated that way, I wouldn't keep doing your job. Well, we're not most people. And um, 
we signed up to serve and, and service isn't about uh, only showing up when people want you there, only showing up when people like you and only showing up if it's a happy experience. Service means showing up no matter what. And we're still serving and we keep that message up. And it, it just gives, a, I think it gives our officers a, uh, a little added fuel in their tank. It makes them uh, stand a little taller uh, when, they, when they know that they are, they are showing up to make their community better uh, no matter what. Uh, service does not come with conditions. It is, it is unconditional. It's like love, you know, love doesn't come with conditions either. You don't love someone only when they like you or only when they're happy with you, uh, you love them no matter what. And service to your community is the same way. And um, we've really tried to instill that in our officers, in our messaging, uh, again, overtly in our media messaging. Uh, we've really tried to put that out there because we want our community to know that no matter what we uh, have, have taken on from some segments of our community, both inside Kansas City and from around the metro area, uh, we're still gonna show up for you when you call and we're still gonna be here and we still have people that no matter what will uh, lay their life down uh, for you if it comes to that. And we think that's an important message for people. And Desmond, the only thing I would add is just a, a word of encouragement. Um, I know that right now, uh, the, just the times, it, it can be easy to fall into despair. Um, in every, in every time like this, there's a seed of opportunity. And uh, I, you know, Jake mentioned it, it's still upon uh, every first responder to bring, to remember that call, to remember their why and bring that to the game um, and, and begin to ask other questions. I mean, now is the time that we need the voice of every person out there. If you think there's a better way to do it, if you think there's something else we could be doing, we should be doing, have the conversation. Um, bring your voice to the to the forefront and, and let us hear. Um, there, there are changes that can be made, uh, but we don't know. We won't know to make those changes until we hear about them. Um, so just I just want to bring a word of encouragement. Thank you to every first responder that's still out there, still on the front line, uh, still serving. Don't despair. Uh, take encouragement. And uh, thank you for the service that you bring. Uh, I know we'll continue to make positive impacts. Oh, I, I appreciate that, Michael. I, I completely agree. Um, uh, I know for a fact that that this organization and, and how we train officers and, and how we utilize these tools of seeing people as people improve the ability for the law enforcement officers to enjoy their jobs, have less burnout, and more importantly, be safe. And like, and we, we respect every bit of that. And, and just how we can respect um, um, the professionalism and high level of public trust that's for law, and law enforcement officers. Um, I can't say enough that we can also respect the fact that we wanna do things the right way. And when things aren't done the right way in law enforcement, we wanna improve upon that as well. And so, each and every one of you have had influence in the public safety field and continue to have influence. Um, we thank you for your participation. Uh, we thank you for your stories and, and, and everything that validates um, the strength of what we're trying to do and, and work with our law enforcement officers. And so, so we appreciate each and every one of you and thank you for your time. We'd like to thank Doa, Jake, and Mike for their contributions. We'd like to thank them for their amazing stories. We'd like to thank them for the projects they're working on. Um, thank you for contributing to our law enforcement and public safety community in such a positive fashion. And participating like this from all over the country and their different offices and areas has really been an amazing challenge for people to meet on behalf of, uh, of all of you who are participating and for us at the Arbinger Institute. We know that it was, it's been, um, it wasn't a small ask to set up webcams, to dial in, to do whatever you needed to do to participate, but really nobody even blinked at it. And we, we truly deeply appreciate them and to all of the other presenters that we've spoken to today. And this session, like all of our sessions, has been just trimmed down to the bare minimum of what we can share with you in a brief amount of time today. Um, but there's so much more rich content that exists now on the Arbinger YouTube channel that will be live following this event. And for those of you who are registered, you'll receive links to those videos in your follow-up email. Our next session is Empowering Community Contribution.
Welcome back to Answering the Call 2020, a virtual public safety summit for the Arbinger Institute. This session is empowering community engagement, and we were joined by three panelists, Phyllis Ritchie, Melinda Ricketts, and Chato Villalobos. Desmond, I facilitated this panel, and you did not. It's the only one of these panels that you weren't able to do. Why, why couldn't you do it? I was facilitating that day. Um, I was working with an organization on the East Coast, and we had a wonderful two-day facilitation. So thank you for taking over, Sarah. I'm sure you rocked it. And Desmond has another session coming up October 14th and 15th, specifically for public safety. And we'll tell you more about that later. I was very fortunate to be able to have this amazing conversation with our panelists today. Our panelists included Chato Villalobos from the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, where he is a Westside Can Center police officer. I'm also joined by Phyllis Ritchie and Melinda Ricketts, both from a Cut Above the Rest training facility. And for all of these panelists today, they have an amazing story, and I would like them to introduce themselves in their own words. Thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I'd like to start, if we could, with everybody doing a little introduction of themselves. Uh, tell us your name uh, and what your what your work is, how you've engaged in this cause of uh, empowering individual contribution within your communities. Melinda, if you'd take a second, introduce yourself. We're going to start with you. Give us your name and talk a little about uh, the role that you play in this particular arena. Hello, everyone. My name is Melinda Ricketts. I am the owner of a Cut Above the Rest training facility. We are located in Alabama with over five locations. We work closely with the police departments throughout the state and also the Alabama Bureau of Pardons and Parole. When people are released from prison, they come through our training facility in order for them to make a living when they get out. So we teach them usable job skills. And we opened our doors in 2014 in December with uh, our first class of three students and it has grown to well over 600 students in the past six years. And our recidivism rate is 3% and 85% employment rate. Hi, I'm Phyllis Ritchie. Um, I work with the Cut Above the Rest training facility. It has been a true blessing to be a part of this organization um, and watch the development as people come from a hopeless state um, watch their um, their character change, their self-esteem starts to develop, and you can see the change as they get accustomed to society um, and just begin a life. And that's, it's a wonderful thing. I'm, I'm blessed to be a part of it. My name is Chato Villalobos. I am a 20-year veteran with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Uh, my current assignment is uh, a community police officer assigned to the West Side community here in Kansas City. I've been doing that for about the last 14 years, and our primary goal is just to be partners with the community, uh, and help out in any which way we can, identify problems, do problem solving, and just anything that we can do to be a partner in making this community uh, a, a wonderful community to live in, work in, play in. So it's been quite an adventure and a life calling for sure. Now, everybody on this on this panel today has some, maybe you'd call it an origin story or a source, a reason that they've kind of got into the work they've gone into, where that where that passion comes from or where that dedication comes from. The maybe the point at which they started seeing others uh, as truly as people and communities truly as a a resource that can help support. That, uh, that group or those individuals to make a meaningful contribution and strengthen those communities. Uh, Chato, tell me a little bit about uh, exactly what your organization does and how you came to be a part of it. And I'm in a unique situation where I got assigned to a place, the neighborhood that I grew up in. And I remember it being a, a neighborhood of high crime and distress. So going through that experience was really some of where the roots were planted for me and wanted to do something better for my community. Um, but all that didn't get uncovered and unwrapped until I be actually 
went from being a, a police officer who believed that law enforcement, the, you know, writing tickets and putting people in jail was a way to validate your hard work. You had uh, something that you can measure through, you know, you were able to document that, that how many tickets you wrote. It wasn't until I came to this position that I realized just how many lives you were able to change by helping people. When you go to a situation and just assess a situation, help those people get plugged into resources that are, whether within the neighborhood or, you know, external resources within that family or just to see the people as people and not just stats. I really had my own paradigm shift and I was lucky that there was a veteran officer here before me that went through the same process of seeing this as an opportunity to do good by people and really help them, you know, end these cycles of trauma, cycles of, um, you know, uh, crisis that they were experiencing. And it went from being a community where they just accepted that they were a high crime, uh, low functioning community to now that they were able to identify and strengthen with themselves because we were a part, a partner in that. So yeah, the passion was definitely, I had to unwrap it and find it again to remember that kid that grew up in this community and what we wanted for our families and marrying those two together and having this opportunity as a police officer now. I, yeah, this, this has been a true adventure for me and, a, and an awakening uh, when I thought I was already a veteran police officer and knew what it was to, what defined a good police officer was. I love that. I think you really are in such a unique position having having done the one and gone into the other, which feel like they're totally divided, but really you've seen you've seen how they can you can move from one into the other. You know, you didn't just lose all of your faith in humanity kind of forever, uh, but have really had a transformation. Um and I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, so uh, about Cut Above the Rest, uh, tell me, uh, Melinda, let's start with you. Tell me about how did you get into this? Where does your, where does your, uh, where does your love for this project come from? Um, how did you get involved? I got involved because I am an ex-felon. I served two years in the state of Alabama penitentiary. And when I was released in 2010, there is really no resources for ex-felons when they get out of prison. And for someone, not so much me, but someone who served a lot of time, it is a shock. Some people get out and they've never seen, and I, and I say this all the time, they've never seen a toilet that flushes by itself. It scares them. They've never seen a faucet that comes on when you put your hand in front of it. They don't know how to work a, a cell phone and they surely don't know how to work a computer. These people are lost when they get out of prison. And especially if they don't have a family member there to help them. And I would say half the people that are getting out don't have the support of family and they surely do not have the support of the community. And that's where we have to step in and step up. Um, where did where did this passion come from, and how did you get involved in Cut Above the Rest? I'm going to take you back a little bit. I, I came from a life of violence. When when the streets are safer than your home, then something's definitely wrong. I got my life together, and I got a degree, and I went to college, and I got married, and I had two beautiful children. In 1997, I went through a really bad divorce. I, I, was, I was heartbroken. Um, I, I couldn't get myself back together. I started drinking real heavily, um, using, um, I, I was lost. And in 1998, May the 14th actually, I was headed to a cookout and I hit a car head on. No brakes were applied on either car. It was 110 mile an hour impact. It um, it all it killed the other two people, and that was in the other vehicle. And um, I was fighting for my life in the hospital for weeks. Um, when they when I made it through that, um, 
at that point, my whole life had changed. Um, I was found guilty of two counts of first degree murder. Um, and I was sentenced to two lives. So the next 20 years, I lived in the state penitentiary. So I met a lady inside. Her name was Juanita Pitts. We became good friends. While inside, we talked about what we could do when we got out. She ended up getting out seven years before I did. Um, every time I'd come up for parole, they'd set me off another five. Um, but me and this lady talked about doing something for others when we got out, and she did. Her family had been in the construction business for years. So when she got out, she put together a program of construction and heavy equipment operations. So my fourth time coming up for parole, um, she showed up to go to my parole hearing. And she told them that not only did she want me to go through her program, but she wanted me to work for her when I got out. They wanted to know why she thought so highly of me. Did she really think that much of me? And she said, yes, I do. I've watched her for years. And she said, you'll never have to worry about her return. And before she could sit down, they made a decision and I was granted parole. That was October the 22nd, 2018, 20 years later. Um, when I walked out that back gate, I wanted to turn around and walk back in. I had no idea what to do out there. The world had not stopped. It had kept going. But when I got out, I went straight to work with the cut above the rest, went through my eight weeks of training, and they put me, gave me the job in Birmingham. So I have really um, enjoyed my job. I love helping people. And it just, um, it's been a blessing. That's a remarkable story. So as, as Melinda said that, that for um, Juanita and yourself, that there was a real sense that people you were with inside really were your family. And there was a strong sense of, I want to help my family out. I want to take care of them. I want to help them transition. I want to give them the support that I had or that I needed in some cases. Um, how, how do you respond to that? When you walk out that back gate, you're leaving the family you've known for two decades. The people that's helped you, been there when you got news from home, um, when you lost your parents, your sisters, they were there. It's very hard. It, it, you, when you get out, you, all you can think about is trying to get them out, trying to get help for them. Um, and then when some of them do get out, you know, you know the ones that you have to let go of. You see the path they're traveling. Um, they're just not ready. Some of them go back again. And some go back because that's what they know. So that's what we're trying to stop, the recidivism of going back inside, of making and developing a, a family out here for them where they can you know, have a, a great self-esteem and be proud of who they are. You know, there's so many parallels to the philosophical approach that we take to, you know, what you hear uh, Melinda talking about and what they do, their organization. And I see a lot of common denominators like how you look at people and how you see their potential and not just whatever at risk indicators that they are living or that they have identified in their lives. Like those things don't necessarily define us as human beings. It's the resiliency within those people who live in, in crisis or who live, who are disconnected or who just are unaware of the resources available. So a lot of the success that comes out of the CAN Center is something that we discovered is when we go to a call, it may involve, let's use domestic violence as an example. We, if we walk in there and just treat it as like, okay, what is the protocol? We take the report, the, then that's it. And we go to the next call 
well, then we've really failed that family and that community because what we've learned to do as police officers that have the freedom to do the uh, proactive work and not just go to the call and then answer the next call is we get to do a full assessment of this family. What led uh, the, the abuser, for example, the person who committed the act of abuse to that point? And if we don't do a true assessment of the people and what they're going through, they, we can't really be a resource to them. So when we started to do at the CAN Center is we first had to become field subject experts of the internal resources within those communities. That means like your not-for-profits that deal with uh, social services. So when we ourselves took it upon ourselves to, to go and be the field subject experts of the available resources, then at that time, when we go to a house who's, who is in some form of crisis, then we could look at that person who committed the act and be like, this moment does not define you. Um, and although we are gonna set the expectation up here, we're also going to help you identify the resources to get to that, to meet that expectation. So that whatever dreams you have for yourself and your family as a member of that family, they can be obtained. And just because we do live in communities that have all these at-risk indicators, whether it's high crime or poverty, those things do not define you. And we could still give, help you meet that dream of giving your child a good life or being an example to your child, regardless of, of what's happened to you in your life. And we see with some of the people that we're talking to in this discussion, there's a lot of parallels in that, that some people took their own adversity and was able to channel that. And I think that's what helps us to have more empathy. And I get just so motivated and I get so inspired because you don't have to go through it to be there for them. And the fact that somebody like her who's been through it and has all that adversity that she's faced that tells me as a police officer, I would never have gone through what Melinda has gone through. But the fact that I treat with the way they are, that I know that Melinda's work is not in vain if the people that she gets them connected to can do the same as she does. And she could be the example that if we just give people a shot and see them for their potential, instead of just somebody who committed this violation or this crime or whatever, that we could really do our, our communities and our society a lot better. So that's what we... On a day to day, we, we go out and we, we gather food from places and we, we set up these things. We're able to deliver food to folks. Um, and the global pandemic, a lot of what we've established as a foundation has really helped us succeed during this time because people need us now more than ever. And we're able to work with other people um, and identify resources. We know how to do that. We know how to like people who've lost their jobs because of the pandemic. We know where to find those job placement coordinators or find those grants to help people pay those utility bills. And so, in doing all these things that have nothing to do with policing and enforcing the law, when something does happen in his neighborhood, it's not a crime-free community by any means, but when something does happen, we're able to get to the bottom of things a lot faster. It's mainly that philosophical approach to things. We take that approach and whatever good we try to do, and it's reciprocated. And instead of being an occupying force in a community, we're partners with them. When you we're talking about the people in the domestic violence or whatever situation you had to go there in. And you said, we want to find out what's going on. What happened to you? Are you an addict? Do you have mental health issues? Um, are you in poverty? See, what happened to them goes way back, further than at that moment. Where is your pain coming from? Where's your struggle? And you see that, and I admire that in you. But you are able to recognize that. Not every officer does. There are some that can look at you and never see you. They look at my number. Hello, my name is 203-536. But you can call me Phyllis. And the problem with those officers that we talk about, like that you said, and how they treat people is the majority of that we we create as institutions. And my confession to you is I was that officer chasing my own pride and trying to validate my work ethic. I was proud of how many tickets I wrote and how many people I, I took to jail and how many warrants I, I arrested folks. I didn't care how they got there or whatever. I was able to say, look how hard I work. How many people did you arrest? And 
that's a dangerous culture because a lot of cops are like, well, I'm a hard worker. I'll show you I'm a team player. Not even thinking about how we're affecting those communities um, that we start to institutionalize uh, a lot of folks because of what we have defined as, as making places safer. You know, these are, we're, we're writing tickets because it makes people slow down or, or we're arresting people at warrants because it's, it's a, that's how you pay for the price for the crime that you committed. And, and that should make you a better person for that. But what saved my, my life as a, as a police officer and as a human being, I think, was that I can't even blame my department. You know, if, there's no way to teach somebody empathy but there's a way that we can create opportunities when we're given those opportunities is to really focus on how do we help somebody? How do we problem solve issues? Let's use a lot of our energy. And before we reach for those handcuffs or before we reach for that gun, have we really exhausted all of our training and all of our available resources? And, um, you know, there's been a lot of, we get a lot of flack for doing that, you know, well, they are not real cops because they don't arrest anybody. I was like, well, you could look up our homicide clearance rate and compare it to the rest of the city. We were able to lower crime 65% just in the first year of treating people like people. We have some police departments who can't afford those kind of trainings, who can't be as you know diverse as we are as far as all the different types of officers we have, that some of them are specific to community-based policing. Um, so how how do we overcome that challenge as, as a nation, as, as an occupation, as a profession? How do we teach them that words like empathy and compassion are synonymous with courage and bravery? Where it takes courage to show empathy, to exhibit empathy towards somebody. It takes courage to uh, exhibit compassion, to figure out another way to deal with this issue and to understand where that person's at. So the work here is like, we've got to remind ourselves, you know, constantly and people in these positions of influence and power and authority that we are a lot more successful when we enter all these interactions as partners and not just an occupying force that we are guardians, you know, working for them, you know, even the person in crisis, whatever it may be. And it just really softens it when we do have to use the criminal justice system to address the issue. I imagine you've all had some pretty cool success stories. Um, so I'd like to hear some, uh, some success stories or some, some, do you have a moment that feels like I knew I was doing the right thing or I knew um, or we knew that we were really making a, a difference in uh, the lives of the people we work with and the communities they live in? Uh, one of the instances that comes to mind is during graduation at headquarters in Montgomery, we had probably 12 students graduating with their hard hats on and their vests, and we, they invited their families there. And one gentleman had his uh, great grandmother there, and his, his mom and dad are not in the picture, but his grandmother and great grandmother were. That's who raised him. And we allow each of the students to talk if they want to after the gate, after they receive their certificate. And he looked at his grandma and great grandma and he started crying. And he held his certificate up and he said, this is the first thing I have ever accomplished in my life. And now he is working, uh, I believe in South Carolina now on a pipeline and he's making over $30 an hour. And he'll, he'll call and text every once in a while and just tell me how he's doing. I had this officer who worked the night, like, hey, we're arresting this guy like almost every night. He's always drunk, he's always urinated himself, he won't go away. We told him he needs to get off the boulevard, go home, whatever, but like, you know, I think I've taken him to jail like seven times. I'm like, well, what's his name? What does he look like? So, is you know, guy's name is Jesse. So I get finally get the phone call and I'm driving around and I see him down and he's sure enough, he's passed out. So I get him up and he's like, oh, time to go to jail. I'm like, no, we're not going to jail, Jesse. I'm giving you a ride home. He was like, oh, nobody gives me a ride home. I was like, well, I'm gonna give you a ride home and then we'll, we're gonna get you out of his clothes and you're gonna take a nap. And then when you wake up, you're gonna call me and we're gonna get you some help. And I leave him my phone number. He doesn't call me, but I show up to his house 
and it, you know he's out there and he's already tr- starting to pour himself another one to to get him to get him back on. And I was like, no, 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 man, we got an appointment, but come on, we got to go. And I located you know the neighborhood substance abuse counselors, and they're going to work with him. And so the next day, um, I go to his house, uh, make the guy breakfast. And he doesn't drink that day. He doesn't come down. I was like, I'm going to come here tomorrow. We got to go to our second meeting. He's like, you're going with me? I was like, yeah, man, I believe in you. We can do this, you know? And one day he was like, hey, I want to start a group with these guys down here that hang out on the boulevard. You know, you used to come, they used to come and arrest us, but I think, I think I can help them out. So he started an AA group down here and we let him use the can center on Wednesday nights as anonymous. So the police officers, we were gone by, by five o'clock. That was the deal. We had to be out of the building. So they can have their meetings, but he did a super job. He, he ended up being becoming sober, and I'll never forget. I mean, he 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 passed away shortly after, um, but he, you know, he um, he made an impact on my life because we got a lot of credit for cleaning up the neighborhood, and he did all the work. He he started to do the outreach. He's the one that got after those guys. He went down there, and and he was one of them. You know, he was one of them, and they saw that the can center is at a place where the cops could leave now and people have just gotten so used to the culture where we're all in this together that they don't need us here to keep this thing going of helping people and identifying resources and just being advocates for folks who are in distress um and that's and that's what i want i don't i don't want to exist and just keep coming up with reasons so that i can have a job it's work our way out of this so with programs like these I think there's maybe a misconception or maybe you can clear that up is, is that um, this sort of connection and assistance and contribution and engagement maybe comes off at least initially as a handout or as, as, you know, giving something that isn't going to be effectively used, or maybe it's just throwing, you know, throwing money or resources at a problem that isn't making a difference. Uh, How, how is what you do different? Uh, there is a deficiency in workers within the construction industry. And we're only providing a small number of what that deficit is. But the people we do provide are the ones that want to work. They want to earn an honest living. We're not handing them anything. They are earning it. These, This is not an easy class. So the ones that think that this is an easy, just put them in the air condition and just give them a certificate. That's not what we do. They have to earn it. So when they stand up there and they are provided their certificate at graduation, they have tears in their eyes because they have accomplished something in their life they've never done before. And when they call you up and they say, Miss Ricketts, I got a job. Thank you so much. That is what we give them. We give them self-esteem. They hold their head up a little bit higher. We don't give them anything. They earn it. How do you respond to any pushback you get that what your program is or what you do is a handout? We have we run a camp center where day laborers get to come down and look for work. So we did an outreach with them. And... What we, what we did to those guys, like, you can come and use our showers uh, and our bathrooms in our office. In turn, you guys have this relationship with us. And you let us know what's going on down here. And we're going to solve this issue together in partnership. And it took a while for them to trust us. But the more one would come in and out of the office, they started to see us as guys just like them. We started to see them as people trying to feed their families. They started helping us. And we went from there to uh, identifying elderly people who were getting... They were getting uh, tickets from uh, the, the city inspectors, you know, like, hey, you're, you're, the, the paint is peeling off your porch or your grass is too tall and people are calling and complaining on you. So these guys would volunteer and go mow the lawns and, and, and cut down the, sh- uh, the shrubs. And so when you started to see the community react towards these guys, like, hey, they used to be just the guys that hung out on a corner. Now they're the ones mowing the lawns for the elderly or helping us harvest the, the the fruits and vegetables that we grow at the garden and they're volunteering to cut the lawn of Miss Gonzalez who doesn't have any grandchildren to help her with her house so she doesn't get tickets encoded at her house. 
So these men were able to maintain their dignity while they're still homeless, some of them, and they're still looking for work. They're still battling addiction, but they, they still felt this obligation to volunteer and set up the back to school drives, all the tables and chairs and things that need to be set up. I mean, these guys just were like, hey, they're always like, what's going on? Is there any way that we can help? We have all these amazing things happen organically because we were able to be catalysts in, in, in creating those opportunities. How can the everyday average civic official or law enforcement officer participate and help encourage and empower meaningful contribution if they don't have a program like you guys have? Uh, what, how can they start? What sort, of, what sort of efforts can they make in that direction? Our, the, the design of the Westside Can Center is, is not where the success comes from. I think, again, it's the philosophical approach to how we police. And sometimes we think we need to create a new program where if we just go grassroots and include, I think, the stakeholders who these things are affecting, and we really come up with a plan. What's protected the Can Center is that we've been able to say, although we are the experts in law enforcement, you are the experts of your communities. We work for you. We want to work with you. We don't want to come down here and fix anything. And if there's no trust, then it's going to take us a lot longer to fix it. And we may mess it up sometimes. But if there's a, if we work really hard on gaining that trust of the people we're supposed to serve, then they will work with us and we will be a lot more successful, I think. Um, what, what do you think about that, that Phyllis? Um, how, how can... How can the everyday civic leader or officer begin to contribute and to empower others to meaningfully contribute in their communities? You know, there are so many ways to contribute um, to the community, um, not just in construction, but other, other things. If you are in the field and have a restaurant, you know, um, offer people jobs, teach them how to to work as a chef, train these people, help them get a job, get them back into society. You can contribute so much of, you know, your job, your business, um, or just you individual volunteer to, to go work and help. Um, there's so many in need. Um, and I, I see there's so much opportunity out here. Um, I wish there was five of me because there's so many things I want to open. I want to open. We something. still one of you to put it in a, our police academy, Phyllis. <laughs> so we're going to need six of you. I, I would love to. <laughs> I, I, I believe that, that there's so much that we can do out here and there's so many opportunities um, to open up something, to start something. You know, the only process is just do it. Get up get involved and just do it. There's days I know you don't feel like it. There's days you don't want to be bothered. But remember, we have a purpose, you know, and a purpose and a plan. And we stick to that. It is necessary. You know what they say? It takes a village to raise a child. Like one of my facilitators, if they're better in math than the other, then they Zoom the meeting and the one facilitator that's just top notch in math helps out with the other ones. So everybody brings their own specialty to the table and that what makes CARTIF a conglomeration of a whole bunch of different uh, people that have passion for different areas. I am not the one that does everything. I, I did that in the beginning. Um, but I would expand to every state um, if I had the money to. I mean, that's an option open. You know, I invite and anyone who wants to know how this business started and, and how it's run and how we have such a successful uh, recidivism rate and employment rate, I'm, I'm open to sharing that because if I keep it down here in Alabama just to myself, then the other uh, 49 states need to know also. Think what kind of world we would live in if everyone had something like this.
And thank you so much to our panelists for, for this amazing conversation. I was so thankful to be a part of it. And thank you to everybody who participated in Answering the Call 2020, Arbinger's first public safety virtual summit. But Desmond, I don't think this is gonna be our last one. Oh no, you know what? Um, we're gonna do this again. I cannot thank enough um, everyone who participated. I wanna thank everybody from across this country that were, was a part of this process. I wanna thank the production team. I wanna thank Arbinger for giving us this cool opportunity to just cherry pick so many amazing people and make them a part of this process. Um, we hope you gain something and learn something. And more importantly, we hope you take advantage of um, this opportunity to learn more about the principles in which we share across the country. And for those of you who are interested in learning more, Desmond is facilitating a virtual event, an Outward Mindset in Public Safety workshop, which is a two-day Arbinger workshop that he will be facilitating. He'll do that from here in the studios and those working in public safety all over America, all over the country are gonna be joining us for that. And if you've registered for this summit today, we're offering a special buy one, get one price exclusively for you, for the participants, for the people who've chosen to join us today as a way to say thank you and to invite you to continue this conversation, to continue answering the call of 2020. Desmond, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you, but before we let everybody go, um, we did our best to cut these conversations down. As I've mentioned a few times in this broadcast, we've had hours and hours and hours of, of footage of recordings, of conversations, of interviews for all of these presentations, and we cut them down as tight as we could to fit into this four hour window. Now, even with that, we still have an extra session that we really wanted to fit in, but wanted to give it also its, its own space because it really is its own uh, sort of topic. Uh, this is a conversation that we had with Brady Reed from the Arbinger Institute. He's one of our senior facilitators. We spent time with Brady talking about this waterfall process of how we implement Arbinger principles from the executive level down to the uh, first line supervisors and to the uh, operational people um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Brady implements these type of principles on a, in large scale organizations on an everyday basis. And we wanted his uh, input and his knowledge. And we put that in as a bonus session and we're really excited about it. Talk to me a little bit about uh, your, what you're currently doing now um, in helping large scale organizations have an outward mindset. Yeah, thanks. So the, the challenge in organizations is how do you scale? Uh, uh, you know, most often, in fact, I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of the clients I work with now uh, where we're doing what we call a full implementation, these are these are leaders who are already good. Um, it's interesting that good leaders are always trying to be great. And, and so it, in, in these large scale implementations, what we're really doing is we're not fixing the leader as much as we're helping already good leaders scale and replicate um, what they want in, in terms of leader and people and, and behaviors. We're, we're helping them replicate that. And, um, and, and that's something that uh, I had to work through and learned uh, in the Army uh, when we're, we're trying to, you know, grow and, and scale multi-thousand person organizations. Um, and it takes just a very deliberate, methodical approach um, in, in order to do that. Um, what are some of the challenges when we're looking at large scale implementation of a mindset, right? We want, to, we want to really improve our cultural change. We want to do it on a large scale. What are some of the challenges you've recognized? You know, in short, the, the biggest challenge is, in, is the, in the execution. I mean, relatively, the planning, the strategy development, that's the easy part. Um, the, the more difficult where you really, it, it takes somebody managing this and, and, and uh, taking care of the fine details is in one, from how, how do we communicate this? That, that's a huge part of it. It is preparing for the receptivity of the organization because uh, the military, the government, we are so used to mandatory training, things we just, we just have to check the block. So mentally we go into it where we're just gonna comply to get it over with. 
when you're doing transformational change, um, that's that's a tough thing to get over. It is this preconceived notion that it's just another training. And so we, we have to do several things that create the conditions if we're going to roll out some new training or some new experience where people feel inspired to attend versus required to attend. So, so how do we do that? Um, that takes very conscious uh, communication from leaders down through this process that we typically use. We, we call it the waterfall. Uh, but it's a deliberate process of moving from, say, a tier one level leadership to tier two to tier three. And so a major piece of helping that go right is in coaching the leaders uh, about how they communicate this, this training, this experience, whatever it is, again, from themselves down to a subordinate, so on and so forth. But getting leaders prepared to have those right kinds of conversations is one of the, the major hurdles. And, and I think over, while that sounds simple, I, I would think that that is probably the major piece of inertia, uh, referring back to Jim Collins and his seminal work, Good to Great, you have to push the flywheel, you have to get that thing turning. And, and the major thing that gets that flywheel turning it is the conversations that uh, again lead people to feel inspired to go and check this out to be part of this of, of what's coming down and what's happening versus required and it goes to this condition of whether people feel inspired or required you know if if pe a lot of us go into it and, and I'm, I'm no different i've been in that class where you go man you know who really needs to be in here um and the 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 point is, though, if, if our leadership, those of us haven't gone uh, and merely have prescribed it, yeah, you people down there, y'all are the one that needs to be fixed, so we start at lower levels. I mean, we're inviting resistance to the training, to the experience. We're inviting resistance to the change before we ever get it off the ground. A lot of people come to training and think, oh, somebody else needs this. Well, uh, again, that, that's the signal that we're inviting resistance uh, from the very beginning, uh, unless we uh, begin at the top and have the right kinds of conversations as, as we waterfall it down. And then looking at this upper step here of executive leadership, what are some of the things that you recommend when you engage the organizations you work with? Probably my, my number one recommendation, and, and this really ties back to some another of these challenges, is the, the training has to be tied to the strategic aims of the organization. That's, that's the number one goal or the number one thing that I will talk to a senior executive about is just simply ask the question, as we're talking about uh, Arbinger or whatever you're doing, um, how do you see this helping? What, what are your strategic aims? Um, again, whether they're in broad strokes or, or they're more tactical, and that's part of the p thing that people have to get really clear about so that there's, there's a reason uh, uh, we, there's, there begins a journey, if you will, that so and people um, look, we, we know where we're going. We know why we're the big why. We know why we're doing this. Um, I think so that's that's step one. And that's got to be part of the communication that trickles down to the entire organization. Um, then then we have to look at um, metrics uh, again, a lot is in training and development right now. Um, look, especially when budgets are tight, one of the first things that people often cut is, is training. And, and so you've got to be clear about what's the expected return for this investment of training and what are we looking for and setting up the, the ways that we're going to measure or uh, both in terms of leading measures and lagging measures, you know, what are we looking for? So we, so we, we can kind of see what path we're about to, um, to go on. Probably the third thing that I talk to executives about is it needs to be tied to professional development, uh, both for individuals and the organization. It needs to be part of the requirement, it, you know, and encouraged. Again, it's that fine line in how you present it, whether it feels mandatory and required. And so uh, I'm, 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 I'm checking a block, I'm inviting resistance, or hey, this thing that we're about to do, in, in our case, this outward mindset, uh, this is critical. Uh, for our strategic aims, and we need to make it part of our personal development because as a wise mentor once told me, he said, Brady, organizations don't improve. 
people do one at a time and then teams at a time, small, then larger and larger. And so that's how you start to see true transformational change. So I, I'd say those are the top three things that I engage with as leaders. Brady, can you talk to me a little bit about some of the sustainability activities you utilize when you're helping organizations? I think that's one of the real advantages uh, with Arbiter is you take a philosophy and then you operationalize it. And that's the key word is, you know, how, how do you, how are they operationalizing this? How are they uh, putting this stuff into practice on a, on a regular basis? Um, you know, it's not merely taking a training approach. It's really about taking an organizational development approach and it's finding um, where we're gonna take some of these Arbinger tools and where we're going to use them and apply them. And, and there's an expectation that this is gonna be how we do business. Um, an important piece to this is how, how do we create reinforcing loops so that, again, we keep pushing that flywheel that I refer to. And one of the most powerful ones and, uh, is a tool called the job map. And then these three questions that we ask our tool called SAM. And uh, imagine, for example, so for your, your viewers, the, imagine this job map looks like you at the center of a diagram and it kind of looks like a compass. And then above you are your, your managers, your superiors on one side, uh, you know, perhaps to your right or your customers to your left or your peers and below your, your direct reports. And, and then, so take that model and imagine that if we made this part of an onboarding process, so we, get, we get somebody new and we help them identify who these people are all around them. And then we, we send them forth and we ask them to ask these questions. You know, meet with these people that we've helped, to, helped you identify. And to the, the first question is, you know, help me understand your work. What are your objectives? What are you trying to get done? You know, seeing others. And then the next question is, well, what could I do that would be most helpful? How could I adjust efforts that you could, uh, that, that I could, could be helpful towards that. And as they're doing that, they're really writing their job description. And then thirdly, would you know they would ask, well, how would you like me to check in with you to make sure that what I'm doing is having the right impact on you? Well, if you think about that, when a person goes through, uses that tool as a new employee, one, they come back with great clarity uh, and alignment uh, and a sense of value. You know, they know how they're impacting and their importance in the organization. Uh, that's key. That's a key way of sustaining and operationalizing this outward mindset. But the other thing it does as a reinforcing loop, it's reminding all the people that they talk to, it's reminding them of also what it means to work in an outward way. Uh, that is uh, my, when I'm talking to clients, senior leaders, it's my number one recommendation is to take that tool and bring it into your onboarding program so that you're getting people started off with an outward mindset from the very beginning. And again, it serves as this very powerful reinforcing loop. But to truly bring this uh, where you see the change in the organization, you've got to bring people together around first a shared understanding and then a shared commitment. So in, in our work, it's do we understand what it means to be outward? Do we understand, do, do we have the ability to recognize our inwardness? Again, shared understanding. And then, okay, what tools are we gonna employ to help us with our business practices, to help us get at some of the problems that we talked about? Uh, that's that shared commitment. Um, and uh, that's just been one of the most successful approaches that, that I've seen in terms of truly seeing an organization uh, change. Can you explain uh, to all of us a little bit about what a standard uh, waterfall strategy would look like for, a, for an organization? Yeah, we, you know, first of all, it's important to understand, I think, how Arbinger approaches uh, the transformation of an organization. You know, oftentimes people will, as uh, we've mentioned before, uh, a lot of leaders will will see our work and go, oh, this is great. I love this. Um, hey, I want you to train so and so. And usually what it amounts to is those people down below me. And and that approach just invites resistance from the very beginning. Uh, so the expectations might be high. The return on investment typically uh, is very, very low. 
Um, so we take a, a different approach, and that is with, uh, with if you have limited resources, you make the heaviest investment at the top of your organization. Right? And, and so we typically will take an organization and um, look at four different uh, levels or layers within the organization like a cake. You know, typically we'll call tier one that executive leadership, that C-suite uh, level of leadership. Uh, then there's a tier two level in there. That's your, your senior VPs, oftentimes, you know, director level. Um, and then tier three being uh, first line supervisors, managers. And then tier four, we re typically refer to those as your frontline staff, people who don't have supervisory responsibilities. So that's how we layer it out. And, and then to a, a a uh, kind of a template for uh, that we have found successful and, and this waterfall strategy is is born out of both research it's uh, and and then refined and validated from uh, our client work and, and client lessons but we'll typically try to uh, we'll, we'll identify the course the numbers of people at, at each of those levels and then we'd like depending if it's a large organization which is why we typically do waterfalls. They're typically for a large organization. Um, we'll we'll want to identify some folks who will become internal facilitators again, so that uh, the the organization fr right from the beginning, we're we're teaching someone to fish so that they can carry it out. And so we identify a few uh, folks who be facilitators, and we want to put them through that initial uh, two day workshop we call developing and implementing an outward mindset. Ideally, we provide them with an implementation coach uh, to, to further learn uh, and deepen their learning, help them de develop their, their own stories, their own understanding. We want to give them the third piece of that, and that's called outward leadership, the one day. So these three events are what we often refer to as the experience track. Now we'll begin with the tier one leadership. Again, that two-day foundational workshop um, typically 12 weeks of implementation coaching. And then somewhere in that four to six week period, we like to come back and take that executive team through outward leadership. And, and this is, that step is critical because that's where someone really learns, you know, as leaders, we have learned, we've been taught most of our lives, but we got to be really good at communication and really good at holding people accountable. Well, it's true about the communication. Well, when I really think about what the Army wanted from me, it was not to be good at holding people accountable as much it was as it was to be good at developing accountable people. And that's what that, that third uh, experience, that outward leadership really does. So from there, uh, and this, the timing is important, is we want to then begin that, that three-part experience track. We want to begin that with the second tier about the time the first tier uh, finishes with outward leadership. And what this does, it, it starts to again to create that initial really important uh, loop, that feedback and that reinforcing loop between the tier one and tier, tier two leader. Uh, again, and teach those three parts that I've described to the, um, the third tier of leadership. And then finally, um, they bring that typically uh, at, at the tier four level front line, it's an it's uh, abbreviated. It's the two day course uh, or our new outward mindset online course at that point, uh, coupled with uh, some shorter meetings that again facilitate this shared understanding and then shared commitment. The powerful element that we have seen one is when uh, one the leader again the leader goes first, and and then and there. Uh, they're humble, they're sharing their struggles, they're sharing their experiences. And, and you know, others, subordinates in the room, you know, are picking that up. Um, and, you know, when, when, so when that leader is willing to model that way, it, it invites others to also consider, well, how, how have I been? And boy, I have some things to learn as well. And then they're, they're picking up on the, the things that their senior leaders say, and it just brings it home, brings it real. And again, it, 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 um, it strengthens people's desire, if you will, um, to, to kind of to buy in, to say, oh, okay, uh, all right. Um, they, they tend to lean forward and, oh, okay, so I, I'm in, I'll listen. 
Uh, and then of course the material does the work of um, the transformation. So Brady, talk a little bit about, we've talked about like this, this implementation piece and, and the processes we go through to help large scale organizations be successful. What are some of the impact personal stories you received from some of the organizations you've worked with? Oh boy, that's a great question. That's a question I love and uh, makes makes my uh, makes my life and, and career rewarding. Um, in fact, just this morning, uh, I received a call from one of our uh, large military clients um, who uh, he's an internal facilitator. He's been the project manager there about a year into implementation. Uh, it's a flying unit. Uh, they, they train pilots and uh, they've got two different squadrons. And um, he was telling me about what what he has seen, what he's observed in these two squadrons um, over the past uh, six, eight months. Uh, squadron one um, was was consistently the high, higher performer over squadron two. And as they went through uh, their uh, waterfall training, uh, their, their, their outward mindset development, uh, the, the leadership of the, the higher performing squadron was like, no, oh, this is good, but just not that real sinking commitment to it. You know, they did just, you know, it was good, but there was a big difference. Squadron two leadership just went all in, just really, it, it convicted them. Well, uh, and they've put it into practice. Well, he said today, Squadron Two outperforms Squadron One, and he said also what was palpable is, is that during the COVID and all the consternation and change, he said there was it was a night and day difference between how the how Squadron Two handled it. There was just less friction, less drama. That they they were just moving through things. Uh, relatively smoothy, smoothly as compared to the first squadron, which had a lot more, you know, friction, drama, consternation. Uh, I'll give you one more that really, really launched outward mindset into a 32,000 person organization was, was this. Um, this was a large uh, government healthcare uh, system. And uh, we had been invited to provide the two-day workshop to the upper level leaders, uh, upper level leadership of the entire system. So about 40 leaders. They have multiple multiple hospital systems in this large region. And um, one of the folks was the chief of staff uh, and had been there for two, maybe three decades and, and apparently did not have a... a great reputation in terms of being easy to work with. And um, so I was having uh, a few uh, months later uh, or so I was having dinner with the CEO and uh, he said, look, we've all voted and we want this across our entire uh, organization, but let me tell you what really did it for me. He said, the very next day after your workshop, um, the, uh, this chief of staff called me and asked me if I would mentor him because he had, he had awakened to the fact that he had been a very difficult person to work with and, and were making things harder on everybody around him. And, um, and he said that, he goes, I've known this, this man for more than a decade and it's unbelievable that he would make give that kind of admission. Uh, he said, this is so I, I know this is powerful stuff. Um, and so we have since rolled out uh, with this big organization. We're about six, seven months into it now. And, and that chief of staff is one of the most vocal advocates. In fact, uh, I have heard from multiple people how he has really changed and how being with him has become a pleasure. Um, in fact, his, the, this chief of staff has also gotten a new boss and the boss was uh, telling me that uh, what a pleasure he was to work with, uh, despite she had heard rumors of how he had, uh, how he had been in the past. And she goes, I, I just, I have such a great partner uh, in him. So uh, tr truly this, this work does change people. 
in this past six months uh, during this COVID crisis, um, what have you seen in terms of like this direct application of, of these practices, these Arbinger practices and principles um, with your clientele? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that I've heard from clients, uh, from the leaders in particular, is how many of them recognize their themselves and their organizations turning inward. Um, I, I know I've experienced the same, you know, myself. Um, that's probably the number one thing. And uh, the and as I've talked to them about it, you know, as the uh, and then reflecting on my own uh, military experience from crisis and, and, and uh, combat zones that we tend to uh, become more fixated on ourselves and what's happening to us. And so um, the, the, the awareness that, wow, the answer to this, that, that what, as long as I remain inward, things just get worse. As, and as we all, you know, as everyone in the organization turns inward because they're dealing with this crisis and how it's impacting them and their families or their jobs, um, things don't get better. They actually get worse. So I, I think what it's shown is the outward mindset is more critical in a, a crisis, um, not, certainly not less. And, and Brady, um, looking at your 30 years of federal experience, uh, governmental experience, your leadership experience, um, what are some of the general takeaways that like in implementing Arbinger, these are the things I would recommend um, to, to organizations um, at the scales that we've talked about? I, th I think, um, I think number one, when you're going to engage, it's they make it make it clear um, that that the organization is going to embark on a journey, uh, a journey that we decided to take for for the reasons that I talked about before. In you know my top three recommendations to leaders is that we're we're going on this journey because it's going to help us achieve our mission, our vision, uh, it's gonna help, which is all generated by the, the results that we get. Um, I, I think um, that's probably my number one takeaway is that um, one of the things I failed, uh, make, I guess perhaps where I saw failure before, and then as I reflect on times where I think I was more successful is when I was articulating the journey that we're going on and why we're going on it, what, it, what it's gonna do for us. Um, and that it was, we, we decided to do it. You know, it wasn't something mandated on high, wasn't forced on us by anyone. This is a choice that we've, that we've made. Um, here, and here's my experience. The one, um, again, in my prior life, being the guy responsible for training and management, I, I was, the, more broadly, I was merely executing things that others told me I had to do. That was a major part of my job. And my, my experience on this side of the fence has been many of our government folks in training and development, that the vast majority of their experience is managing the execution of mandated training. Very few, particularly at large scales, have experience in, in preparing and managing you know, that large scale kind of transformation. And, and then the, the other thing that came to me is it goes with keeping this alive, you know, continuing the journey, make people want to stay on the trailhead, if you will. And, and we've talked about the criticality of sustainment is that once you start to see it, leaders need to reward it. Um, one of the pieces of advice I give them is, look, when you, you know, go, go do that management by walking around, uh, but don't just walk and pat people on the head superficially go and say, hey, tell me about the training. Have you, have you been through the Outward Mindset training? What, what has it enabled you to do? Share, share with me how it's impacted you at this level. And, and then when you hear a good news story, one, one you're going to gather intelligence and, and you'll learn. Again, this is part of kind of managing that implementation is you're going to learn how it's being felt down through the organization. That's a critical thing for a leader to experience. Uh, but then when you hear these great stories, uh, and people utilizing the material, you've got to reward that. Um, 
whether it's informally or certainly if it's a formal award, I would I recommend to them, look, um, in the military, we'd write, you know, for meritorious service for, you know, and you describe what the person did. Uh, I recommend the leaders, look, write the reward, uh, write the award, and in the award description, it specifically states that, you know, or describes how they used outward principles, outward mindset principles, or you, you know, whatever, um, something related to what they've learned in the workshops um, that, that contributed to this great behavior, this new result that they got, or the impact that they're having. Uh, be sure you're rewarding that uh, in, so, so that you're, again, reinforcing uh, people's desire to continue you know, learning and developing is to stay on this journey. Um, thank you for, for helping to bring more light to this uh, waterfall strategy to implementing Arbinger in a way in a large, large scale organization. So, so, the, so not only um, are we able to be effective in our support of these large scale organizations, but in how it's implemented, it creates true uh, mindset change. You know, for police leaders, it's having the courage to be able to be radically self-aware. It's really in everyone's collective interests. I want to fix this problem. I would consider myself a racial justice warrior. People in communities are what do things, but the relationships are everything. It takes tremendous courage to step into this profession right now. So I look them right in the eye and I say, thank you.